Good day to all of you. Welcome to the workshop on stroke unit care for clinicians, jointly organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Candy Society of Medicine. First of all, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Candy Society of Medicine for organizing this sort of event uh, to educate the medical professionals even amongst a pandemic situation like this. To deliver the opening remarks, let me invite Professor A. M. Artigala, President of the Candy Society of Medicine. Very good morning to you, all of you, to those who have who are here physically as well as joined online. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, all of you to this uh, workshop jointly organized by the Srinaka Medical Association as well as uh, Candy Society of Medicine uh, workshop on capacity building on stroke unit care for clinicians. Uh, let me warmly welcome the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, a consultant neurologist who is no, not a stranger at all to Candy. And also I welcome the executive committee of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. And I welcome all the resource persons for this workshop and, and the participants as well. So the theme of the Candy Society of Medicine is actually guiding the society through science in managing non-communicable disease. So this particular uh, one which we are stroke, we are going to deal today, is going very hand in hand. So uh, if I just go into some facts actually, it is the leading cause of disability in adults in Sri Lanka, and also seventh cause of hospital deaths in Sri Lanka. Uh, according to a few studies, the prevalence seems to be around 10 per thousand population, which is a fairly high figure. So this concept of stroke unit uh, care seems to be uh, giving good input to, to reduce the, the uh, disabilities of these post-stroke patients and also to improve the quality of life in, with the, the participation of multidisciplinary team, not only medical specialists, but all the other uh, uh, helping groups as well. So with that, I would like to uh, extend a few uh, words of thanks to people who dedicated I mean, their time and uh, time in, in this uh, relation. Uh, first of all, Dr. Dushant Madhagedara, who coordinated uh, from the, with the SLMA. And thank you very much, Dr. Madhagedara. And also Dr. Danushka Leopibandara, Dr. Sakuntala Jayasimha, Dr. Ranmini Vijayakun, our Energetic Two Secretaries, Dr. Arinda and Dr. Nandana, and also uh, our supporting staff of the office and the IT team here. So I wish you all the uh, all fruitful workshop and I uh, thank the SLM again and I hope that in the future also we can have such collaboration as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now let me invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, to address together. Over to you, uh, Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, now, uh, initially, uh, let me only welcome all of you for this uh, very important workshop organized by the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with Candy Society of Medicine. Right. Dr. Uh, Manjula, Professor Manjula Artigala, uh, Dr. Dushantana Dagidra, and all the other uh, registrants for the conference. Uh, now, yeah, the, this is a moment that I uh, uh, could really be happy because you know that uh, uh, I have been uh, part and uh, parcel of Candy Hospital for uh, about 15 years, uh, from uh, 1990 to 2014 at the Candy Hospital, uh, at the Neurology Unit of the Candy Hospital. Then before that, for five years, I was a peer Adenian graduate, and for another uh, about uh, more than three years, I worked as a registrar at the Teaching Hospital Candy. So uh, I uh, am very much uh, uh, with feelings towards candy. So uh, since I uh, started 
the uh, stroke as my uh, specialty of interest. This actually is the second workshop that we are doing on stroke rehabilitation. Now, actually, your president, Professor Manjula Artigala, already has told you that the prevalence and the uh, incidence and the burden of this disease. Now, stroke is not anything uncommon. When we did a study, it revealed that the Nakandi Hospital gets uh, now in Colombo and uh, in Colombo and Colombo South, that is Colombo Villa, they, these two hospitals get almost equal numbers of strokes and they get about 1,200 and the uh, uh, Colombo South gets about 800. And Candy Hospital also gets more than 800 strokes per, uh, per month. Uh, so we were wondering uh, why does that happen? Because that the, now in Colombo, there are many hospitals around. We have Colombo North Hospital, and then we have Malaria Hospital, and then there are many private hospitals. So there are many hospitals that could accommodate these patients. Whereas in Candy Hospital in near vicinity, I think it's Candy is the major hospital, you know, next to Colombo. So there is a need for improvement of stroke care in these hospitals. So despite our sort of uh, uh, so much of uh, lobbying to ministry, still we had not been successful to provide a reasonable care for these two patients. Right. All over the country, uh, the mean duration of hospital stay of two patients is about three days. And uh, the, we know that stroke patients, about 10% of them, they initially die uh, within the first two weeks, die of stroke. But when you follow them up over next three months, another 15% of stroke patients die of preventable complications. So they all, those 15% are preventable deaths. And many stroke patients, you know, that it's only about 30% who will be left a little dependent. Whereas all others, maybe with little disability, but still become independent. And if we manage to avoid another second stroke, the first stroke does not, I mean, going to affect the lifespan as long as that we control the, the risk factors, the uh, prevent the uh, uh, second risk factors. So the uh, it is very rewarding to treat stroke patients. So that's why it is important. I mean, all ordinary doctors have some idea on stroke rehabilitation. If you do some general practice, then there will be stroke patients under your care. And if you get hold of the hand of a physiotherapist uh, and uh, um, maybe nurse, I mean, in the private sector, just maybe even the physiotherapist. It would be much better if you have occupational therapist, speech therapist, and the nurse and all these categories. But even if you hold the hand still, you would be doing a great service for that patient because uh, the so once you have treated a stroke patient, he would stick to you lifelong because they need drugs lifelong for prevention. So, uh, and then for them, I mean, many are not aware that you did not cure them and that with physiotherapy that they improved and they are so grateful to you. So that is why it's important as doctors that we are familiar with treating stroke. And uh, when I did this program and applied for funding and I had opportunity to provide the, the this is we are going to have only two workshops. We already had one in Colombo, and then this is the second one. That's all that we are going to have under this program. And the I selected Candy uh, merely because that I knew that the Candy Hospital also gets the admissions with stroke to an equal extent uh, to any other uh, big hospital. So I think that is the opportunity for all doctors in Candy to make use and then to be familiar with stroke rehabilitation. And that would be a, 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 another additional uh, a skill for all the doctors who attend the program. So uh, let me very much uh, uh, thank the uh, Professor Manjula Artigala for uh, liaising with the SLMA uh, in organizing this program. He was ever willing and uh, very uh, uh, convenient to work with. And I really appreciate his willingness to collaborate with the Sri Lanka Medical Association.
uh, the CLMA representative to Candy is uh, Dr. Dushanta Madagidere. So I'm very thankful to Dushanta uh, for liaising with the CLMA in organizing this program and for his interest for all other activities as well. I know that how much an active member, uh, KSA member he had been and how much that he had contributed to the Candy in general, the uh, health as well as to Candy Society of Medicine. From this side, I have Dr. Chaturu Suravira, who coordinated on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm very thankful to uh, Dr. Chaturu Suravira as well for the interest taken and for making my life very uh, uh, comfortable as uh, uh, she uh, took over the responsibility of organizing this uh, program. This program, our theme for this year is the professional excellence towards holistic healthcare. So what we try to convince uh, all medical professionals is that it's a little difficult nowadays for, I, for us to provide patients with a satisfactory care without the assistance of others in the team in the multidisciplinary team for many things. I mean that this was further confirmed even by when you give care for COVID patients. So the, uh, uh, with that theme, only that we do arrange this workshop uh, with the contributions of the members of the multidisciplinary team. So I'm very thankful to all resource persons uh, who volunteered to take part in this program. And we have already done the printed book for this and we have sent you the books. And I uh, uh, hope that uh, Candy Society of Medicine could donate two of these books for PMCK library. Uh, the, uh, so that it would be uh, used by a wider range of doctors. And the uh, resource persons uh, have uh, already con contributed to this book. And this book would be a very uh, a useful guide uh, for you to uh, improve your knowledge. And we would be uploading the book for the our website so that the electronic version also would be available for you. So uh, 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 with that brief uh, uh, remarks, uh, let me wish all, um, I mean, all of you, as well as the resource persons, as well as the Candy Society of Medicine, all the best, uh, and to have a wonderful day ahead uh, with regard to uh, the capacity building workshop of the uh, stroke unit care for clinicians. Thank you very much for your patient attention. Thank you very much. Thank you conduct our very first session on burden of stroke in Sri Lanka. <laughs> Dr. Seneca Banusena, consultant in the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. The topic that I have been asked to talk to you all is to give you some idea about the burden of stroke in Sri Lanka and the essentials of setting for stroke care. So in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, what I will try to uh, share with you is uh, where we are in stroke care as a country, what our strengths are and where our weaknesses are and how we should uh, progress in time to come. Sri Lanka, as we all know, is an island nation in the Indian Ocean with a land area of about 65,610 kilometers and uh, with a population of 21.8 million. It is categorized as a middle-income country with an estimated uh, per capita uh, income of 3,682 USD, that is in 2019. And uh, as a country, we have spent 3.9% of our GDP for healthcare. And when we look at the health parameters in general, we find that our health parameters are pretty good. So our average life expectancy for a female is 78 years, and for a male, it's 72. Likewise, we have also have a low infant and maternal mortality rate. And this is mainly because of our good public health system that is in, in place. So just to show you how our life expectancy has uh, evolved over the years, this is from 1920 to 2013. And you can see in 1920s, it would have been, it's less than 40, but now it has slowly increased and it's where it is now. That is both for males as well as females. It has improved tremendously. It's always good to compare with countries in the region to get, get us some idea. And when you look at the other countries in the SARC, uh, other SARC countries, you find that 
Sri Lankan tracing is the one on top, the one that, is, that I'm pointing to, the purple one. And you can see we, we stand out uh, in a considerable way compared to the other countries. So uh, there's uh, India, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. So ours is far better compared to those countries in the region. And even when you compare with life expectancy of uh, European countries, this is of course uh, 2015 data, you see that in Europe, the, the Western European countries have life expectancy over 80, but most of Russia and as well as uh, Central and Eastern European countries have uh, life expectancy, probably some of them actually lower than ours. So we are in that setting, quite, uh, we have achieved quite a lot. When you look at the infant mortality, once again, you can see the Sri Lankan tracing is right at the bottom here. So we have very low infant mortality and uh, Maldives also the one in purple here is the Maldivian line. It has also come down to in a similar manner and it's touching ours now. But when you compare the other sub countries, we are doing pretty well. How about the health expenditure? So this shows uh, again the SARC countries and uh, shows the percentage of the GDP spent on health. Now, Sri Lankan uh, tracing is the one shown in orange here. So we don't spend much actually on health. You see that it's somewhere around, it's less than 4% and it's about 3.6 here. This is up to 2015 and presently it's about 3. It has gone up a bit, but still it is nowhere compared to some of the other countries. For example, the uh, countries like uh, Afghanistan, Maldives, uh, and even Nepal spend far more as a percentage of the GDP. And uh, when you look at the per capita income, so the GDP, per capita income, we find that once again, Sri Lanka is here, the one in orange, we are here. And uh, Maldives being a small country with uh, tourism doing so well, they are right at the top, but we are ahead of the rest of the group. So all in all, when we look at all these things, we find that our general health parameters are pretty good in the region. And uh, also we seem to spend less compared to other countries. It's probably the efficiencies of the system and a good public health system that is in existence, which has helped us to achieve these uh, uh, basic uh, health parameters. When it comes to stroke, uh, stroke, called, these are actually they're called the annual health statistics for 2019 is considered the leading cause of adult disability. And when it comes to causes of hospital death, it, it's ranked number seven. This is the list. On top, we have ischemic heart disease, then infections, neoplasms, and then it's ranked as the seventh highest, leads to seven highest, the seventh in the list. So it's an important disease from a neurological aspect as well as from a general medical aspect. How about data? So in Sri Lanka, we have very little data, but we have two good population-based prevalence studies. So that is one conducted by Professor Udaya Ranavak in 2007, and another by Professor Tashi Chang in 2015. Both these studies interestingly showed a similar figure. These two studies were actually confined to the Western province, so we have data only uh, in relation to Western province, and that is, we have about 10 per thousand population. That is a stroke prevalence. However, we still do not have any population based prevalence studies outside Western province. And also, we don't have any incidence data at the moment. Another major factor when it comes to stroke care is that we have an evolving population demography. And it is a uh, estimated that over the last several decades that the elderly population has more or less doubled. So from 1981 to 2019, that is in a time period of 38 years, here you can see the percentage of the population in different age groups. So 1981 is depicted in blue and 2019 is depicted in orange. So here is the over 60 population. And as you can see, in 1981, the over 60 population accounted for 6.6% of the population. Whereas in, nine, in 2019, it has 
risen up to 12.3. It is a significant rise. And uh, correspondingly, there has been a decrease in the under 15 age group. This is mainly due to two reasons. One is, you, as you can see here, you can see the crude birth rate and the crude death rate. So the death rate has come down, but the crude the birth rate has come down as a, at, at a much uh, rapid pace. So due to this, there are, and also the increased life expectancy is leading to this major demographic change that we are witnessing in our country. So we have one of the fastest aging populations I think in the region and probably in the world. So these are the population pyramids just to uh, get a better idea. Now this uh, population pyramid is what a population consists of in 1981. And here you can see it's a bottom heavy kind of uh, the, the base is broader. But as in 2012, you find that it's getting narrower and the top is becoming a bit heavier. And this is the projected population pyramid for 2041. And as you can see, the younger age groups shown here is going to be even narrower and the old age groups are going to get broader and broader. So the trend is that the elderly percentage in our population is going to increase further in the coming years. Why is it important? Stroke, as we know, is a disease with a higher incidence in older people. And when the older population increases as a percentage, we will find that there are more and more stroke patients. Uh, thus leading to greater demand for stroke services. When it comes to stroke care, it's a continuum, we find that there are four main aspects. So one is acute management, and then there's a phase where we manage complications, then rehabilitation, and we also do secondary prevention. It's not really in sequence. There is a great deal of overlap when you do it, but these are the four main areas that we uh, have to deal with when it comes to stroke care. So what is the present status of stroke care in our country? Sri Lanka has a state-funded free and universal health care system, which consists of uh, Western and indigenous medical systems. And in addition to the free health services, we all know that there is also a private health care system here. And when it comes to stroke patients, most uh, patients, uh, when it comes to acute care, they get admitted to government hospitals, but follow up could take place either in the state or in the private sector. One important aspect that we have to consider is the bed capacity. So when you look at the total number of beds available in the state health sector with regard in, uh, in the Western medicine section, we find that we have uh, over 80,000, 8, 86,589 hospital beds distributed in 643 hospitals. This is the data from 2019, and uh, this is a table which shows how the hospital beds have increased from 2013 to 2019, and you can see that uh, here from 78,000 it has gone up to 86,000 within a six-year period. So I think the trend is upwards. So there is there are more and more hospital beds that have been added. In addition to hospital beds in the state sector for Western medicine. There's also private sector uh, beds. There are about 4,000, uh, there's 4,686 beds in the private sector. And then uh, when you take the indigenous medical sector, that is the, all these Ayurvedic hospitals, you get a, just a little bit over 4,000 beds. So that is the total bed strength in the country. But however, when you look at uh, stroke and in particular neurology beds, we find that it's only a very small number. So in, when you add up all the beds in the 36 neurology units, in Sri Lanka, we have 36 neurology units in the country. The total general neurology beds is 382. And if you look at the dedicated stroke beds in neurology units, it is 74. So when you compare to the total number of beds, you find that this is a very small percentage of beds. So from a priority point of view, I think we are not allocating adequate number of beds for stroke. So the 74 stroke beds that we have, these are dedicated beds, are distributed in nine hospitals. Uh, this is from an audit that we did among the neurologists last year. So the National Hospital has 10 beds, then Colombo North Teaching Hospital has six, Sri Jayadhanapura 10, General Hospital Kalutra 6, 
And then uh, Kuru Nagala has a large unit, relatively large unit with 16 beds. So these are the, the beds that are available for stroke. But in addition to these beds, we know that the rehabilitation hospital, there are seven uh, large rehabilitation hospitals overlooked by the rheumatologists who do provide uh, rehabilitation facilities uh, for many patients, including stroke patients, especially those who are stable and who require long-term rehabilitation. So these are the seven hospitals. So there's one at Ragama, there's another one at Digana, then Jayantipura in Polonnaruwa, and then there's one in Kandagul in Badulla, then one in Gaul and Ampara in Jaffna. And interestingly, there were, of the 36 uh, neurology units in the country, 60 neurology units did not have a single bed. So when it comes to human resource site, we uh, have 45 neurologists in active service, which comes to one neurologist per 480,000 population. Coming to stroke care over the years, I think we have made the major strides in many spheres. The first uh, main development for stroke care in the country was the establishment of the first stroke clinic, uh, which was at the Institute of Neurology National Hospital done during the time of Dr. Jagat J. Sekara. And this, is a unit, uh, this unit has grown in stature over the years and it's still functioning as the role model for training in stroke rehabilitation and also for multidisciplinary team, can stroke for the rest of the country. And then uh, another major development was the establishment of the National Stroke Association of Sri Lanka that was in 2001, and which has contributed in a major way by improving uh, public awareness on stroke risk factors and care and also they have conducted many programs, educational programs, and also they uh, do a lot of advocacy when it comes to stroke. Another major factor that uh, has contributed to improving stroke care is the establishment of the Association of Sri Lankan Neurology, that is a professional body which represents all the neurologists, and that uh, was in 2007. It was established in 2007, and uh, it has been a driving force for coordinated improvement of neurology services in the country and also has helped expansion of stroke services throughout the country. Next, we look at the acute care of stroke. And I think uh, when you look at uh, care in general, I think this was a turning point when it comes to stroke. In 1996, uh, the, the NINS showing that RTPA is effective for thrombolysis and that it, it improves outcomes. And uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, the first patient uh, was thrombolyzed in 2008 at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, and it was uh, mainly Dr. Padma, Madam Padma Gunaratna's initiative that uh, was able to achieve this. And then, since then, we see that the thrombolysis uh, uh, facilities have expanded uh, to many other centers. And right now, we have 22 hospitals in the state sector, and there's at least one hospital in each of the nine provinces. You can see the distribution in this. Uh, map here and uh, we are happy to state that wherever there is a neurologist and if there's a CT scanner in each of those hospitals there is thrombolysis so which is a, a great achievement so 2008 uh, now we are in 2021 that is 13 years so our thrombolysis uh, penetration is pretty good and patients uh, are seeking thrombolysis as well to some extent and also we are very pleased that the government of Sri Lanka has shown great commitment as Sri Lanka is one of the very few countries where RTP is offered free of charge in the state sector for patients requiring thrombolysis. I think probably the only country in the SARC region. When you look at thrombectomy, thrombectomy is another treatment option. Uh, this is large artery occlusions. The first thrombectomy in the country was performed in 2013 in a private hospital, the Asiri Central Hospital. And the first thrombectomy at in the state sector was once again at the National Hospital. It was again Madam's main initiative and Madam together with uh, uh, Dr. Prasad Disiba, who was the interventional radiologist uh, at National Hospital, performed the first successful thrombectomy in the country. Uh, in addition to that, we know when it comes to stroke, there are many other uh, additional investigations that we need to perform, especially uh, in addition to CT scanning, then. Uh, carotid doppler, echocardiography, and heart studies and all that. And when you look at the whole country, we find that these facilities are now available in many hospitals. 
in uh, in the country and uh, definitely at least there are one or two hospitals in each of the provinces which provide these and also when we look at uh, primary and secondary prevention stroke which are very important factors uh, the facilities for monitoring risk factors as well as medication to treat uh, the risk factors hypertension uh, dyslipidemia and diabetes is available free of charge in the state sector so when we uh, look at all these things i think we can be happy to some extent then there is also this that is the the ambulance service that was introduced some time ago the suicide ambulance service uh, this uh, uh, the service was commenced in 2016 in western and southern provinces and then um, now we have uh, 297 ambulances the, the network has expanded and it covers the whole country and we are very grateful to the government of india for providing the initial funding and also the technical assistance uh, in establishing this uh, rapid transport free ambulance transport system in our country so all these uh, advances have taken place and i think uh, in acute stroke as well as in prevention but there are several areas that are still lagging so the areas that i feel are lagging one is stroke rehabilitation the other is uh, community support services for patients and carers and the third is thrombectomy so with regard to stroke rehabilitation Following a stroke, a significant proportion of patients with stroke are left with disability requiring rehabilitation. And in an ideal setting, it should be provided in a well-equipped stroke unit with a multidisciplinary team led by a specialist trained in stroke rehabilitation. However, there are only few such stroke units in Sri Lanka, and those two also have limited bed capacity. And while neurologists lead stroke care throughout the country, most stroke patients are still admitted to general medical units and are attended to by general physicians. And uh, this is mainly due to lack of neurology and stroke, bits, as I shown you earlier. And uh, we know that when it comes to uh, stroke care in medical needs, we know medical needs are really busy with uh, so many admissions and things like that. With the heavy demand, patients are not kept for a reasonable amount of time. The required time and uh, attention for rehab is difficult to begin. And, uh, Therefore, patients are discharged prematurely and most of them seek uh, treatment in uh, Ayurvedic uh, centers as well as some just going home, not getting the required rehabilitation. So we get some idea about the present status from data from this uh, clinical registry. Again, uh, uh, it was a project initiated by Madam and Dr. Jeevagan some, uh, some time ago. Here we looked at data from this registry uh, for a period of six months in 2016, uh, looking at five major hospitals. So the, the hospitals that we took into consideration were National Hospital, in, uh, Teaching Hospital Candy, Columbus South Teaching Hospital, Jaffna and Karapitiya. And this was the duration, average duration of hospital stay for a stroke patient. So when you look at it, it looks uh, very, uh, it's unbelievable, like uh, patients are kept on average for 3.5 days at Columbus South Teaching Hall. This was the hospital that I was working at that time. Candy had 3.7 and then Karapitiya 3.6 and Jaffna 4.5. And when it came to National Hospital, if you exclude the stroke in it, the average was 7.2. And then National Hospital overall was 10, but stroke in it at patients for on average for about 21 days. So you can see if a patient gets admitted with a stroke, the vast majority are discharged pretty fast from the hospitals. So again, if you look at the average duration of hospital stay for all hospitals, it comes to five days. And when you look at the duration of hospital stay, uh, you find that it is interesting to know that 17% of stroke patients were actually discharged within 24 hours. And then, uh, not sure how it could happen, but that, that was what, what the data showed. Then uh, the majority of the patients were there for two to seven days, 68%. And then only very few patients uh, were there for longer than two weeks. Whereas when it came to the stroke unit, the average stay was 21 days. So this could uh, be due to several reasons. One is the case mix, maybe the National Stroke Unit, uh, the NHSS Stroke Unit had uh, patients who had uh, severe or more uh, higher NHS score and all that. But 
in addition to that, I think it's the availability of beds for rehabilitation and the commitment to, for rehabilitation that would have determined that those patients were kept for longer. So when it uh, when you look at the percentage of admissions uh, to national hospital who are actually catered to in the stroke unit was 15% of the total admissions. So how can we improve? So we clearly see that there is a deficiency here. We, we are not providing, at least uh, when it looks at, uh, we don't have much data regard to the input, but this uh, statistic alone shows that we are not providing a good rehabilitation service uh, at hospitals. So we can uh, look at uh, strategies to improve programming two levels. One is macro level and another as a macro, micro level strategy. So what are these macro level strategies? Macro level strategies would involve like prioritizing rehabilitation as an important healthcare goal. And uh, that is where the health ministry and the policymakers and administrators consider rehabilitation as an important healthcare goal. And then they uh, allocate sufficient funds and resources for towards that. And they, it also would involve developing infrastructure, setting up new units, and to improve rehabilitation bed capacity, providing adequate facilities, uh, including equipment for rehabilitation and also training therapies and developing effective stroke care pathways. So these are macro level strategies, but these uh, strategies will require funding, much funding, and also input from uh, health administrators, administrators and policymakers, and often would take time for implementation. So in the meantime, there are several things we as physicians, we could do. These are micro level strategies, is to reorganize the existing facilities to achieve rehabilitation goals. So very often in neurology world, sometimes it's just a matter of allocating a few beds uh, for stroke. Likewise, in a general medical ward, rather than uh, having a uh, stroke patient scattered in the ward, you can have a demarcated area within the ward allocated for rehabilitation of stroke patients. Another would be maybe starting an MDT meeting, a multidisciplinary team care meeting uh, as a first step. And then also introducing scales like Bartels index uh, for assessment and monitoring. These uh, aspects will be dealt with more in detail in the subsequent lectures as part of this uh, pre-Congress workshop. And these measures, the micro level measures would not require much funding and can be done by any neurologist or physician who has the commitment to improve rehabilitation. In addition, it's important to uh, improve the patient and the doctor perception regarding rehabilitation. Sometimes we may have facilities, but if the patients do not have faith or do not, maybe they're not aware. Sometimes the physician, the, the primary care physicians who look after these patients also may not be aware about the importance of rehabilitation or may not know where the rehabilitation facilities are available. So that's something that we had to rectify. Another thing that we need to do is to streamline the referral and transfer system from units which lack necessary facilities to, to units which have facilities. For example, a patient might get admitted to a local hospital where they do not have any uh, stroke rehabilitation facilities or beds, but there may be another hospital in the vicinity which might be having. So it's important for them to get in touch with the one which has and see whether the patient can be transferred for rehabilitation. And also it is important to pay attention to the quality of the services. When we are having a rehabilitation in it, sometimes uh, we, might, we may just have beds, but it's not just having a patient in a bed in a rehabilitation in it. One has to give quality care. And even in the units that we have, we find that the it's difficult when uh, there are not enough uh, therapies. Uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, a patient who's kept in a rehabilitation unit even might get only about 15 to 20 minutes of physiotherapy for the day, which is not adequate. So I think we have to ensure that quality is not compromised in these units. So whether it be macro or micro level strategies, I think it's important that we adapt data-driven or evidence-based strategies and also we have to always be mindful of the cost involved. Because whatever we do, whether it's a drug therapy or rehabilitation, there's a cost and the cost uh, can be broken down into capital expenditure and recurrent costs. And we have to be cost conscious, especially in a country like ours where there's uh, limited resources. 
and financial constraints. Another area I think we have to pay attention is uh, discharge planning. And uh, that is very important when it comes to a patient who's, uh, uh, who's been in ward and now we are thinking about sending the patient home for a smooth transition, we have to plan it properly. And ideally, all uh, the multidisciplinary care team, has, all the members of the care team has to give the input and it's a, it has to done, be done in a proper way. And we have to also engage the carer as well as the patient. And uh, these are standard practice adopted in most Western countries, but in Sri Lanka, still it's at its infancy, I would say. And um, another important thing that is lacking in Sri Lanka is home assessments prior to sending patients home. In certain countries, they have uh, uh, occupational therapists who actually visit the patient's home to see how safe it is and they recommend various things, changes that uh, home modification and all that. And uh, that is done prior to discharge. So uh, to my knowledge, this is not happening in Sri Lanka. Maybe another area we can uh, think about improving in time to come. Audits are very important, whether it be rehabilitation or any other unit and to make sure that proper standards are maintained and also to make sure that uh, we use the facilities optimally. And uh, sometimes uh, something that gets in the way is motivation because sometimes uh, even in stroke clinics, we find that patients after a certain period, they lose interest in the rehabilitation. Likewise, sometimes the stroke team also can lose interest uh, in what they're doing. So it's always important uh, to keep everyone motivated at the, on task at hand. Uh, to achieve what we are planning to do. So this can be done by conducting regular meetings with uh, feedback and also encouragement given to the staff. The next, uh, the second area that uh, that is still lacking in Sri Lanka is the community support services. And we know that despite best efforts in rehabilitation, there are patients who are left with significant disability and, uh, and who are dependent. And uh, in these situations, the burden often falls on the extended family. And uh, we know that there is uh, rapidly changing uh, family settings in Sri Lanka. Also many families actually, there, are, there aren't any children to look after. And even if children are there, they are overseas. So uh, there are patients uh, we find that they don't have uh, an extended family to look after or care support. And uh, that brings us to, in. Uh, to hostels, nursing homes, and palliative care centers. And in Sri Lanka, there are only a handful of these uh, institutes, and this is another service which we will have to think about, especially with a rapidly aging population as we have in the country. And uh, even at the National Hospital, we find that uh, sometimes our patients have to be kept for a very long period because we have no place to discharge them. And I think that's a common finding for other hospitals as well where discharge can be delayed unnecessarily where, because of uh, lack of these intermediate care centers. We also have very little respite care. Respite care is uh, institutes where a patient uh, uh, can be kept for a day or two to give some relief to the carer because sometimes uh, the carer might get burnt out if not. So respite care centers are there in most Western countries and uh, I think maybe something that we might also have to think about in time to come. However, there are a few things uh, that have happened in Sri Lanka. One is the involvement of the Department of Social Services. And uh, there are some concessions given to patients with stroke with disability. And through the Division of Secretaries, uh, there is a, a provision for housing grants for patients uh, with stroke. There's also some financial assistance the stroke patients can obtain for home modifications, such as disability access. Uh, if someone uh, needs a toilet with a commode, there's again financial assistance available. And if they do not have electricity or pipe bound water, they can get relief there as well. In addition, uh, they could also get financial grants for obtaining medicine, not, not, which are not available in the state sector and also to purchase assistive devices such as wheelchairs and crutches. And uh, there is also provision for vocational training. This is especially important for young people who suffer from strokes because uh, as part of the rehabilitation, we hope one day that they can return 
back to their normal self and also to uh, be able to at least uh, seek some kind of self-employment. So the social service department does support uh, vocation. They have vocational training programs as well as uh, financial assistance for self-employment. These are already next and there's going to be a talk on this uh, in the workshop that you might be attending. Finally, thrombectomy facilities. Uh, uh, of course, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's very limited in Sri Lanka. At the moment, only two hospitals offer. That is the National Hospital Sri Lanka and RCD Central Hospital, which is a private hospital. There are three new developments uh, which is most, which are going to change the landscape of stroke rehabilitation in the country in the near future, I would think. And the first is the entry of specialists in rehabilitation medicine. So already we have seen uh, uh, physicians in critical care and emergency medicine integrated into the systems and they are doing a wonderful job. Now, in a few years time, we will have uh, specialists in rehabilitation medicine. Uh, this has been a long felt need in the country and it was in 2017 that the PGM offered rehabilitation medicine as a post MD subspecialty. And I was told that there are seven postgraduates in training and the first batch is expected to commence work in 2023. So definitely the entry of specialists uh, committed for rehabilitation is going to have a huge impact on rehabilitation and they will be the driving force in the near future alongside the neurologists and the rehab and the rheumatology doctors who are already providing rehabilitation for patients. The next uh, new development that is happening is the establishment of a national stroke center. Uh, this is again uh, uh, an initiative uh, uh, driven by Madam actually during when she was at the National Hospital, which was the lead neurologist. She started this and it's uh, uh, it's still ongoing. So there, there is a, 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 a national stroke center which is being built at the Colombo East Hospital in Mulleriava, and this will uh, increase the bed capacity for rehabilitation, especially. Uh, in the Western uh, province, where we will have a comprehensive stroke center with the input from multidisciplinary care team with sufficient number of beds. And hopefully this will be commissioned in, in a few years time. The third uh, is what we hope will happen is that we will, we hope that there will be a stroke clinic in each of the provinces. Uh, Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka in 2011 made a policy decision to establish a stroke clinic in each province. And uh, it is ante anticipated that this would become a reality in the near future because I think it's not only the Western province, there are many patients with stroke in other provinces as well. So to have an equitable uh, service in the periphery, it is very important that stroke clinics are developed in all the other provinces as well. So looking at stroke rehabilitation, it is an area with much scope for further improvement and improving capacity and with better coordination within and between sectors and commitment are key aspects required to achieve the final objective, which is to offer an optimal, comfortable setting for stroke patients to facilitate the best possible recovery with dignity. So I'll come to the end of my presentation. So when it comes to stroke care, I think it's very important, first of all, to be committed and uh, to be focused on what we are doing. And then we know it's not an easy task, it's an uphill task. There'll be many obstacles along the way when it comes to improving rehabilitation, but with commitment, I'm sure we can. And as a team, it's always a team that will be able to work, especially in rehabilitation. And, um, and hopefully we will get to the top and achieve our objective in stroke rehabilitation. Conduct the next session on principles of stroke recovery and rehabilitation. I would like to invite Dr. Garmini Patirana, consultant neurologist, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you. I hope I can see. I, I can. I can be heard from your end. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I must thank. Uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Candy Society of Medi Medicine uh, uh, for inviting me to do this talk. I think this is a repetition of the same stroke workshop that has happened some time ago 
uh, in SLMA, we had a session in collaboration with ASN, Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists. Uh, what I'm trying to do within the next few minutes uh, is to discuss a few important principles or uh, concepts in uh, stroke recovery and rehabilitation. Uh, I think Seneca's lecture made a big impact on what, what the Sri Lankan situation is compared to the rest of the world and where we should go, how we should go and what are we are looking at the final goal. I'm going to touch you on basic principles and a little bit of medicine and pathophysiology of stroke and things like that. So as, as uh, you are aware, stroke is a, a acute neurological deficit by definition uh, due to uh, infarction or hemorrhage that is happening in the central nervous system, uh, which is lasting more than 24 hours. That's the definition of stroke. And we know majority are infarcts, about 85% and a minority is uh, hemorrhage. And uh, we know stroke causes death and disability. Uh, about 15% die and then a certain percentage fully recover. And the rest of it, uh, they either full recover uh, with major disability and dependent on someone else to for, for their functions. And then um, with, this with minor disability or moderate disability. And few facts about stroke. Uh, we know stroke is very common now. Uh, World Stroke Association organization says that uh, one in four is likely to have a stroke during lifetime. That's a big number. Uh, and it's probably at the to fifth cause of death in most countries. Um, and also it's a common cause of disability among um, productive life people among adults. Uh, and 80% of the burden is felt in low and middle income countries like ours. And we also know that it's preventable and it's treatable. Uh, stroke is now considered as a treatable thing and it's, a, it's, it's under emergency uh, 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 medical problems. So patients should be immediately coming to the hospital if there's a stroke. Once a patient comes to the emergency or to the hospital, patient will be going through one of these three pathways, depending on uh, uh, arrival time and also whether they are qualifying for reperfusion strategies. So uh, in acute emergency pathway, where we are trying to reperfuse or recanalize the blocked artery uh, in an attempt to salvage the penumbra. I hope the word penumbra is familiar to you. We know when uh, uh, artery supplying the brain is blocked, uh, the, the total area supplied by that artery does not immediately die. There's a central core which will die immediately and then there's a surrounding area which dies slowly or an area which is threatened to be dead within the next few minutes or hours. The slow death uh, or slow process of death surrounding the dead core is because of the collateral supply uh, by other arteries. So if someone is having a good collateral supply, this penumbra or the threatened brain tissue will survive longer. Uh, initially, we thought the penumbra is lasting about three hours from the first trial, NINDS trial, which was published in 95. So we were thrombolizing up to three hours. And in 2005, uh, by the CAS-3 trial, it proved that uh, Penumbra probably is there up to 4.5 hours. So we are now thrombolizing up to 4.5 hours. So going by the uh, two major trials, the NIMS and the uh, ECAS-3, we are thrombolizing patients following the protocol in that uh, particular trial up to 4.5 hours from the onset of the stroke. Um, so people who are presenting within the window of opportunity 4.5 hours, they enters the um, acute emergency pathway where the patient is immediately uh, exposed to a CT scan and then there is a, a protocol that we follow in selecting whether that particular patient is suitable for thrombolysis. So if that patient is suitable, then uh, thrombolysis is given to that particular patient. Those who are not suitable, those who disqualify, enters the subacute pathway um, 
those who are disqualifying, uh, those who are presenting within the window but disqualify, they enter the subacute pathway. And also the, the patients who are presenting later than 4.5 hours, but still within 24 hours, they also enter the subacute pathway. Subacute pathway, uh, we don't work them up for thrombolysis or thrombectomy or reperfusion strategies, but there are other things that we do. Well, they will be covered in a stroke management lecture, but I don't have time to go through the details of that. And then there'll be patients who are presenting later than that, maybe day two, day three, maybe sometimes we have seen patients presenting even beyond two weeks. Um, if they present beyond two weeks, it's very difficult to differentiate whether it's an infarct or a bleed also, because the CT scan changes might not be there. So you now rehabilitation is provided for all patients and it is uh, helpful for most of the patients. Now, true that the acute care pathways are being developed and the stroke management is being re re uh, revolutionized over years and it's changing very rapidly. Uh, but rehabilitation, which had been there for stroke patients, remains the same and that is suitable for uh, all patients with stroke. And that's the major contributory factor for their functional development, uh, even up to now, even with this newer treatment modalities being available. So it looked like uh, the patient within the 24 hours enters acute phase, and uh, um, then they follow with the intermediate stage up to seven days, and then there'll be a later phase. We have divided these uh, phases in a stroke patient because acute phase will be uh, very closely monitored and closely handled like an emergency. And 24 hours to seven days, again, it will probably like a subacute stage where you need, the patient might get exposed to various uh, preventable complications like aspiration, pneumonia, DVT, pulmonary embolism, infections, and so on. So they need to be looked after even closer during this stage. And then patient gradually become more rehabit rehabitable beyond seven days. So the input for rehabilitation starts from day one, but the intensity and the amount of rehabilitation and the dominance of rehabilitation will increase as the patient uh, advances in time. So later it become mostly rehabilitation more than uh, anything else. Um, we know that stroke has a big impact on the community. Um, you know, when you have patients with disability or people with disability in a, in a community, it affects the uh, progression of the or improvement or development of the function of the society. How we can reduce the stroke disability burden in a community? We can think of a few uh, options. One is primary prevention. If you have never had a stroke, we think of because stroke is common. I said one in four is likely to have a stroke during lifetime is to uh, find out whether you have the risk of uh, getting a stroke and I would have a good lifestyle uh, uh, with regard to the diet and exercise and prevention of smoking and various things, uh, preventing stroke primarily. And uh, uh, TIA is another opportunity given for an individual before getting a major stroke. So the moment you recognize the TIA, if you act on the TIA, you can prevent major strokes in a number of patients. So TIA is an opportunity given to a patient who is likely to get a major stroke for them to give time to get them evaluated and get the treatment. For example, if the TIA is due to cardioembolism, maybe we can prevent a major stroke. If the TIA is a, a due to carotid stenosis or maybe atherothromboembolism, if you find out what the what the mechanism is, or thrombophilia, uh, what the mechanism is for the TIA, and if you fix it, and then you can prevent the, the, the major stroke. So TIS has to be fast evaluated, like a major stroke has to come very fast to the hospital for acute care. TIA too need to be evaluated very fast. So there's a, a list of uh, tests that they will undergo and the patient will be examined clinically evaluated, and then mechanism of the TIA is sought, and then you fix it in, a, in an attempt to uh, prevent the stroke. And acute reperfusion therapies are there, stroke unit care, 
early uh, aspirin therapy, dual antiplatelets, and high dose statins. All these are evidence based to reduce stroke disability, long term stroke, stroke disability. Most of the trials they have used uh, 90 day uh, MR score as a as a measure of uh, assessment for improvement in the disability, which have proved beyond doubt these, these interventions are useful for uh, improving the function of these stroke patients. Now, rehabilitation also is a very useful and the main, one of the main things that we uh, do for improving the function of the stroke patient. So we know when you block an artery, you get an infarct. Now in this CT scan, you see the right side MCA artery is blocked and patient will have a, a hemiplegia on the right, sorry, left side MCA stroke and patient has right sided weakness. Now when brain cells are dead, um, they do not regenerate. So you might wonder whether this deficit has to remain the same and cannot improve because the brain cells have no potential for regeneration. But that is not what we see clinically. We see they improve. They improve even if you do not give any rehabilitation, but if you give rehabilitation uh, services, then patient improve to a higher level than otherwise. How does, how does the improvement takes place if the brain cells cannot regenerate? This is explained by two things. One is stroke recovery. The other one is stroke rehabilitation. Now, what does it, what does it mean? Now, uh, when you have an infarct, we know there is uh, damage. And uh, there may be a penumbra that can be salvaged. And on top of infarct, you develop cerebral edema surrounding the infarct, which can cause secondary damage. So there is uh, not only the stroke damage, there can be other uh, secondary events taking place. So all, of, all these things, if they are reversing, that helps the recovery. So recovery is a function of uh, reversal of the pathology in the acute phase. On the other hand, the stroke rehabilitation is like relearning. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's governed by therapy sessions, repeated exercises, repeated sessions. The patient's function improves. So there's a difference between the stroke recovery and rehabilitation. So stroke requiring recovery means uh, it's a spontaneous improvement in function from reversal of injury. It's not by rehabilitation. And what happens patholo pathologically, it's resolution of cerebral edema, resolution of the diaschesis, that's a disruption of blood flow and metabolism, and resolution of the penumbra, as opposed to stroke rehabilitation, uh, which is improvement in function, both causes improvement in function. And here, improvement in function attributable to therapy sessions. And in function of a neuro, neuroplasticity is what is uh, the uh, rewiring of the brain. That is what is happening in the brain. And uh, this is due to uh, therapy sessions and rehabilitation. What happens in the brain? What is neuroplasticity? It's actually synaptogenesis. New synapses are being formed, unmasking, finding new areas for various activities and neurotransmitter alteration. So there are certain pathological changes in the brain responsible for uh, rewiring or relearning those lost tasks. And again, the same thing depicted uh, pictographically, ability of the nervous system to respond to intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli um, uh, by several ways sprouting and also unmasking is another uh, uh, area is being taken over for the function. So uh, neuroplasticity and injury recovery are the main mechanisms by which the patient improves in their function. That happens over a period of time. Um, you can see that the neuroplasticity lasts longest beyond months and years, but injury recovery is a short lasting thing. The stroke recovery is a short lasting thing and uh, neuroplasticity, which is actually uh, neuro rehabilitation, uh, the effect of it lasts longer and it's effective for a longer period of time. You can see this is a, uh, actually a, a taken from one of the studies then, a lesion on the uh, uh, left hemisphere. So uh, uh, the right hemisphere adopts the, uh, whatever the skills lost. And after a chronic phase, again, this area is transferred to the other opposite side. So another brain area is taking over the function that is lost. And that is how you uh, explain 
the improvement of these patients. Again, you can see by repeated activity. Now you have seen a, a, a patient with a, a deficit exposed to no rehabilitation versus rehabilitation. And at the end, you see uh, in the functional MRI, you can see hand area is uh, uh, represented in a larger area in the patient who has rehabilitated versus the other patient. These actually uh, uh, animal models in the, uh, showing the effect of rehabilitation. And how can we improve the brain plasticity? Um, repeated activity and training triggers neuroplasticity. That's a known fact, which modifies the central nervous system to recover functionally. So rehabilitation means repeated activity and training. How do we do the repeated activity and training? Anyway, the naturally also people do activities. Even if you do not ask to do very various tasks by the therapist, they do certain activities. So there's some improvement taking place from natural uh, activities. And also scientific goal-oriented repetition of tasks and activities under supervision by therapist, which scientifically have built in, you can reach a large, uh, higher uh, functional goal than otherwise if you do not do any rehabilitation. And task-oriented approach is usually preferred over muscle-oriented rehabilitation. We don't want to improve a muscle, but we want to improve various tasks and function of the patient. How much of therapy sessions are necessary for a patient when you get a stroke? They say about 400 to 600 repetitions are necessary to have a neuronal structural changes for upper limb. And for lower limb, they say 1,000 to 2,000 steps are necessary. So it depends on the activity you're talking about. So the number of repetitions of activity uh, sessions, the therapy sessions, uh, depends on the particular activity that you're looking at. So we also know under um, activity goes to a lower level of function and too much of activity sometimes will, will improve the outcome. But if you give too extra, extra too much, then you can end up in burning out. So that can be counterproductive also. So you should, we should try to strike a balance between these two and understand how much of therapy sessions per day, how many hours at a session is needed for a particular task. So therapists have been taught about these things so they know what to do. And depending on the goal that you are looking at, they uh, insist on the, uh, the frequency and the duration of various therapy sessions. Uh, purpose of rehabilitation, as you are aware, actually the goal of rehabilitation is to regain or improve function and restore independence and improve quality of life. And the leisure vocational concerns has to be met. They are also one of the goals. And also, finally, reintegration of the patient into the home and society. And uh, the, finally, the goal is to help a person achieve highest level of function possible in relation to extent of the disability and the impairment. An optimum duration and frequency of therapy cycles. Usually, as a rule of thumb, it's three hours per day. Uh, but it changes. The physiotherapists and the other therapists may advise to have longer duration and lesser or more frequency. Um, so it depends on the task type, physique, and the patient's motivation and so on. And also, how do we carry out therapy? Uh, it's by series of steps. So initial goal uh, may be something uh, that patient uh, can reach. Uh, it's a challengeable goal, uh, challenging goal that the therapy is advised to uh, take. A patient who is on the bed, I, we, we can't ask them to stand up and walk. So, so it will be step-by-step -step activities, goals that they are trying to reach. And then gradually over a period of time, you try to uh, climb this lab, uh, step and then go to the top of the function. Um, what about rehabilitating a patient who is in the, within the first 24 hours, should you start in the very early stage? Um, people thought it may be beneficial because immobility may lead to secondary complications in any, any medical condition or surgical condition. We want them to be mobilized very early. So people thought if you mo mobilize them very early, that will be effective. And also, um, Uh, there was a hypothesis that uh, brain recovery is best in the initial phase. So people arguing theoretically that potential benefits are there. Is there a potential harm? Mm, if you get them up, up out of the bed, maybe 
uh, the cerebral blood flow can be reduced. So people are arguing against also. And then this, there was this trial, AVERT trial, uh, looking at very early rehabilitation, looking at whether the improvement, uh, long-term improvement, whether, how does it work? And what the conclusion was, if you give um, two uh, high therapy sessions within the first 24, that's probably counterproductive. So they did not advise to uh, give uh, very intense rehabilitation within the 20, first 24, but usual care can take place. Um, now, so benefits of early mobilization we were discussing, very early intense therapy may be harmful. So delayed start or rehabilitation leads to poor outcome too. So we need to start early at a lower intensity and the intensity gradually increased over a period of time. And window of opportunity for rehabilitation uh, is first three to six months, but further rehab is still necessary for certain functions. Having said this, rehabilitation does not stop. Usually it's effective within the, the earlier you do, the, the better the outcome, but you keep going um, up to six months, maybe even beyond uh, up to one year, even beyond that, we continue to rehabilitate. Uh, uh, it's still, it's going to be proven to be effective. Um, the setting of rehabilitation, we have acute comprehensive inpatient hospital setting. And then uh, these are actually where patients are uh, uh, having acute problem, where medical input is necessary. And as uh, the time goes on, they can be transferred to a skilled nursing, subacute, again, inpatient setting. And further late, we can, can think of continuing from home or as outpatient or community rehabilitation. Um, we are not fully established in our country, but these are what should happen in future. Key factors for brain recovery depends on the intensity, as we discussed, the repetitions, durations, frequency, intensity, and so on and then uh, pathological factors, uh, manner in which you do them and various instruction books and so on. And uh, we know stroke rehabilitation is done by a team of experts, a lot of therapists there, and the uh, uh, stroke rehabilitation physician or the neurophysician or uh, specialist in rehabilitation, someone will be leading the team and there'll be other therapy teams doing various component of it. And uh, how we plan rehabilitation is by looking at what was the impairment, what are the issues with the rehabilitation patient and plan action accordingly. So if the patient has spasticity, contractures, or very medical problems, and depending on the neurological deficits, you need to plan for various actions by the rehab team. I'm not going into details of them. And common impairments of stroke, uh, you have uh, various deficits that happens with stroke, whereas uh, most of them, we have something to do as far as rehabilitation is concerned. You have, uh, you can see percentage of various impairments and strategies to um, manage stroke impairment. Um, there are various strategies, you will be hearing them in the, in the lectures, the rest of the lectures, various therapists are talking about all these things. I'm not going into the details, so depending on the problem, you have, you, have to de you have to decide on certain interventions, whether this is spasticity, weakness, uh, painful shoulder, and um, various actions that you decide on, maybe constraint induced movement therapy, you will learn all these things in the rest of the lectures. So stroke rehabilitation has phases. Phase one, as in any other medical problem, you need to evaluate. You get all the details, medical, functional, lifestyle, uh, occupational details. Phase two uh, is arrest pathogenesis, the stroke recovery process. Phase three, enhancement, that is to do exercises and strengthening the muscles and various uh, tasks. And phase four is actually you are mainly looking at the tasks, various tasks, task reacquisition, uh, looking at various tasks and the patients are trained for that. And phase five is environmental modification to suit the patient if further rehabilitation um, you know, patient has reached the peak improvement from rehabilitation, then you look at environment modification to uh, uh, make the patient independent. So evaluation, of course, history, examination, and various clinical tools are there that people use. 
Um, these are some of the clinical tools people use to assess uh, the rehabilitation and deficit uh, uh, level of the patient. NIHSS, um, uh, FIM, not, we don't go into the details of them. They are, they are used by the therapists. So phase three is uh, enhancement, range of motion exercises, gentle stretching, and you look at orthotics like uh, uh, A for cocks, cups, splints, shoulder halter, and so on. And um, phase four is task reacquisition. Uh, once the patient has achieved adequate sitting and standing balance, gait training, step climbing, ADL training, and so on. And uh, relearning uh, uh, tasks must follow correct movement and technique, avoid maladaptive behavior. So when you are when you are doing the therapy sessions, uh, the therapist advise the correct technique of movements for them to follow. But otherwise, uh, when they try to do it on themselves, uh, they may use various uh, maladaptive uh, ways of relearning that can uh, that may not take them to the maximum functional improvement. So environment modification, I think we are all. Well, heard of these things, railings on the better side of the body and grab bars in bathrooms and um, water health faucet on the able side, toilet chairs with armrest and so on. And uh, uh, improve confidence in patient and family. Uh, family plays a big role in uh, caring for stroke patients, especially in Sri Lanka. So we need to always talk to them they are also under stress. Stroke is not something that affects only one individual, it affects the family. So uh, we need to chat with them all the time. The family relationships, family support plays a, plays a big role in taking this patient back to normalcy, or at least to improve in them to maximum that is possible. So uh, we need to talk to them. Uh, they need to be supported. The family needs to be supported. And family support has to be taken for the patient also by um, rehabilitation team talking to them, having family meetings and so on. And we need an enriched environment for rehabilitation with compassion, attention, nurturing and stimulation. So motivational uh, 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 environment where a patient is determined and uh, uh, encouraged by the family and, and the people around them. Uh, spasticity management is a separate topic by itself, um, not needed for all of them but very carefully selected for various patients to improve their function. And also we should know that treating spasticity over treatment may worsen the function also. Um, few uh, rehabilitation techniques that people adopt. Constraint induced therapy is where patient has weakness on your left hand and you restrain the right hand and prevent the right hand being used. One of the reasons why with left arm weakness, they do not they do not recover very fast. Is you you try to use the right hand for everything because the right hand is the dominant side, and you you have the very uh, efficient hand to work with. So left hand does not get any therapy. So you restrain that side, then you are compelled to use the left hand, and also uh, brain stimulation by various methods by magnetism or electrical stimulation, robotics and functional electrical stimulation. They are new techniques, so not really new, but they are uh, novel techniques that are being used. So constraint induced movement therapy is where you restrain one side and uh, uh, compel the patient to use the affected side. Um, and then uh, robotic assisted therapy, there are two kinds of thing where if the weakness is distal part of the arm, you use an end effector device mechanical forces to move that area. So physiotherapist job is done by a robotic device. And then if the weakness is proximal, you use exoskeleton type robotic devices. And they are, they are, they are, they are um, uh, used in the, with the supervision of the therapist actually. Um, and also people are exposed to brain stimulation while the therapy sessions are happening. One is magnetic stimulation, the other one is trans-electric stimulation. How these are done to which patient, all depend on where you are and available facilities and uh, therapists who are monitoring them. And rhythmic auditory stimulation can enhance gait function by improving the pace for walking. So you've given a rhythm to do the uh, walking. So that also seems to be helping the 
outcome. And uh, mirror therapy is a known thing. You uh, let the patient see the normal side through the mirror and then uh, uh, give that in intention into the mind and continue with therapy. That also has an effect. So, uh, so there is a battery of rehab interventions to improve physical function and uh, stand alone. None can guarantee a complete recovery, but judicious uh, combination of these techniques can bring good result. Thank you. If you have any questions, I can answer. Thank you very much, sir. Apparently, we do not have any questions. Thank you, sir, for your very informative session. Uh, so let's move on to the next session. Uh, it's on disabilities in stroke and rehabilitation assessment. Uh, to conduct this session, I would like to invite Dr. Gunendrika Kasturatnan, consultant rheumatologist, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Over to you, madam. Good morning. Disability in stroke and rehabilitation assessment. A standard way of disability assessment is a key component in a stroke rehabilitation program. Disability in stroke, mobility impairment is a common and a major component in uh, post-stroke disability. Commonest uh, impairment uh, in, uh, in a post-stroke victim is hemiparesis or hemiplegia. Uh, and also uh, balance impairment due to cerebral ataxia or in long term, the persistence of motor synergies, contractures and spasticity will also add to the uh, mobility impairment in a post-stroke victim. Inability to perform functions or uh, the effect on uh, activities of daily living is also a major uh, area of disability in a post-stroke victim. Uh, again, hemiplegia will affect the uh, ability to perform any activity of daily living and also apraxia or conditions like hemianopia or hemi neglect will also uh, significantly affect the uh, activities of daily living and also uh, uh, having depression or cognitive impairments will also impair the normal functioning in an individual uh, even if they had uh, normal or a satisfactory uh, mobility or motor tone uh, incontinence a good control in the you know, sphincters is an essential uh, component or essential uh, feature uh, for an individual to behave confidently in community or society. Uh, incontinence in a uh, post-stroke victim is mainly uh, urinary incontinence. Uh, incontinence may be uh, due to damage to the mitral center as a direct result of a stroke or else they will have a technical or practical incontinence due to uh, mobility impairment or cognition impairment while they maintain normal bladder function. Various aphasias will result uh, uh, after a stroke. Uh, the ability to communicate uh, in an effective manner is an essential uh, feature again uh, to function independently for an individual. Various aphasias like expressive aphasia, receptive aphasia, or uh, it could be global aphasia, uh, and they may have, uh, in addition uh, or separately, uh, problems with reading. We call it dyslexia or alexia, and they may have difficulty in writing, or they may have specific aphasias like anomic aphasia. Uh, dysphagia is a common uh, problem after a stroke, so uh, we need to do a you know, bedside, bedside swallowing assessment uh, as an uh, essential component in our in initial evaluation. Uh, usually the dysphagia will recover rapidly, but while they are having this uh, difficulty in swallowing, they are at high risk of uh, aspiration, chest infections, nutritional uh, problems and dehydration 
so things like this uh, i mean those uh, uh, problems related to dysphagia will further aggravate or further impair you know, the functional ability in a post stroke victim pain uh, can add to the disability there are various pain syndromes identified in post stroke victims uh, the hemiparetic shoulder pain is a very common problem uh, especially uh, it will affect the hand function and uh, as a result uh, uh, many activities of daily living uh spasticity can be painful sometimes sometimes uh, stroke, stroke victims may have a persistent headache uh, or it could be complex regional pain syndrome or central post uh, stroke pain which are uh, difficult situations to treat actually uh, and uh, cognition impairments uh, normal cognition includes uh, good memory reasoning speech uh, relevant speech and problem solving skills so uh, this is also a possible uh, problem in a post stroke victim and will affect the uh, independent functioning uh, significantly uh, so so basically those are the uh, major or uh, common uh, disabilities in a post stroke victim so we need to quantify disability we need to give a numerical value for the disability or we want to measure the functionality uh, especially to standardize the language used in stroke trials and uh, audits clinical audits but also quantifying disability Uh, or quantifying functionality is similarly important in clinical practice as well because in our rehabilitation programs we need to monitor the improvement we we need to uh, quantitatively uh, see the uh, improvement in uh, the independence or functioning and also uh, most of the available uh, disability scales or outcome measures can be used to predict the outcome of our uh, individual the stroke victim so there are various uh, disability scales or outcome measures available uh, so uh, what uh, we we need to uh, uh, identify need to classify or we need to categorize these uh, disability scales in in the aim of selecting a good uh, uh, relevant outcome measure for a particular purpose like to measure a particular area so the the international classification of functioning disability and health the who icf is the framework that aids this classification it helps to decide on an appropriate measure or a scale for a particular purpose to measure a particular area uh, it's a global instrument it provides a unifying language standard language uh, this is based on the biopsychosocial approach which integrates uh, biological individual and social dimensions of health the icf consists of Uh, three main domains those are body functions and structures activity and participation environmental and personal factors so those components interact with each other and there are feedback loops uh, this picture summarizes the icf uh, a normal health condition is maintained with normal body functions and structures which will perform the standard or normal activities uh, uh, helping the individual to participate in various life events uh, environmental factors and personal factors may affect these interactions positively or negatively uh, so if there is a disease or a disorder the body functions and structures will have various impairments 
the result will be activity limitation and then uh, the restriction of participation so participation here means uh, participating in cultural religious educational or leisure activities and uh, environment and personal factors will uh, influence the situation if we take stroke as the example for uh, the disease condition uh, the impairments will be like hemiparesis aphasias uh, memory impairment cognitive cognitive impairment uh, loss of sphincter control uh, and impaired swallowing so the resulting activity limitations will be impaired sitting eating drinking washing bathing uh, impaired or inability to stand and walk and also they will have incontinence and dysphagia uh, so because of these activity limitations the individual is unable to function independently with in family so uh, community uh, and uh, will not be able to ride a bicycle drive a car or uh, go and earn in the in his uh, office or any uh, any other uh, earning will be uh, affected or uh, so are the environment and personal factors going to affect the uh, ability or independence uh, environmental factors like uh, steps or narrow entrances which will uh, restrict the entrance of a person with a wheelchair or with a work walking frame uh, and those are environmental barriers uh, personal factors like lack of motivation low self esteem those uh, factors will be uh, influencing negatively right uh, so those are the major domains in the ICA uh, so those uh, disability scales or the outcome measures have been categorized in according to those components or domains in the ICA what are the uh, assessment or assessment scales uh, to measure impairment examples are uh, these uh, depression scales and uh, the mini mental state examination those are uh, those will assess the level of impairment uh, those those uh, special uh, uh, scales like canadian neurological scale modified ranking scale national institutes of health stroke scale those uh, scales are specifically used to assess the stroke severity and uh, the geriatric depression scale uh, there are again there is a score but the score will indicate the severity of depression it's a guide for medical intervention it will not give us a, a, a clear idea of the level of functioning how the depression the, the severity of, how the de severity of depression is going to affect the functioning of that in and uh, what are the assessment tools of activity limitation here the activity limitation is limitation of the activities of daily living uh, we know the, the familiar uh, assessment scales here are barthel index and uh, fim or the functional independence measure Uh, the barthel index is very familiar to us uh, uh, so functions like feeding bathing grooming and dressing uh, we give a score uh, depending on the uh, level of independence if it is if they are fully independent in feeding 10 marks if they need some help 5 marks if they are unable to do that zero uh, not only the activities like uh, adls uh, also, also mobility on level surfaces and uh, climbing stairs so uh, here also they are given marks for the uh, ability to ambulate so the total marks will be out of 100 uh, 
the Bartle index is therefore it's a measure of functioning. There is no information about the medical diagnosis and this is generally used by stroke rehabilitation teams and also any uh, physical rehabilitation team can use it. Uh, the assessment of participation restriction here uh, uh, the scales used are uh, uh, they are uh, uh, assessment tools for quality of life. A commonly used a familiar uh, assessment scale of uh, quality of life or participation restriction is this SF36. It's a global measure of health related quality of life. Quality of life is defined as the degree to which an individual is healthy, comfortable and able to participate in or enjoy the life events. Uh, the scores will indicate the level of uh, uh, actually the quality of life. Uh, so how can we select uh, an outcome measure for our uh, purpose? So there are criteria to guide us uh, on selecting a proper uh, relevant outcome measure. The major areas we should uh, look at are reliability, validity and responsiveness. Uh, in addition, there are few these, uh, negative drawbacks as well. All those available outcome measures will not always fit neatly into a single category. There are overlaps uh, or uh, they, they will assess elements belonging to more than one domain in the ICF. Uh, the, and uh, the other fact is that only very few studies have been uh, done um, to explore the post-stroke functionality based on this ICF conceptual model. Right, so uh, and I would like to uh, entertain any questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Uh, Madam Dr. Gunendrika Kasturasna is joining in live to answer them. Apparently, there are no questions, Madam. Thank you very much. So, with that, uh, we will have a short tea break uh, of 15 minutes. So, so now it's 10 43. We hope to start the next session uh, around 11. So please be back by 11. Thank you. Welcome back to the workshop on stroke unit care for clinicians. The next session is on stroke rehabilitation, how to do it, a practical approach. To conduct this session, I would like to invite Dr. Harsha Gunasekara, consultant neurologist, to Javardhanapura General Hospital. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I think, uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear yeah. you. So, uh, so I'll be doing the presentation on uh, the practical approach to uh, stroke rehabilitation uh, on how to do it. Uh, so we have gone through uh, the first few talks, uh, giving you an idea of the burden of stroke and uh, uh, the stroke rehabilitation concepts and principles and also the disability assessment. So my, I will be going through the, uh, in the next few minutes, the, uh, a bit on evidence of, uh, on stroke disability and outcomes, then evidence on rehabilitation interventions, then what are the levels of care in stroke rehabilitation and uh, what are the key approaches to stroke rehabilitation and uh, how to do it in a practical setting. Uh, so, uh, so evidence is, uh, I'm sorry, I think uh, just, uh, yeah. Uh, the studies are quite limited in this area. So uh, as we know, the stroke is the most common cause of adult onset disability. Uh, and uh, 
70 to 85 percent of strokes, uh, first strokes are accompanied by hemiparesis, uh, motor impairment. So studies have shown that only about 60 percent of patients uh, with hemiparesis has achieved functional independence in simple activities of daily living at six months, uh, uh, with, even with inpatient rehabilitation. So, uh, to go to the next slide, now you can see here the uh, probability of achieving independence against the uh, degree of impairment uh, in this study. So, the Barthel score maximum is 100. So, your probability of achieving a near normal Barthel score or near normal independence in activities of daily living. Uh, it's about just over 60 to 70 percent if you have just a hemiparesis. But if you have added impairments, that is either if you have somatosensory impairments, hemianopias, or a combination of impairments, your probability of achieving uh, functional independence is much less, uh, as you can see. So, so, uh, so it's important how. Uh, effectively and intensively that rehabilitation should be carried out in these patients. Uh, so what evidence do we have uh, on interventions? Uh, again, for acute rehabilitation studies are limited, but we have uh, some studies done on long-term uh, chronic rehabilitation. So how long to do it and how, uh, how intensively to carry out rehabilitation still remains controversial. But according to the latest guidelines, but the recommendation is that stroke survivors should uh, receive rehabilitation at, at an intensity commensurate with the, with the anticipated benefit and tolerance. So we should always uh, measure it from a patient's uh, capability point of view. Uh, and also high dose, very early mobilization within the first 24 hours of stroke has shown to uh, reduce the odds of favorable outcome at three months and is not recommended. So here we have to decide uh, patients with uh, intracerebral hemorrhages or subarachnoid hemorrhages as opposed to ischemic stroke where the rehabilitation uh, acutely done uh, may have to be uh, planned well depending on the patient's uh, capability of undergoing uh, rehabilitation. So uh, in the Country, what we see is the, this gives you the annual health statistics over the last 10 years. What we see is a rising trend. Uh, I think uh, in your first talk, this uh, they have been discussed. There are more stroke admissions coming into hospitals now. Uh, as you see, uh, in 2010, it about 30,000 admissions. Now it's almost doubled. So patients are aware that stroke can be treated. Acute care is available uh, and uh, rehabilitation is available so patients uh, come uh, into hospitals uh, for treatment. Uh, but how well are we equipped? Now, this is an uh, issue at the moment. So we have about 60,000 stroke admissions uh, in 2019 uh, with 4,000 deaths. And uh, if you take the general neurologic beds in the country, total is about 382. Uh, and out of these, only 74 stroke so that's the total number of hospital beds uh, we have currently. So the facilities, the infrastructure is still uh, inadequate and uh, much need to be done to improve these, uh, uh, to provide these patients uh, with the optimum care. So that's what it shows on a map. Uh, now, acute care, of course, we are doing reasonably well because uh, we have uh, quite a good coverage of thrombolysis centers uh, all over the country. But if you take the stroke units, it's still uh, maldistributed. You can see now uh, Candy is covered, but uh, mostly the north central, northeast, east, and even the south and north are uh, not well covered. So what is the organized stroke care? So this has mainly three components. A dedicated stroke unit, which is a geographically defined area admitting exclusively stroke patients. And the second uh, uh, key component is a multi professional team approach, also called the multidisciplinary team or the interdisciplinary 
uh, team. And, and finally, a comprehensive stroke care pathway with a uh, diagnostic workup, sorry, uh, uh, and treatment combined with early mobilization and rehabilitation and also secondary approach. So, so when you provide stroke care, there, there are certain levels of stroke care uh, in rehabilitation that can be identified. So the most uh, important is the inpatient rehabilitation care, what we are discussing today, or the stroke unit care. In addition, uh, there is skilled nursing care, whereas the patient is more uh, dependent and uh, ill, and the primary focus of care is mainly the skilled nursing. Uh, in these patients, they will be best managed in a skilled nursing facility. In addition, we have the outpatient uh, care pathways, the early supported discharge services will be going through this. Then chronic outpatient rehabilitation and also uh, community-based rehabilitation. So what are the key approaches to stroke rehabilitation? So the three main components are uh, restoration, compensation, and modification. So the patient has a, a brain injury and as a result, there is impaired functions. So the first thing you can do is retraining of the central nervous system to engage in the impaired function if the patient's uh, capable of this. If in failing which you can go for compensation. Here, you do adaptation through use of devices or specific behaviors to perform the lost or impaired function. And in failing this, we'll go for modification. So alteration of patient's environment to promote functions and the activities of daily living. So if you take the stepwise approach, the practical approach, how we can do it is given here in these five steps. So first thing is that you need to have your established organized stroke care setting. The second step is uh, to do the assessment of the rehabilitation needs of the patient, uh, which uh, Dr. Gunendrika also discussed uh, in her talk. Then do interventions based on the rehabilitation goals and evaluate the patient's progress and discharge with transition of care. So the discharge doesn't end patient's care there. So there's a continuum of care in these patients. So establishing an organized stroke care setting. Uh, so first thing is important is that uh, the general infrastructure. Some of you may be working in stroke units, so you know this setup. Uh, so stroke units or in our uh, practical setting, uh, where space for stroke units is quite limited in uh, state sector hospitals, we may have to allow dedicated stroke bed beds in our uh, own neurology units. So if you, the rough gauge for this is, if you have one bed per, uh, uh, sorry, eight beds per hundred stroke admissions uh, is the uh, usual requirement according to the international standards. And at least 50% of your beds should be uh, acute monitoring beds because uh, most of the units uh, will be taking in acute stroke patients for acute care. Then diagnostic and therapeutic infrastructure is beyond the scope of my talk, but there will be a lot of guidelines for this. Uh, what I have used here is the uh, European Stroke Organization guidelines, uh, which the reference is here. So they give the, all the in detail uh, infrastructure recommendations for you to have a, uh, a stroke unit. Then the multidisciplinary care requirements. So a multi-professional team must provide continuous daily services as needed uh, and tailored to the specific needs of the individual patients uh, seven days a week. And we must always ensure that these, uh, these team uh, members should be trained uh, and uh, given the training uh, on uh, managing stroke patients. So the composition of the multidisciplinary team, I think most of you are aware. So these are the specialties or the disciplines, the neurologist, whether it's a neurologist or a stroke physician, or a physician general physician or, and the medical officer. So that's the 
sort of the core group here. So their duties are coordinating the rehabilitation team, then manage stroke and medical comorbidities. Then they should conduct, uh, lead and conduct at least two senior level medical ward rounds per week and a weekly case count. So these are according to the uh, international guidelines. And the card positions also have uh, listed here, but this can be changed according to our uh, availability of staff. And the other uh, members are the nursing officers, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, social workers, uh, psychologists, and also nutritionists uh, should get added to this. Uh, so I would not go through the details uh, of uh, this because uh, I think in the next two talks, we'll be discussing uh, this in more detail. So it's important that you have your team of uh, multi-professional uh, members uh, and the card depends on, on the bed strength. So the rough guide is given here according to the international guidelines. Uh, so uh, it all depends on the availability of staff in your own uh, center. So what are the criteria to admit a patient uh, to stroke unit? Now this has been again, uh, currently being developed by the Ministry of Health. Uh, to have a, a national stroke policy. So all acute admissions to a stroke unit should be arranged through the uh, emergency, uh, either a &E or the ET or the hospital. So that's for acute stroke. Then post-acute patients can be accepted for admission to a stroke unit upon a formal written referral by the consultant of the respective unit. So these patients may be mostly for uh, post-acute care and rehabilitation. Uh, the, the important thing here is the patient admitted for rehabilitation should show a capacity for significant functional improvement uh, expected to be achieved within a reasonable time period. So here you have to sort of decide whether these patients are going to benefit or is this patient is mostly for skilled nursing care, uh, which would be the, not the best uh, outcome the patient will have uh, through rehabilitation. So we come to the next point, the rehabilitation assessment. So here the timing as early as possible is the best depending on the patient's medical stability. So at least within 24 to 48 hours. So here the doctors, the medical officers should ensure that timely written referrals are done to the relevant MDT members uh, and uh, the nurses uh, in the unit should coordinate uh, the referrals with the MDT team members. So it's very important that referrals are written and also uh, the team has been informed and uh, made sure that the uh, rehabilitation process has started. Uh, so the assessments mainly focus on the extent and the severity of the disability, which we usually use the modified ranking scale. Uh, then extent of the limitation of activities of daily living uh, is the uh, Barthel index, which Dr. Gunendrika discussed in the previous talk, and also identification and prevention of post-stroke complications. So here, use of screening tools, which were listed uh, earlier, is recommended. And I think uh, we will have a special talk in the next uh, hour for, on the uh, post-stroke complications. So these are just the general list we need to go through. Uh, dysphagia assessment skin breakdown, blood and bowel function, uh, deep pain thrombosis, uh, risk and uh, nutritional deficiencies, depression and also cognitive impairment. So assessment of these and having a, a baseline idea of patient's functional state will be very important before you start the rehabilitation process. The next important thing is setting of rehabilitation goals and intervention. So we need to know what Achievements are we are going to anticipate in these patients. So goal setting or goal planning is a cornerstone of effective stroke rehabilitation. And the goal setting should be patient-centered and done by the MDT at the initial case conference. So the benefit we expect from this is improve the patient's outcome, enhances the patient's autonomy, and also it helps to evaluate the outcomes. 
So what are the characteristics of uh, the rehabilitation goals? So this is given by this mnemonic uh, SMART. So they should be specific goals. They should be measurable, achievable rather than challenges. So uh, better to have uh, more uh, sort of practical goals rather than having patient's own perspectives, which may be difficult to achieve at the beginning. So they should be realistic rather than hopeful and also time long. So best is to initiate with short-term goals or uh, what you call a lower order tasks. We'll go through some examples uh, and then go to the lo long-term and the higher order tasks. So this, the patient's preference may not be always the same, but we need to motivate these patients uh, explaining uh, the practicality of this. So if you take a few examples now, in, if, uh, here I have given some goal themes, the specific go goals and the MDT responsibility. So improving mobility. So initial goal would be for you to get the patient to uh, walk with, without support. Uh, so, uh, so here the physiotherapist uh, will be uh, the main uh, person responsible. Then improving hand functions, increasing the use of the left hand or improve skill in using the right hand. So that will be with the occupation therapist. Then with the patient with communication problems, improving speech, improving functional communication, and then he, he learn strategies to assist with word finding. So, uh, so these are a few examples that we can set in patients uh, with the disabilities. So depending on the patient's physical uh, functional status, the uh, the specific goals can be even uh, lower order than this or even higher order depending on the patient's condition. So again, starting with uh, lower order goals is very important and then uh, shifting into the higher order goals uh, is very uh, it's a practical approach to do uh, when managing these patients. So what should be the focus of rehabilitation interventions? So here, once we set the goals, we should plan our uh, interventions to achieve those specific goals. So there's a target that we need to achieve. Then very important that we identify barriers uh, to rehabilitation uh, and overcome them. So that's, that's an important thing we'll be discussing that. Otherwise, how much ever you will spend your time, the patient will not improve. Uh, and also very important that we evaluate uh, the progress and modify the goals if needed. So if the patient hasn't achieved, just you have to look for the reason and even we might have to change the goals, uh, modify our goals. So rehabilitation interest again, the duration and the intensity, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so the, it should be initiated as early as feasible uh, according to the patient's condition and uh, early mobilization is always recommended. The intensity should be commensurate with the anticipated benefit and tolerance. So uh, there are different recommendations on duration of therapy uh, from different uh, professional organizations. Uh, so some, the B British Association of uh, Stroke Patients guidelines say that 45 minutes of individual therapy done uh, seven days a week. Whereas in the American Stroke Association guidelines gives a combination uh, for all uh, modalities, three hours, which also inclu includes PNO, that is prosthetic and orthotics, uh, up to five days a week. So it depends on, it can change according to the availability of your card of staff. Uh, and uh, you can uh, sort of make sure that the patients get an optimum uh, uh, rehabilitation exposure. What are the barriers we come across uh, to effective rehabilitation? So uh, some of this has been discussed earlier. So pain is a very important factor that patient will uh, get uh, discouraged. So it's always important that you need to identify the underlying cause rather than uh, non-specific treatment with analgesics. So, Post-stroke shoulder pain is very common. Then pain secondary to spasticity. Uh, 
then complex regional pain syndromes in these patients and also patients might have other causes like uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, so these have to be addressed uh, in uh, those specific patients to get the optimum benefit from rehabilitation. Then depression and lack of patient motivation is very important. So post-stroke depression is common and uh, you need to address this in patients uh, and uh, uh, so psychological su support is very important in these patients and most of the uh, multidisciplinary team uh, has a psychological counselor and uh, this has to be addressed and treated in patients. Then social and economic factors can cause lack of motivation. So lack of family support, lack of financial support, all these have to be looked into. Uh, so social workers have a big part to play in this, uh, in this uh, area. Then the patient may have untreated medical comorbidities, uh, which can uh, affect their uh, rehabilitation. Uh, for example, cardiac and pulmonary disease is also important here that we uh, need to treat these uh, in these patients. So evaluating progress is one of the most important things. The fourth step here I have mentioned. Uh, so usually we have a weekly case conference for, uh, with the MDT team where we discuss the patient's progress. So we have to reevaluate the current care plan and the outcome. Then you have to review the goals you have set already, whether these need to be modif modified, whether we need to go uh, scale it up to higher order goals, or maybe even to scale it down if the patient is finding it uh, difficult. Then how to overcome barriers, what we discussed already. So we need to identify these barriers and overcome them. And then you have to also focus on patients discharge planning and follow up care. So although each member of the MDT makes a unique contribution, nurses are the primary professionals expected to communicate effectively with all involved and collaborate to achieve patients' individualized care. So the nurses have a major role here uh, in uh, uh, sort of coordinating the MDT uh, team care. So coming on to the last point, discharge and transition of care. So transition from hospital to home is a quite a challenging uh, to both patients and caregivers because the patients are disabled one thing and they are now having a lot of adaptations to their mobility and feeding and so on. So sudden discharge should not be done and it should be well planned. So discharge planning also should focus both the patient and the caregiver. So most patients in our setup will be managed by the home or the family or the extended family. As you know, uh, the inter intermediate care uh, settings are limited in our country. So most patients are discharged home uh, with family members being their carers. So a well-planned transition of care, identifying the interventions for long-term needs of the patient will reduce the hospital, length of hospitalization and the rate of readmission of these patients. So haste uh, decisions in discharging should be avoided. So what are the levels of transition? So th this depends again on the patient's uh, functional uh, status. So some patients may not need further rehab and they may be discharged to medical follow-up. So they also have had a full recovery. Then some patients may need outpatient rehabilitation, which could be arranged hospital-based, or may they could be referred to community-based rehabilitation or home rehabilitation. And some patients may need long-term rehabilitation. So uh, in uh, where there is availability of rehab hospital, and also some patients may be mainly for skilled nursing care. Uh, those who are uh, severely disabled needing uh, mostly nursing care. So what, what should be done at discharge plan? So these more like a checklist uh, I have given for you. So the so first thing is identify the long-term care. Needs. So all MDT members are responsible here. Uh, and then educate and train the care. So it's very important that we do this rather than just discharging, for example, patients on NG feeding. So the caregiver should be trained to 
do the feedings at home. So that is important that it's done well before that we plan discharge and so that the, uh, the caregiver can uh, continue this. Then advice on changes to be done in the home environment. So occupational therapists are mainly focused in this. Then advice on use of equipment, mobility aids, adaptive aids. So mainly the physiotherapy and occupational therapy uh, colleagues would be doing this. Then arranging further rehabilitation to be continued as outpatient. So again, depending on the patient's uh, functional status, the individual MDT members should make these arrangements. Then health education and secondary prevention and maintaining compliance to treatment and follow-up is very important. So here, I think, although I put it as a nursing officer, I think all of us should be responsible with the doctors. So make sure that the patient adheres to the secondary prevention plan. The patient should adhere to the health education given and the lifestyle modifications uh, and make sure that the patients uh, follow up. So particularly in a time uh, where we are more burdened with the COVID pandemic issues. So it's important that patients adhere to the uh, treatment. Uh, so that's uh, very important. And as we know, one in four uh, stroke patients all have a risk of uh, a recurrent stroke. So it's very important that these patients uh, adhere to the secondary prevention medications. Then we also need to give advice on driving and return to work. Uh, and uh, this again depends on the patient's functional status. Uh, and uh, also advice on the, what are the, uh, the, the benefits available for these patients. So there are state-sponsored benefits through the divisional secretaries. Uh, they can get the disability allowances. They can get funding for their equipment. Uh, they can get funding for their medications and self-employment grants, which are usually arranged through the advice of the social worker and through the uh, respective division of secretaries. So all that is very well uh, uh, given in uh, information that uh, the patients should be educated on this so that patients will be able to uh, get the maximum benefit before patients is discharged from hospital. So, uh, Probably that would be the last slide for me. Uh, so acute stroke, uh, it's the, the your cycle starts from the acute stroke assessment for rehabilitation. So we have to do our assessment as early as possible. Uh, so there is no, uh, so default is actually rehabilitation for all. And then from there we select, depending on the patient's functional status, uh, to uh, decide on what, degree of care the patients would need. So the patients who need, who has like a mild degrees of impairment could be referred for outpatient care, but usually most patients undergo rehabilitation as inpatient facility, or depending on the patient's condition, may, may have to continue their care in a skilled nursing facility uh, or a long-term care hospital. So continuous reassessment of the patient is very important and the patients will need re-entry to most appropriate rehabilitation option uh, or setting of facility. So it's a cycle. So we need to uh, make sure that the patient's uh, care doesn't end at our discharge so that the patient will have a continuation of care uh, and uh, so that the optimum uh, outcome should, could be arranged through uh, our rehabilitation. So these actually uh, from the guidelines uh, of uh, American. So I'll uh, stop then. Uh, welcome any questions. In the absence of questions, we will move on. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next session is on post-stroke complications and prognostication. To conduct this session, let me invite Dr. Champika Gunavardhana, consultant neurologist, teaching hospital, Ratnapur. Over to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, so it's a uh, post stroke, uh, the, it's a stroke rehabilitation workshop that which we have planned with collaboration of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association to 
improve the stroke care in the country. So it's a glad pleasure indeed to take part in this workshop for the second time with the uh, clinicians and medical official, uh, officers in Candy. So you all have already gone through the set of lectures, series of lectures on different aspects of uh, stroke rehabilitation. Now, as you have already learned, the stroke rehabilitation is a complex process. To achieve the expected outcome, we have a lot of barriers as Dr. Harsha mentioned in previous lecture. So one of the key important key feature for stroke rehabilitation barrier is post-stroke complications. So I'm going to talk about post-stroke complication, uh, complications and uh, the implications related to that during next half an hour or so. So post-stroke complications, what are these post-stroke complications? As you all know, the, any medical or neurological condition which necessitate physician's involvement or the um, require monitoring by a medical staff in a post-stroke patient or a stroke survivor, we call them post-stroke complications. Interestingly, they are very uh, subtle and heterogeneous in onset. We may not be able to detect them accurately uh, and early due to this phenomena, the heterogeneity and the subtle presentation of this complication. And they are transient, they come and go, and they can recur at different times during the uh, post-stroke period. And the post-stroke complications, there are a number of causes for these post-stroke complications. And if you take the evidence, the independent risk factors for post-stroke complications are old age and stroke severity. Now, why these post-stroke complications are so important and why we do we have to discuss it in a stroke rehabilitation workshop? If you look at the evidence, the prevalence rate around the world is very, very wide. It can from, uh, vary from 44% to 95% in these different population setups. Uh, and uh, it is one of the key challenge in post-stroke rehabilitation. And it is directly affect the uh, functional Im improvement. So it can delay if there are a number of for different post-stroke complications, it can delay the functional improvement of post-stroke rehabilitation. And it is associated with increased mortality and morbidity. There are a number of post-stroke complications according to, comes as a very uh, large term of um, umbrella. And under that, there are two different varieties. One is direct brain injury and the other set of complications are related to the impairments. One is related, some of them are related to the direct brain injury and others are related to the impairments associated with uh, stroke. Now, what are the uh, complications related to the brain injury directly due to the brain injury, hemorrhagic transformation, cerebral edema, and post-stroke seizures. They are usually early uh, or very early acute level complications. The rest of the complications are can occur at any point, but usually relatively late complications, the venous thromboembolism, infections, that is main urinary tract infections and aspiration pneumonia, spasticity and falls, another key segment, and uh, skin integrity, uh, and psychological complications like depression, post-stroke anxiety, and cognitive impairment. Now we'll first move on to early neurological deterioration, which are usually directly related to the brain damage, the brain insult itself, and they are seen in very early stage and uh, associated with very high mortality and direct neurological uh, insult, either hemorrhagic transformation of the infarction, seizure activity, cerebral edema, or it can be even dead subsequent to the brain herniation. There, there can be also some non-neurological, early neurological deterioration not related to the brain injury itself. Those are abnormal physiological parameters, especially hyponatremia and other common uh, 
metabolic complications. If you look at the early neurological deterioration, this may many of these factors are potentially reversible. And if you uh, if you detect them early, you may have you may be able to intervene and reverse them. So the most important thing is to continue appropriate monitoring during the acute phase of stroke and to identify the early identification of the neurological deterioration and timely intervention. So for that, most of the uh, guidelines and stroke post-stroke care recommendations are highlighting the need of high dependence unit care during the, um, for selected post-stroke patients during the acute phase. Now we'll move on to some other important post-stroke complications. Venous thromboembolism is one of the main uh, post-stroke complication, which is commonly associated with uh, mortality, high mortality. So different mechanisms are involved in the process of venous thrombosis. One is loss of muscle pump and blood state is in the stasis in the paralytic limb. As you all know, the, the due to lack of movement, the loss of muscle pump can give rise to stasis, stasis of blood in the paralytic limb. And prolonged immobilization is another important feature. And a patient also already has some thromboembolic, uh, prothrombotic condition to get a stroke. And that particular underlying cause itself can give rise to venous thromboembolism. So two common venous thromboembolism conditions are deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So signs and symptoms for pulmonary embolism, which is the most catastrophic uh, variety of venous thromboembolism, you all know what to look for. And it is important to have a high degree of clinical suspicion to identify venous thromboembolism, especially pulmonary embolism, when to suspect. And you may be, uh, you may be mistaken it for pneumonia, which is again another common uh, phenomena in post-stroke patients. And the other thing, pulmonary embolism can be subclinical and give rise to silent events and causing sudden death. You may not be able to detect them. So clinical suspicion is very, very important for early diagnosis and appropriate management. And uh, usage of prophylaxis anticoagulation for post-stroke patients remains controversial. Still, people do not recommend it for each and every universal post-stroke survivors. Uh, most of the guidelines do not recommend. Clinical decision, considering the benefits and the risk of bleeding, is important because some of the patients have large uh, uh, infarctions and usage of anticoagulation may give rise to uh, hemorrhagic transformation in these stroke patients. So it is a balance. You have to look at the benefits and the risk, assess it accurately, and decide which patient needs prophylaxis anticoagulation. And uh, instead of uh, prophylaxis anticoagulation, the other Modality is mechanical DVT prophylaxis, which is more popular among clinicians because it doesn't cause any bleeding uh, risks. But the commonly used graduated compression stockings are not beneficial according to the evidence. The only recommended thing is intermittent pneumatic compression, uh, uh, compression stockings, which are not available frequently. Right, we'll next move on to the another important post-stroke complication that is infection after stroke. The commonest two infections are the pneumonia and urinary tract infections. Uh, they are, there are certain risk factors for get these uh, infections. Most of the pneumo pneumonia, which is one of the commonest one is probably due to associated dysphagia 
or sometimes UTI can be due to associated incontinence. But other than that, there are um, possible immunological impairments due to stroke, and that also give rise to uh, um, increased risk to get infections after uh, after the stroke. And according to uh, the analysis, it had shown the old age and associated comorbidities, especially diabetes, is adding risk to get infections after stroke. The post-stroke infections are associated with very high uh, mortality and is key cause for poor outcome after a stroke. So pneumonia, if you look at the prevalence and incidence, it is quite high, 3 to 12% of post-stroke survivors get infection during the early stage of post-stroke period. Aspiration is the main risk. It is It could be secondary to the associated uh, dysphagia or swallowing difficulty, or it could be due to the different other mechanisms, the long-standing um, uh, the poor immobilization and uh, staying on the bed for a longer period. The conventional diagnosis based on clinical assessment, radiological imaging and microbiological analysis is indicated, but mostly you go by clinical diagnosis. And you have to start empirical antibiotics based on microbiological recommendation in the earliest stage. Otherwise, you may have making the condition worse and give rise, give rise to life-threatening complications. Urinary tract infections, again, the second commonest infection among stroke survivors, incidence is around three to 9%. Bladder dysfunction is one of the most important risk factor for these UTIs. Incontinence, usage of unnecessary usage of indwelling catheters are other added risk factors. Again, female sex, old age, severity of the stroke, and poor cognitive functions are also related to uh, the increased risk in stroke, um, the urinary tract after stroke. Clinical presentations, usually nonspecific and subtle, so you have to have a very high degree of clinical suspicion to make an early diagnosis and to intervene promptly. Post-stroke epilepsy, uh, seizures developing after a stroke is very, very common. It can happen in the very early stage and even at the very late stage after discharging patients, they may present after several years after a stroke with post-stroke epilepsy. Why do they get strokes? It is the acute stage. It is due to acute irritation of the brain, mainly due to uh, hemorrhages, either subarachnoid or intra um, intracerebral hemorrhages or hemorrhagic transformation of a large infarct. These are the risk factors to develop early stage seizures and later uh, stages. It is due to the scar in the brain. Now, you all know that any infarction give rise to permanent scar in the brain parenchyma. This permanent scar is an uh, irritative foci in the electric activity of the brain and can develop seizures at any point. So to identify them and clinical assessment is important. And after that, you have to start anti-epileptic medications, but there is no place for prophylaxis anti-epileptic due to any reason without getting uh, seizures. That is one of the common mistakes most of the uh, some of the clinicians do, they start uh, prophylaxis anti-epileptic treatment for in, uh, in, especially in ICHS, but that is not recommended. Post-stroke spasticity. This is one of the main disabling complication of post-stroke survivors. Incidence is very high. It can be around 17 to 40 three percent in one of the community-based study. We have conducted a small research on patients in uh, Ratnapura hospital. And according to that, 
there are about 21% of people develop post-stroke spasticity after six months assessment. So the risk factors we have identified the brain stem strokes, hemorrhagic strokes and younger age and high severity of stroke are directly related to the post-stroke spasticity. Now look at the impact of the post-stroke spasticity. There can be symptoms like discomfort, stiffness and painful spasms, which are very uh, unpleasant uh, symptoms and patients get really irritated and worried about. So spasticity can give rise to discomfort and painful spasms, and they can affect the functional problems like uh, mobility, transferring, activities of daily living and sexual activity that can affect to those things. And as a result of the disability related to spasticity and discomfort symptoms related to spasticity, they get emotional impact like low mood, low self-image and low motivation, and that will affect the uh, rehabilitation outcome. And they also can develop long-standing complications like muscle shortening and contractures. So there are huge impact of post-stroke spasticity on uh, patients with uh, stroke. So when should we treat post-stroke spasticity? It is not indicated for each and every patient unless they are symptomatic and affected to their rehabilitation process or functional outcome. Because sometimes people believe that spasticity may be beneficial in the early stage of improvement, especially lower limb tonicity, increased tone in the lower limb will, will uh, have a positive uh, effect on walking and some of the functions. Uh, so we do not want to treat each and every patient with post-stroke spasticity. We have to assess the benefit and the uh, negative impact on rehabilitation. So the management spasticity um, of the spasticity, the usual approach, you have to assess the severity of the spasticity. It can be very early, mild spasticity, or it can be disabling severe spasticity. Depending on that, you have to design your approach. The early mild spasticity, you can go for either physical therapy or uh, oral medications like baclofen. And if uh, the spasticity is more and involved in certain muscle groups, you can decide on focal treatment like Botox injection. If it is very severe and affecting the whole uh, in a large area, then you have to think of intrathecal baclofen, nofinol, or else surgical corrections. So the pressure source after a stroke is another common thing which we see in day-to-day -day clinical practice and is very common in uh, rehabilitation in hospital rehabilitation settings. This is a definitely an um, important area why it is a preventable thing. So we have to identify it as a the stroke patients are a risk group for stroke-related pressure source due to the immobility, the inability to uh, turn uh, by themselves and their age and associated diabetes and peripheral vascular disease, they all have associated risk for pressure source. So as a group, the post-stroke patients are quite vulnerable to get post uh, pressure source than uh, other uh, disabled groups. So prevention is more important. Positioning is the most important thing. Positioning and pressure care is very, very important. It is a very uh, cheap procedures. You have to just take it serious and act ac accurately. Post-stroke psychological conditions. Uh, it is again very common uh, because the people lose some uh, abilities that which they have had earlier suddenly and they become disabled within seconds within minutes 
so it is a huge psychological trauma and that will give rise to uh, acute psychological disturbances and sometimes uh, those acute psychological disturbances may change into long standing proper, proper psychological disorders like depression anxiety emotionalism or cognitive impairment now if you look at this incidence and prevalence it is very very high over 50% of patients develop post stroke depression at one point during their post stroke period and they are associated with high mortality and disabilities and develop poor quality of life and some sometimes they might impair the personal relationships as well so depression which is the commonest one will develop with the severity and functional disability and the key predictor is past history of depression in them Clinicians involved in care should be able to diagnose accurately the the post stroke psychological conditions in early stage, and they should uh, there has to be a uh, psychological specialist, either psychologist or a psychiatrist, in this multidisciplinary team to deal with post stroke rehabilitation process because. their assessment and early identification of post stroke complications post stroke psychological complications and early involvement is really beneficial and it will improve the rehabilitation outcomes uh, and uh, the since it is very common the depression even without depression some there are enough clinical evidence there are like one of the large clinical trial that giving fluoxetine will improve the rehabilitation outcome despite of the depression assessment so it is mainly due to even subclinical depression will reduce the motivation in uh, rehabilitation process so if you start fluoxetine or any other antidepressant without clear evidence of depression in post stroke patients there is clinically significant outcome improvement in rehabilitation so you can imagine the degree of psychological trauma in post stroke patients post stroke pain it is frequently affect the shoulders but other than that there's central post stroke pain and uh, post stroke shoulder pain they all are related to different type of uh, pain involvement due to the immobilization or it may be the sensory involvement of the thalamic region so it either neurological or disability related involvement and uh, there are some other specificity related pains and tension type headaches they all give rise to uh, poor poor outcome in rehabilitation there are certain other minor post stroke complications post stroke fatigue post stroke insomnia falls after stroke and many others so all these conditions are directly affecting the rehabilitation that is why it is important in uh, the post stroke rehabilitation programs and they increase the mobility morbidity mortality and quality of life and care burden so the identification of post stroke complications and appropriate treatment and interventions are key thing to minimize the negative impact of post stroke complications now if you look at the prognosis of stroke stroke is a second leading cause of death across the globe a number of uh, number one cause for adult disability more than 75% of patients with acute stroke will survive for one year and five year survival is over 50% uh predicting factors for poor prognosis and delayed rehabilitation the key thing is severity of neurological damage and other than that initial functional impairment presence of post stroke depressive disorders urinary incontinence will give rise to 
delayed rehabilitation. Other non neurological factors are age, socioeconomic background, family support, and previous personality type. They also affect the rehabilitation process. Positive impact on care, rehabilitation, and survival. Advancement of acute stroke care, development and rehabilitation uh, is impor important. And more importantly, the attitude, the, if we improve the correct attitude towards stroke rehabilitation, we can improve and give a positive impact on pos uh, stroke rehabilitation and improve the stroke survival. So thank you. And that is a basic overview of uh, uh, post-stroke complications and overall overview of fund management. It is a completely de um, not a complete detailed uh, management uh, plans. We have to go through each complication separately and do a different set of uh, comprehensive uh, study to develop the uh, proper management plans. But I have given you an over overview and you may be able to read differently. And if you're establishing a stroke unit or planning to conduct a stroke rehabilitation program, then you may need more detailed care plans for different stroke uh, complications. If you have any questions would like to answer, otherwise I will proceed with the next lecture. Uh, Please continue with the next lecture, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, this is actually we have to do with the, the second half of the uh, stroke rehabilitation workshop. Since for my convenience, I have selected, I have opted to do it continuously with the previous lecture. Now, this part we are mainly focusing the real stroke rehabilitation with the involvement of nurses, therapists, psychologists, and the multidisciplinary team. So I will give you an overview of stroke rehabilitation and multidisciplinary care. So what is stroke rehabilitation? Now already you all have already discussed. It's a process of helping a person to achieve the highest level of function, independence, and quality of life after a disability. It's a process of relearning skills uh, that which are suddenly lost after a damage in the brain. And uh, there are new ways. It's a process of learning new ways to compensate for any remaining disabilities. So this is the whole process of rehabilitation. Why stroke rehabilitation is important? As you all know, it is the main cause for long-term disability around the world, especially among the adult people. So about 70% are severely disabled even after three months of a stroke. So you can see the degree of disability involved in post-stroke people, post-stroke survivors. Definitely, we need to intervene and give a sort of rehabilitation process to overcome these disabilities. Who need stroke rehabilitation? Now, 10% of patients they get complete or near complete recovery spontaneously. However, even for them, if we start rehabilitation during early stage, we can make the uh, recovery faster. So even the people who get complete recovery uh, in early stage, still the intervention will improve their uh, recovery. And 10% do not get any benefit do not get benefit from rehab due to the severity of the disease. If the severity is very high, even if we give, uh, provide them a good rehabilitation support, there won't be any significant improvement. However, even for them, there will be some survival benefit even if we give them, uh, if we provide them rehabilitation, stroke rehabilitation care. So even the worst 10% and the best 10% also get some benefit. The remaining 80% will definitely get the significant benefit out of rehabilitation process. 
So in general, every stroke survivor is benefited from stroke rehabilitation. So it is, but unfortunately with the resources we have, we may not be able to provide the same degree of rehabilitation care for each and every patient. We may have to select and recruit suitable patients to stroke rehabilitation program due to unavailability of resources. But if you look at it, take it in general, everyone should get some benefit out of stroke rehabilitation. And before moving into stroke rehabilitation, uh, multidisciplinary care, how do we get recover from a stroke? There are two different parts of stroke re recovery. One is neurological recovery. The other one is functional recovery. Neurological recovery is involvement of neurological deficits. That is uh, recovering during the early spontaneous recovery or the recovering from the penumbral ischemic area, or it can be late recovery due to neuroplasticity. That is the neurological recovery. The improve, say like uh, upper limb power was grade four out of five, and now it has improved to four plus out of five. But it doesn't mean any functional um, indication. What is the ability that they have developed? That comes under functional recovery. Functional recovery is recovery in everyday function. It can be due to adaptation and training where we mainly focus in rehabilitation. Now, in that case, even they remaining in grade four in upper limb, but they were not may not be able to uh, comb their hair. Now they can comb their hair. So then it means that then there is no significant neurological recovery, but there is a functional recovery. So functional recovery is more important than neurological recovery. Return of motor power does not mean with functional recovery. Recovery in functional capacity is more important. So the other one is when to start stroke rehabilitation, stand the settings uh, often within 20, 48 hours we have to start stroke rehabilitation uh, once acute problems are stabilizers earlier the better actually uh, now in stroke the designated stroke units are there then we can start early rehabilitation and it will improve the functional outcome there's a new concept called very early mobilization very early mobilization means within 24 hours, if you take them out of bed. Um, uh, there's a controversy about the outcome. If you do very early mobilization within first 24 hours, they will improve the outcome. If you do short duration out of bed sessions, but if you do very uh, strenuous exercises during very early, mob very early mobilization and uh, high dose mobilization in early stage, it may be associated with prolonged, uh, may be associated with unfavorable outcome. So you have to be a little careful when you consider very early mobilization, but definitely within 48 hours, you can start mobilization and physiotherapy. So what is the best setting for a stroke rehabilitation is another important thing. Now most tense, intensive uh, rehabilitation is three hours per day, five to six hours per week, Five, sorry, five to six days per week, up to three weeks. This has to be done in an institute. So we need institutional type rehabilitation for this type of patients. There's a subacute rehabilitation, which we can do conducted by a skilled nursing facilities in a nursing home or else at home with intermittent supervision. So the, the community rehabilitation, home-based rehabilitation with a support of outpatient care is the level three uh, rehabilitation setting. Now stroke unit versus general medical wards. If you look at the one of the landmark research came out in early nineties, late nineties, which make a huge difference in stroke care around the world. And they gave, uh, clear evidence that people or patients who managed in a stroke unit has shown significant improvement of uh, survival and functional outcome than a patient managed in a general medical ward. So this is the concept, this is the concept where which uh, make a huge change 
among stroke care. So that was in 1990s, uh, 1999, 98 area. Now still we are finding it difficult to develop adequate stroke care units around in our country. But if you look at the other countries, most of the developed countries, they have different designated stroke units, which is evidence-based and scientific. Stroke disabilities, I'm not going to discuss it here. And principles of stroke rehabilitation, it's already discussed. Now, multidisciplinary care. If you look at it as a concept, any uh, complex process, if we have to conduct a complex, complicated process, we need an involvement of different people. So there has to be a good collaboration and coordination among the team involved. This, size, this type of mechanism is called multidisciplinary care, where different people get involved with a very good collaboration and coordination among each member. So this will definitely make a success in the outcome. Now, the key, key factors in a multidisciplinary approach is the communication and coordination. Now, communication is habit of constant discussion about the patient and continuous information exchange during the management process. That is very, very important uh, to continue this type of communication among uh, different professionals involved. That is why it is important to have a multidisciplinary approach where you conduct regular meetings, and where you meet together and discuss about one person and his complex disability and complex approach. And coordination is the other important factor in multidisciplinary approach. One is communication, the other one is coordination. Where you facilitate the efficient group work, usually based on a structured systematic plan towards one specific goal. So this coordination and communication is important. Those are the key thing about multidisciplinary team. Formation of a team and function with the coordination and with good communication. Mechanism of organizing and coordinating healthcare services is the multidisciplinary team to meet the needs of an individual with complex care needs. So where we bring together the expertise and skills of different professionals, to assess, plan, and manage care together jointly. Why it is important to have a multidisciplinary care for strokes, different complex uh, disabilities and care needs in stroke. You have already listened to the stroke disabilities. They are different and related uh, stroke related complications are different and they are complex. So you have a patient with complex different disabilities and care needs. So you definitely need the involvement of different professionals. And this team should be involved in a, a larger than other conditions. Now, uh, the other multidisciplinary approach is predominantly we see among cancer patients, where again, they need involvement of different specialties, different people, and sometimes in psychiatric patients, where again, you need involvement of different professionals, like in stroke, you need a lot of people to involve to provide the care for a single patient. So you need coordination and effective collaboration among them. So the uh, team members perform activities to the common goal and it will add responsibility for the group effort on behalf of the patient. It is not a uh, single responsibility for a single person. It is a common responsibility, shared care. And team, as you all know, the multidisciplinary team is rehab physician, nurse, uh, the dedicated stroke nurse, physiotherapist. They are predominantly uh, target the rest of physical functions, movement, balance, and coordination. Occupational therapists, uh, they focus on motor, sensory, and cognitive impairments and activities of daily living. Speech and language therapists, language and communication skill and solving uh, functions, psychologists, 
psychiatric, psychological, emotional, and cognitive issues, social work, socioeconomic issues, and especially discharge plan in our, the, especially in our setups, dietitians, nutritionists, they will look after the nutritional issues and alternative feeding methods and etc. So there are many other people who involved in different stages of rehabilitation in different people, different patients. So it is evidence-based and had shown enough clinical evidence to uh, support the benefits of multidisciplinary care. They improve the health outcomes and enhance the satisfaction of clients. The client actually in rehabilitation process, we do not call them actually as patients. We call them as clients because we provide a service and they are the service they are the receivers of this service. So we, they are clients rather than patients. <coughs> so client satisfaction is another important thing and it will definitely provide a more efficient usage of resources. And finally, it will enhance the job satisfaction of the team members. So um, the, the positive outcomes are very high if you use a multidisciplinary care approach in this side, this type of rehabilitation setting. So finally, what is important is to change our attitudes. Main thing, stroke is preventable. You know how to prevent them. And it is treatable. You know thrombolysis, thrombectomy, and many other advanced therapeutic options are available to treat strokes. And more importantly, they are rehabilitable. Out of all these preventive and uh, therapeutic interventions, still a huge number of patients are disabled after all these advanced um, therapeutic interventions. So they need uh, a process to improve their disabilities, improve their functional capacity and to improve their quality of life, that is rehabilitation. So it is a rehabilitable condition and you can achieve a very satisfactory uh, degree of functional outcome at the end of rehabilitation process. So teamwork is key to success and we have to plan together, work together and achieve a common goal together. That is the key thing in rehabilitation and multidisciplinary care approach. So thank you once again. And if you have any other question, I would like to answer or else we can, I think, wind up the first half of the uh, workshop. In the absence of questions, we will move on. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The next session is on nursing for stroke. Uh, to conduct this session, I would like to invite Mrs. D. Tushari Anuruddhika, Nursing Officer, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Colombo. Please remain uh, say, uh, until Mrs. D. Tushari Anuruddhika joins the program since we are running a little earlier than the schedule. Thank you for your patience. all of you. Firstly, I would say thanks to SLME offering me this opportunity. I am going to discuss the nursing care for stroke. As a multidisciplinary team member in the stroke rehabilitation team, nurses play a vital role for patients recovery. According to the International Council of Nurses, whatever the function of nurse does falls into four fundamental responsibilities. They are promotion of health, prevention of illness, restoration of health, and alleviation of suffering. Within the next 30 minutes, we will discuss 
the delivery of safe, competent and ethical care for stroke patients. Care is always individualized. It differs from patient to patient. Therefore, at the onset of a stroke or on the admission of a stroke patient, nurse has to assess the patient's cognitive and physical functional level, including patient's background. It means the education level. It means the education level, the occupation, socioeconomic level, and the habits as well. Here, I'll discuss the nursing care under two main aspects, physical care and psychological or emotional care. I will discuss physical care under several topics. They are preparation of the patient's environment, monitoring the patient, maintenance of skin integrity, and positioning maintaining nutrition and fluid balance, bladder and bowel continence, measures to prevent complications, and how we can support for rehabilitation. As the first part of the physical care, preparation of the patient's environment is a very important part for, as a function of a stroke stroke nursing because patient is with sensory and motor deficits or sensory and motor losses. Environment affects for prevent various hazards for the patient and the other hand, it enhances the sensory motor stimulations. A stroke unit or the stroke patient's environment should be with minimal environmental hazards for the patient, such as low noise levels without harsh sounds, sufficient lighting and ventilation, and it should be with minimal objects and without bad odors, keeping a dry and clean floor without insects is a must when you maintain a stroke unit. And we can keep a wall clock or and the day calendar uh, for patient's vision and wall hangers also. Patient's unit should be consisted with a bed with railings or with an adjustable bed, at least to elevate head then. A locker, a bedside cupboard, bed table and an armchair. We have to maintain at least three to 3.5 feet, uh, approximately one meter distance in between two beds. And easy access to the bathroom should be there. We have to keep sucker machine, oxygen and multi-monitor as other equipment in the stroke care unit. And the next physical care aspect is monitoring the patient. The nurse has to assess the ARV patency when necessary, suck out of secretions, administer oxygen, insert an ARV may have to be done. And nurse has to observe temperature, blood pressure, pulse rate, saturation of oxygen, pupils and capillary blood sugar levels also. Glass glaucoma scale helps the nurse to know the conscious level. And we have to monitor not only that, intake and output, bladder and bowel functions, pressure ulcers also. While monitoring, while monitoring, if patient patient's deterioration found, we have to inform the medical officer and take timely actions uh, for the needs. 
maintenance of personal hygiene is the other physical care aspect. For this, the level of nursing care is decided on the patient's ability to self-care. If patient does not have sufficient energy, physical ability or deteriorated conscious level, we have to perform patient's oral care, bed bath and maintaining skin integrity. And we have to give perineal care, hair care, nail care and every care. So here we have to maintain oral hygiene uh, is a very important part because uh, if the patient is on an NG tube, if we are uh, accessing the nutrition to the patient through a nasogastric tube, uh, we have to give three times mouth care per day. If patient has some abilities, we have to assist to perform self-care. Prevention of pressure ulcers is the other physical care aspect. For this, we have to maintain clean and dry bed linen without creases. Patient's clothing should check for buttons and pins. Cleaning and drying the skin and massaging the pressure points is very important. We can use pressure relieving devices and we can turn position once in two hours. Helps to prevent pressure ulcers. When the patient moves, it shouldn't apply shearing forces or frictions because patient is having sensory and motor loss. We can use a standard position changing chart to maintain correct position for the correct time. These are some common sites of uh, pressure ulcers, arising pressure ulcers, back of the head, shoulder, elbow, buttocks, heel, ear, hip, thigh, leg, rib cage, knees, and toes. Positioning is the other physical care aspect. Now still we are discussing the physical care aspect. And two hourly major position changing and at any time minor position changing of head, arm and legs can be done. We can keep the stroke patient in side lying position on affected and unaffected side, lying on back and sitting up positions. These figures show uh, those positions, lying on unaffected side, lying on affected side, lying on patient's back or sitting up. The next physical care aspect is maintenance of nutrition and fluid balance. Here we have to assess the patient's nutritional status, especially on admission through physical appearance and through baseline blood investigations such as full blood count, sodium and potassium levels as serum electrolytes, serum protein levels, serum cholesterol levels, etc. Nurses assess the ability of saloing before giving anything orally. If patient is able to take orally, it's no problem. We can maintain nutrition with under close care. If unable to take orally, NG tube is to be inserted. Insertion of NG tube must be done by a skillful nurse by preventing nasal and esophageal uh, mucosal trauma. And positioning the patient in sitting up, positioning the patient in uh, sitting up position at least 30 minutes, 30 degrees or more, you have to elevate from the head side. And correct measurement of the NG tube should be done before insertion. 
fastening the tube to the nostril should done with care to apply minimal pressure on nostrils. Checking the placement of tube and retained contents are very important. We can give 300 to 350 milliliters per meal and six meals per day for a patient to fulfill nutrition and fluid requirement per day. The dietitian uh, fulfill nutrition and fluid requirements. The dietitian will help to decide variety of food items to deliver nutrition to the patient. And re-screening of nutrition status should be maintained for nutrition monitoring. There are some few images which shows NG tube placement and precautions. The first one shows the how to keep the patient in powerless position and uh, measurements for NG tube insertion and checking retained feeds. Next physical care aspect is bladder and bowel continence. Maintenance, bladder and bowel continence is the next uh, important physical care because uh, we have to care for the patient to avoid constipation. For that, we can provide high fiber intake diet with adequate fluid intake about two to three liters per day. The history of patient's bowel habits helps to establish regular time for toileting. And uh, we have to keep nurses' notes regarding patient's bowel, uh, bowel opening. And we can insert suppositories. We can use stool softeners. And we can use any mask if patient continuously uh, having constipation. Regarding urinary continence, initially we have to assess the ability of passing urine. On admission, we have to do this. If patient is having urinary incontinence or retention, we have to insert the urinary catheter. It is important to remove it as soon as possible. Use of inappropriate size and insertion under highly aseptic techniques is a must. And providing adequate fluid intake, securing the catheter to the patient's thigh, maintenance of intake and output chart, as well as temperature chart, includes in urinary care. Up to now, I have discussed the physical aspect of nursing care for strokes. Now, I'm going to discuss with you the emotional and psychological aspect of the stroke care. Understanding the emotional instability of the patient as nurses is a must when we give close care to patient. And we have to take measures to relieve pains and worries and psychological disturbances. Then it helps to reduce patient's anxiety and depression. We can keep a care or bystander with the patient whom he or she preferred. And we have to encourage the patient regarding day by day gainings of physical and sensory gainings of patient, admiring the patient about his daily gains. It is important in uh, enhancing psychological care of the patient. As nurses, when we uh, do care for uh, stroke unit, we have to understand, we have to have good understanding of the neurological basis of stroke. And we have to improve skills in appropriate communication with patient and the family members. And we have to know how well the patient perceive and respond to the environmental stimuli. Nurse has to have the ability to understand verbal and nonverbal responses of the patient 
and evaluate the response. Nurses should have skills in documentation of care. And when we support for rehabilitation as a multidisciplinary team member, it starts from the admission of the patient onwards. And we have to coordinate care between the multidisciplinary team members. We have to educate the patient and the family and encouraging the patient and carer to continue the prescribed exercises is very essential. Not only that, we have to give continuous psychological support. When we prepare the patient for home care, we have to prepare not only the patient, the family members also. We have to offer their uh, skill training uh, for, for a close family member, one or two family members. And we have to explain about the patient's emotional status and psychological support. Health advice on continuing medications and its importance. And what are the safety measures when you are taking correct medication doses and giving information about follow-up care and rehabilitation. So uh, I'm going to wind up my session. Uh, do you have any queries? Are there any questions regarding nursing care for strokes? Thank you very much, Ms. Tushari. Apparently, there are no questions. Thank, okay, you, thank you for you your lecture. You. So with that, we will break for lunch. We will start the next session at 1.30. Thank you. Welcome back. To conduct the next session on physiotherapy for stroke, I would like to invite Dr. Nadisha Kalyani, lecturer in physiotherapy, Department of Allied Health Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalam. Good morning, everyone. The topic of my presentation is physiotherapy for stroke. I'm Dr. Nadisha Kalyani, a lecturer attached to the Department of Allied Health Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. What is a stroke? As you may already know, it is a rapidly developed clinical sign of a focal disturbance of cerebral function of presumed vascular origin. And the commonest presentation of, of a stroke is hemiplegia, which is defined as the loss of voluntary movement with alteration of muscle tone and sensation throughout one side of the body due to a damage or a lesion to the opposite side of the brain or upper side of the spinal cord. Under clinical man manifestation, there are, num there are a number of clinical signs uh, uh, presented in stroke patients, uh, which are sensory and motor symptoms, spasticity, synergy, reflexes, associated reactions, impaired higher cerebral function, speech and language disorders, dysphagia, bladder and bowel impairment, and sexual dysfunction. As physiotherapists, we carry out a comprehensive assessment for stroke patients. This starts with a subjective assessment. Under personal information, we get the name of the patient, age, sex, address, occupation, marital status, position in the family, etc. And also the history of present complaints, present complaints, 
past medical surgical history such as hypertension seizures cholesterol whether the patient is on any drugs and then medical investigations such as ct or mri in the brain echo and then the uh, medical and surgical diagnosis under objective assessment we start with the observation we observe the skin color skin texture build of the patient scar tissues muscle wasting fasciculation the general attitude and the posture this is the typical typical hemiplegic posture as you have already seen and uh, as physiotherapists this is very important for us the observation of the posture so uh, according to the regions of the body we assess the posture uh, of the patient and usually the head uh, the head and trunk the head is flexed to affected side and rotated to the opposite side trunk is elongated to unaffected side and in the upper limb the shoulder girdle is retracted and depressed the shoulder is adducted and medial rotated the elbow is flexed the wrist is flexed the hand thumb adducted and flexed fingers flexed and curved and in the lower limb the pelvic girdle is retracted the hip is extended and lateral rotated knee is extended ankle plantar flexed and curved and the foot is curved the gait analysis is also important as physiotherapists um so in a patient uh, with hemiplegia uh, in the ankle joint the early stance phase the heel strike is missing this is due to the pronounced inversion due to the pronounced inversion the weight comes on the lateral aspect of the foot and in the mid stance there's no dorsiflexion the forward shift of the body weight is prevented due to this in the late stance phase the knee does not flex due to lack of dorsiflexion and in the knee joint the initial knee flexion does not occur knee remains in hyperextension and in the late stance phase no knee flexion is presented the affected leg move forward by compensatory mechanism in the hip joint in the stance phase in the early and mid stance phases the affected leg is placed very close to the normal limb and sometimes cross it due to high adduction in the late stance phase the hip adduction is prominent and during the swing phase the limb moves forward in a very slow manner hip and knee flexion is absent there is plantar flexion of ankle and retraction of the pelvis and again on objective assessment we palpate the patient we assess the warm up tenderness edema and muscle tone there are a number of tests that we use to assess different aspects including the motor examination muscle tone sensory examination reflex testing balance coordination assessment of cranial nerves level of consciousness higher cerebral functions respiratory system grip strength pain and independence of self care on the motor examination we assess the tone the muscle tone uh, this is tested by uh, fast passive movement to determine the distribution of the spasticity and mainly the modified usher scale is used to measure the muscle tone the spasticity and under muscle testing the voluntary control of testing is used which is grade which is graded from grade 0 uh, to grade 6 the grade 0 is no contraction or flicker of contraction and the grade 6 is full range of motion 
in isolation against resistance. Under sensory examination, the superficial sensation is assessed, the fine touch and pain, and under deep sensation, the vibration and crude touch, under cortical sensation, the two-point discrimination, stereognosis, and proprioception. This is tested bilaterally on, uh, in the upper limbs and lower limbs. Under reflex testing, the deep tendon jerks are tested, the biceps reflex, brachioradialis reflex, ex extensor digitorum reflex, triceps reflex, knee jerk and ankle reflex. Under superficial tendon jerks, the Babinski reflex and the abdominal reflex tested. Moving on to the balance assessment, which is very important. The main uh, areas which I assess are the sitting and standing balance, especially the static sitting balance and dynamic sitting balance, and then static standing balance and dynamic standing balance. The Berg balance scale is mainly used in assessing balance. And uh, these are the uh, aspects which are tested, such as sitting to standing, sitting unsupported, standing unsupported, standing to sitting, transferring, etc. Under coordination, the finger nose test is used and heel knee test is used uh, to measure different aspects of coordination. Then uh, the cranial nerves are assessed and the level of consciousness can be assessed using the GCS. Under higher cerebral function, the memory, cognition, speech and hearing, the fine movements are tested. Measuring the respiratory function is also important. We measure the chest expansion. So the measurements are taken at three points at the level of axilla, siphoid process, and the 10th costal cartilage. These measurements are taken at resting, expiration, inspiration, and then we can measure the chest expansion. Also, the status of the uh, chest is uh, assessed using the vibration and percussion methods. The grip strength is also measured. Uh, and there are different type of uh, grips that are tested in stroke patients. The wrist control, hook grasp, lateral grasp, cylindrical grasp, index thumb, spherical grasp. So there are different type of grasps, grasps uh, uh, tested in these patients. The pain is also assessed using the numerical pain scale. And then the independence of self-care using the Barthel index, which is a widely uh, used scale for uh, stroke patients with excellent validity and reliability. And then the functional independence measure which is also widely used for stroke patients. Moving on to the uh, physiotherapy management of uh, stroke patients. First, the acute stage. These are the uh, main aims uh, during the acute stage, positioning, preventing pressure sores, improve respiratory and circulatory function, and prevent from deconditioning. The position, position of the bed in the uh, room or the ward setup is very important. Uh, all these stimulus are brought from the affected side of the patient in order to encourage the patient using the affected side. And then the positioning is very important. And this is how the patient is positioned 
firstly on the affected side and then on the non-affected side. And this is how the patient is positioned in supine. Here, the adequate support is provided using pillows to the affected upper limb, trunk, and lower limb. Improving respiratory and circulatory function is vital. For this, breathing exercises are performed, chest expansion exercises, huffing, and coughing techniques are performed, as well as passive and active ankle and toe exercises. To prevent from deconditioning, early immobilization is Mobilization in bed is done. Early propped up positioning, sitting, and then later to standing. Moving around the bed and facilitate movement of functioning of the limbs. So these are um, some of the uh, exercises performed to mobilize the trunk and the arm. In the first picture, you can see how the elongation of the trunk is performed using passive stretching techniques. And then the second picture, the elevation of the arm is performed. <coughs> and the affected leg is also mobilized, the hip and knee flexion over the side of the bed. This is mostly done passively by the physiotherapist. Moving on to the post-acute stage, Generally, uh, the recovery of function is fastest up to three months following the onset of a stroke uh, with, uh, with a significant recovery occurring up to six months, while some patients continue to recover function up to one year. Therefore, uh, physiotherapists treat uh, stroke patients for varying lengths of time. And during the post-acute stage, uh, Usually, the uh, five days a week for a minimum of, minimum of three hours of active rehabilitation per day is recommended. So these are the aims during, the, uh, during this phase. Improve movement control, gait training, improve sensory function, improve balance, improve strength, and manage spasticity. <clears throat> Improving the movement control two uh, type of techniques are used, the neurophysiological techniques and motor relearning techniques. These neurophysiological techniques, usually the physiotherapist uh, support uh, the correct patterns acting as the decision maker for movements. So the patient is relatively a passive re recipient. Uh, so this can be passive or active assisted. <clears throat> the motor relearning techniques mostly use active patient involvement with the intention to perform the task, practicing and having feedback. Under neurophysiological techniques, the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques are very important, which we call the PNF techniques. These are based on diagonal patterns of movement and uh, we apply a variety of stimuli such as visual, auditory, or proprioceptive uh, stimuli to achieve normalized movements. These are the movements for the upper extremity, the upper extremity PNF patterns. These are mostly done uh, passively or active assisted movements, but this can be done as active movement, movements as well. Uh, so, we, so there are four types, D1, D2, D, and D1 flexion, D2 flexion, D2, D1 extension, and D2 extension. Moving on to the upper extremity PNF patterns, again, four types, D1 and D2 flexion, uh, D1 and D2 extension. So all these are diagonal movement patterns. Here, the 
physiotherapist commands the patient so the patient can think about the movement happening so it facilitate the re-education of the movement patterns the motor relearning techniques are performed in lying sitting and standing so these are some of the activities in lying rolling on the affected side rolling on the non-affected non side and then again bridging with rotation of the pelvis and bridging on affected side then the activities in sitting the self-assisted arm, arm movements are performed using the non-affected upper extremity There are a number of activities in standing. So this is one of these activities, which is stepping. Uh, how, so this is how the physiotherapy, physiotherapist assists in stepping uh, for this stroke patient. Then again, apart from these traditional methods, uh, the repetitive task training is also commonly used nowadays. This is the active practice of task specific motor activities focusing on improving function of the hemiplegic arm or the leg through repeated activity practicing. So the, some of the activities are repeatedly practiced. And again, the constraint induced movement therapy. This is inducing the patient to use the more impaired upper extremity for many hours of the day. This involves restricting the contralateral arm in a sling and training the affected arm. Gait training plays a vital role in this rehabilitation process. So the physiotherapist uses different walking aids and orthotics in order to facilitate this gait training. Apart from the above uh, methods, uh, in order to improve the sensory, the sensory function, the presentation of repeated sensory stimuli, and then stretching, stroking, superficial and deep pressure, an application of icing and vibration is used. In order to improve the balance, facilitating the symmetrical weight bearing, postural perturbations, reaching activities, and dual task training is performed. In order to improve the strength, strengthening agonist and antagonist muscles, graded exercises, using free weights, sandbags and isokinetic devices are used. And managing spasticity is also very important Sustained stretch and slow icing of spastic muscle is used. Rhythmic rotations and slow rocking movements. Positioning in anti-synergistic patterns are used. Finally, the role of the physiotherapy in uh, stroke rehabilitation is very important uh, as a as uh, part of the healthcare team the physiotherapist plays a vital role in the recovery of uh, physical function of the stroke survivors so uh, in fact the early mobilization functional training by the physiotherapist is considered most important especially in the acute care and uh, since uh, the recovery may continue for many years after stroke the long term the long term care is also vital not only uh, the patient but also uh, the large proportion of physiotherapist time is spent in educating advising and uh, training the relatives and other carers therefore i would say the um, physiotherapist plays a vital role in the multidisciplinary team in management of stroke patients Thank you.
Thank you, Madam. To conduct the live demonstration on physiotherapy for stroke, I would like to invite Mr. W. N. I. Kularatna, Physiotherapist, National Hospital, Kent. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Indunil Kularatna, Physiotherapist in National Hospital, Kandy. Uh, here with me is my colleague, uh, Mr. Sandha Kalum. He will be helping me with these demonstrations. Uh, so, the previous previous presentation uh, was on uh, introduction to the uh, physiotherapy after a stroke. So I'll demonstrate basic and most uh, prescribed physiotherapy techniques after a stroke. Uh, and the most common impairment we see after a stroke is either hemiplegia or hemiparesis. Uh, so we will demonstrate techniques, physiotherapeutic techniques to manage uh, the hemiplegic or hemiparesis patient. Uh, so uh, initially, uh, I will begin with the positioning techniques. Uh, positioning techniques are important in uh, acute care. Uh, the aims of the positioning of a hemiplegic or hemiparesis patient includes promote uh, optimal recovery by modulating muscle tone and uh, to give more increase the spatial awareness to give more appropriate sensory information and to avoid complications like uh, pain, pressure sources, contractures, and respiratory issues. So first of all, uh, the, uh, when we are talking about the positioning, three position main use, the uh, physiotherapist may recommend uh, three main positions to uh, a hemiplegic patients to be positioned in a bed. Uh, so we will begin with uh, patient positioning on a bed. So here, we, here with, I will uh, invite Mr. Sandhak Kalum to come onto the trolley. Uh, as we don't have, have a bed here, we have a trolley. So we will try to do the positionings on the trolley. So when we are positioning a hemiplegic patient on a bed, uh, three most common positioning techniques include positioning in supine line and positioning sideline on affected side and positioning sideline on unaffected side. Uh, so first we will uh, demonstrate the positioning in supine line. So suppose the right side of the Mr. Sandakalum is the affected side. So when we are positioning in the supine line, head should be supported with one or two pillows. And then uh, affected arm also should be supported. When we are supporting the affected arm, affected, it is better if we take the affected arm to a protracted position and supported on a pillow. And it is better if elbow can be kept in straight and it is also better uh, to keep the palm facing up. So here I will demonstrate. Here I will take the shoulder forward and place it on the pillow and the elbow should be straight here and palm is facing upward. And one thing I should mention is uh, supine line position is the most likely position to encourage the spasticity. Uh, however, the Patients may, some patients may like to lie on back and also we need this positioning for some therapeutic interventions also. So we will pay, place the uh, hemiplegic patients in supine line also. Then uh, I will use another uh, pillow to support his affected leg. Usually when uh, a hemiplegic patient is there, their um, hip, uh, yeah, leg may, may be turning out at hip. It may be rotating externally. So to avoid that and also to relax the leg, we may use a small pillow under the buttocks, which extends up to knee. So then uh, the leg will be positioned comfortably and uh, also, we can use additional uh, modifications to this according to the patient's presentation. If patient present with uh, edemas in arms or legs, we may use 
two pillows to elevate it more. Likewise, we can do the modifications. And one thing we can do is if the pressure areas are building up under the calcaneus, that means uh, posterior aspect of the foot, we may use a specific type of cushions to comfort the area. Okay, this is the supine line positioning. Then we will go to uh, side line on unaffected side. So at the initial stages, when we are taking a hemiplegic patient into an unaffected line, uh, the ice uh, simple technique to comfortably turn him into the unaffected side. Suppose now this is the unaffected side. So he doesn't, suppose that he doesn't have any functions in that, that side. Uh, so uh, maximal support will be given to the patient to turn him into the uh, unaffected side. What we can do it here is uh, bend the unaffected leg, affected leg, we are turning him into unaffected side. So affected leg can hold it. Patient may not be able to hold this position. So we may have to support because uh, this leg can be very weak. So then uh, patient's unaffected arm can be taken away from the body and kept it on the bed. Here we uh, bed is uh, not wide enough to place him in a proper manner, but how we will manage with this trolley. So what we can do is cross the affected arm across the body and bend the affected knee. Then I will grasp from the posterior aspect of the pelvis with the one arm and other arm across the posterior aspect of the shoulder. I will, like that way, I would be able to easily turn him into the unaffected side. When we have placed him in unaffected side, uh, important thing is to place uh, around one to two pillows to support the head and neck. Then we should use another pillow to support the affected arm. Here, what we will do is, here, what we will do is take the affected arm forward and support it under a pillow. And it is better if the elbow can be kept straight. So then the uh, affected limb, the lower limb, uh, thigh and leg should be aligned with trunk and we can take the affected limb forward, well forward, and placed on a pillow to support it. When we have taken him onto this position, it will prevent him from rolling back onto his back, rolling onto him, his back. And also, as you all know, this uh, paratic limb or hemiplegic lower extremity, uh, tends to get into the retracted hip position and extended knee. So to uh, improve the, that uh, abnormal movement and movement patterns, we can use this position. And this may be a, comfort a comfortable position for, for the patient. And uh, also we can use a small pillow uh, across her lumbar a spine area to maintain the line of the spine. Uh, then uh, we will go to the sideline on affected side. Uh, most of the patients won't uh, like, will not like to uh, be placed in affected side, but some may like. So we will use that position also. Now we, uh, I, I'll assume his right side is the affected side. Previously, I assumed his left side is affected side. So now I will assume that his right side is the affected side. What is the difference here is we can't uh, let the patient to weight bear on the point of the shoulder because uh, the weak um, arm muscles can cause the shoulder subluxation and pain syndromes can be there. So it is better if the patient is borne the weight through the flat blade of the uh, shoulder, that means so scapular area. So 
we will take the affected arm furthermore and uh, support head and neck with pillows and the weight is going through the flat surface of the scapula so, uh, other thing is uh, the affected leg is affected leg is position affected thigh and leg to be positioned uh, to align with the trunk and a minimal amount of knee flexion will be added and the unaffected leg will be taken forward to stabilize the him and it uh, unaffected limb can be supported on a pillow this way we can uh, place the patient on affected side uh, so these are the three basic uh, positioning techniques on a bed and uh, we will next we will go to the uh, bed mobility and taking him out of the bed uh, the stages so i will demonstrate several techniques which will which we will use to uh, improve the patient's bed mobility and uh, the activities which will help him to come out of bed so suppose he is uh, right sided hemiplegic uh, so his lower limb may be very weak so as physiotherapist we know even with very weak lower limbs if we take the paratic co hemiplegic limb uh, to knee and hip bent position and if we ask the uh, patient to push on us usually most of the patients will be able to push on us i will demonstrate it if we take the patient's position uh, into this position patient's limb and if we push if he asked to push him on us usually the patient will be able to push on us so that means he will be having a capacity to do some exercises called bridging i will demonstrate what it is bridging so most of the patients will be able to do the bridging uh, so bridging is usually we ask the patient to take both hips and knees to a bent position which the, his foot is supported on the bed when he is in on this position uh, he will be able to if we uh, hold the his knees and foot together and ask him to lift his buttocks off the uh, trolley or bed then he will be able to perform the task we'll try okay like this way we may use some facilitative techniques also uh, even the patient's affected leg is not strong enough to do this activity uh, the unaffected leg will help him Uh, this is what we called as motor overflow the intense contraction of the unaffected side will facilitate the, the muscle contraction of affected side so he will be able to do this movement okay this is very important uh, this is actually this whole thing is uh, we called as functional training actually it is more than exercise it is uh, the pa patient what patient practiced in day to day life so uh, we actually can use this technique to position him on bed uh, very well so i'll demonstrate one thing so i can ask him to lift buttock and take the buttocks to a side base and kept it again down so it will help him to reposition on the bed and other thing is, is it will also help him to take out of the come out of the bed so okay other thing is uh, lower trunk rotations in this way i can perform uh, the lower trunk rotation if we take the uh, onto this position i may use his i may support his uh, knees and ask him to 
uh, ro rotate the lower trunk. Initially, therapist will be doing this in passive manner to both sides. Then we have uh, techniques called PNF techniques. We may apply them to improve this trunk control. And also there is uh, additional benefits of these exercises. This will elongate the muscles of the uh, affected side trunk muscles. So likewise, then sometimes we can use uh, some manual forces to facilitate the activation of muscles. Mm. Okay, we will go to the upper limb activities mm. to get him out of the bed. Uh, suppose this is his affected leg, affected uh, arm. So I will ask him to grasp uh, with the unaffected arm on the wrist like this way. So he can use this kind of movement with the help of the unaffected arm. So this is the what you have seen in the D1 flexion and extern, extension pattern on the previous uh, presentation. Uh, usually when it is on flexed and adducted position, palm is facing downward and it goes to palm is facing upward. So this is a good exercise for arm and this will help with bed mobility also. Then we may uh, encourage him to add some trunk rotation, upper trunk rotation with the exercise. So like this way, this is upper trunk also rotating. So those are basic two uh, exercises we perform in the bed. So now we can uh, take those two techniques and put them together to get him out of the bed. So I will uh, explain how we can uh, actually with the assistance of the patient, we can take him out of the bed. Suppose uh, the right side is his affected side. So he will be use, um, easily able to take and bend his unaffected side. And uh, you, usually we will use this leg with only this leg. Usually in initial stages, this leg won't stay like this way. It will fall apart. So we will take the unaffected limb into this position and we will use that. We will use these techniques together to turn him to the side. Like that way, he will be able to assist us. So once he is on that position, we can take him onto the sitting position. So what he can do is, is this leg is strong. So what he can do is push with this leg and take the foot out leg lower legs out of the bed okay then the other thing is this is his strong arm uh, one thing to assist himself to get into the sitting position is push on the bed with his strong arm or otherwise he can push through the affected arm like this way then the therapist may facilitate the uh, patient to get from lying position to sit, uh, sitting position. So usually we will use the leverage here. That means uh, lateral aspect of pelvis and I will support over the posterior aspect of the scapula. Like this way, we will be able to assist him to come to the uh, sitting position. One important thing is, okay, uh, we may do it in this way also. So I may support from here and from the underside of his scapula. That is fine. But if I am holding from his back of his neck, it is not good for the patient. So that should be avoided. Uh, once the patient is in the sitting position, we, will, we should encourage, uh, improve his, his uh, sitting balance. And other thing is, uh, what should I mention is, once the patient is capable of coming to the sitting position, he should be placed in uh, out of the bed on a sitting uh, on the chair on a chair. So that will enhance his uh, 
normal recovery and his sense of normality, those things will be improved. So now suppose his right leg is the affected, right leg and right arm is the affected side. So when the patient is in this position, they usually lean to the affected side. They will tip up, tip over this side. So even his, even we place the upper arm in this position, he will not be able to keep the elbow straight. It will buckle lower. So we may assist him with the, his uh, affected arm like that way. And we may ask the patient to shift the uh, weight to the sides. I'll show it here. And we can use uh, an assistance or we can use a belt which is worn around the chest so, uh, to uh, manipulate his trunk, upper trunk. So then uh, when, and additionally, we are using verbal cues and tactile cues here. Uh, so, is Sandha Kalum, I, I may, as a therapist, I may ask, straight, 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 sit straight, sit straight, stay tall. Like that way, we will provide some verbal uh, cues also, and also tactile cues. Uh, one thing more we can do is, we can place a mirror in front of the patient and ask him to uh, look through the mi mirror and position him himself correctly. So, those techniques can be employed according to the patient factors. So after getting uh, some comfortable with the sitting position, then we may use additional techniques to improve the sitting balance. Uh, this is a technique, PNF technique called uh, alternative isometrics. So uh, I will demonstrate here how to employ that technique to improve the uh, sitting balance. So in here, what we do is we place one of our arm over the sternum. That means anterior area of the chest and other arm over the posterior upper back, mid of posterior upper back, like that way. Then from the anterior arm, I will apply a posteriorly directed push. Posteriorly directed push. So then uh, I will ask patient to hold the position without breaking it. And I will encourage him with verbal and tactile cues. So like this way, hold the position. Sandha Kalum, hold the position. Also from the backward, the same technique is applied. So this is the, uh, when we are applying the push, I tell him I'm applying from the front and I'm applying from the back. This is how we initiate the technique. And other thing is uh, I can apply laterally directed forces from unaffected side to affected side and affected side to unaffected side. Usually when we are applying this force from affected side to unaffected side, he will be strong enough to uh, bear the load. But usually when we are applying from the unaffected side to affected side, so the more encouragement will be necessary to practice this. And additional uh, techniques also there. We can use force couples and those things to improve the uh, sitting balance. Uh, so these things include sitting balance. And after improving this static sitting balance, we will progress to dynamic sitting balance. There we will be given him dynamic activities to improve the sitting balance. Usually when his affected arm is functioning well, we may ask him to do bilateral trainings. That means throwing ball, catching ball like this. But if he, uh, his uh, affected arm is not good enough, we will use alternatives like reaching activities. We may give an object from a one direction and ask him to reach with the unaffected arm like this way. We will give an object from different directions and ask him to reach. So it will further improve his 
sit imbalance. After he is having a good amount of sit imbalance, we will progress to sit into standing and stand imbalance, then to gait. So, other thing is bed should not be in this way. That means bed height should be corrected to enhance the patient's safety and promote the recovery. So, it should be corrected. So, I will demonstrate the positioning in a chair and uh, sit into standing exercises, then we will uh, end the session. So, so this is when we are positioning the patient on sitting. Uh, and it is better if the chair height is more, this is low, low height chair, it is better to initiate with the higher chair. So initially the head should be over the pelvis. And suppose this is the affected arm. So affected arm should be supported with the pillow. We can take the affected arm some shoulder somewhat forward and supported on a pillow. And usually uh, hip and hip should be 90 degrees and knee should be 90 degrees. Uh, so his hips and knees are 90 degrees. Usually what happens is their hip will be, uh, leg will be uh, turning out at hip like this way. So we will place a towel roll or something to support. So it, uh, the foot should be sort of placed on the floor. Otherwise we can use a small stool if the chair is too high. So, uh, and other thing is one most important thing is when Manipulating the affected arm, we should be very careful. They can have some shoulder issues, shoulder pain and shoulder subluxation, uh, those things. Then I will demonstrate uh, an exercise to make him to standing. So uh, previously we used that bridging to improve bed mobility. We can use the same skill he has gained from that to take him into the front of the chair. Then I'll ask him to extend his uh, hip and back like this way. Then he, he, he will uh, slide forward. So then the therapist may assist him the on upper back and take him. Other thing is, one thing we can use is uh, if the patient is not capable of doing that, we may manually take him into the anterior surface of the uh, chair like this way. What I have done is lifting his, leaning his uh, upper trunk to a one side then uh, dragging his hip from the posterior side of the pelvis forward. Then lift, uh, uh, leaning him to other side then like was alternatively taking him to the front. Once he's in, uh, in the anterior edge of the chair, we can easily make him into the standing position. So suppose this is the, suppose this is the affected leg. So I will demonstrate it how to stand, make him stand. So most important thing is to support his knee. We can either support with both knees squeezing on his knee or we can cross over his knee and support it. And usually the patients can wear a specific type of belt called gate belt to support these activities. So patient should lean forward and patient's foot should be supported. So initially what we can do is contralateral limb. That means unaffected limb can be placed more posterior. So he is born, he's weight bearing more on that side. So then we can go to the symmetrical weight bearing. So then lean, ask him to lean forward and in affected like this, affected arm is uh, lying on his thigh then I will assist him to stand up like this way. Like that way. He may use the push. He may uh, use this, uh, use his better arm to push on the chair to stand up. So other, I will finally, I'll demonstrate one exercise to improve the sitting to standing. What he can do is, uh, Clasp, uh, clasp his hands and bend forward, bend for more forward and try to 
stand up so and go back to sitting position we may we therapist may facilitate these techniques from the anterior aspect of the distal thigh and posterior aspect of the pelvis like that way a therapist may facilitate the standing so these techniques can be employed uh, so as the time is going uh, so we will finish the session uh, before finishing session if anyone is having any question related to, to the rehabilit physiotherapeutic rehabilitation of stroke uh, now it is the time otherwise we will end the session As there, is, there are no questions, we will end the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kulratna. We do have some questions. Um, what are the objective assessments that can be used for a stroke patient as a physiotherapist? Okay, uh, that is a big question. That means uh, without specifying any specific thing, no? Yes, that is how uh, he or she has asked it. Can you ask it again? What are the objective assessments that can be used for a stroke patient as a physiotherapist? That means without specifying any function, that means uh, objective assessments. We are using many objective assessments. That means we are using range, range of motion measurements we are using, and we are using these uh, scales as MAS modified Ashworth scales. Uh, and we are using other kind of scales for uh, measure the functions, measure the muscle tone, those things. I I don't I don't think it is a good type of question because it does not specify any specific area because many objective assessments are available in the physiotherapy assessment. So if anyone can ask related to one specific time for strength or for muscle control or likewise that likewise then we will be able to give but there are many objective assessment scales in physiotherapy for example for the arm then we talked about his uh, shoulder pain so so shoulder grading techniques are there that means uh chadek mac there is a scale for especially for shoulder also those scales are used to assess the impairment of the patient and to monitor the improvement of the patient likewise there are many assessing scales for the patients in physiotherapy thank you i think we have another question what should we do to correct pusher syndrome yeah pusher syndrome uh, When a patient is having pusher syndrome, uh, suppose his unaffected side is this, affected side is this, he will not have the proper alignment. He will not, he doesn't know his midline, visual midline. So he will he think he may think this is not his midline. So he will try to tilt like this way. Uh, so he will push on the strong arm to the affected side. So one thing is one thing we can use is to give him more sensory information to him to uh, grasp his actual position. So one thing is mirror and other thing is he, we can ask him to uh, get the information from vertical objects. We can ask him to look at vertical objects placed on floor and uh, they get the information. Other thing is the thing that I have done with the weight shifting. So, so we can give verbal and auditory cues and give, uh, visual cues with mirror and other objects around him and uh, let him to have the proper alignment with those in information. What usually we do is we are giving more and more information to correct his position. That is the basic principle. And there are more uh, techniques which are not practiced in Sri Lanka, but there are other techniques which we will, which physiotherapists are using to improve these syndromes like Fusha syndrome. I think that will be adequate. I think we have one more question. Uh, 
can you see it yeah would the stroke patient will get spasticity always on post stroke rehab would prevent them yeah that is something neurophysiological thing that means uh, spasticity is uh, some neurophysiological phenomena after a stroke the what we, what what is happening is uh, as a physiotherapist uh, so there is a neurological mechanism which will improve the muscle tone of some specific muscles we usually on anti gravity muscles so there are in neurological things i have there there is concepts called Uh, reciprocal inhibition, collateral inhibition, the freezing up, those things. Then after uh, supraspinal damage to a supraspinal tract, so uh, cortical lesions, uh, there may be things called as collateral sprouting and those things, which will ultimately increase the tone of anti gravity muscles mainly. So uh, what physiotherapists are doing is to uh, positioning uh, patient positioning. Uh, to avoid the or minimize the spasticity as physiotherapist we are using the optimal positions that avoid abnormal movement pattern and promote normal movement patterns so that is the way we are uh, trying to reduce the spasticity and other temporary measures also they are stretching and using ice so those are temporary measures to temporarily reduce the uh, is spasticity for some functions maybe when they, if this patient having a uh, spasticity of his elbow flexors we will use a uh, static stretch on his elbow wrist flexors then it will improve temporarily those things are there and uh, yeah, even the orthotics are used but the static or orth orthotics are not uh, as according to the evidence they are not uh, advised for the spasticity as i think of spasticity of flexors like this so is there anything else can we use mirror therapy approach when patient is having pusher syndrome yeah according to the patient we may use okay that sometime the if the when the patient is having a stroke sometimes patient may not like to see him through he see her or him through a mirror because you see uh, maybe you sometimes their face uh, side of face is also drooping so according to the patient i should i think it should be selected if patient is encouraged with the mirror so we will be able to use the that means all, all this treatment should be chosen according to the patient presentation i think is it needed to worry about the fine movements and self care for physiotherapist when occupational therapist are in the team i think both should be worried no uh, this is a multidisciplinary thing no so both people should be we, we all have roles but we there are some overlapping roles also we have overlaps in our roles but both should be worried uh, ultimately patient should be able to do those both movements i think both should be worried that's all no thank you very much mr kularatna okay, mr sandekalu so we move on to the next session uh, it's on occupational therapy for stroke to conduct this session i would like to invite mr nandana velage senior tutor in occupational therapy good afternoon my presentation is about the role of occupational therapy for stroke these are the contents of my presentation today first i will briefly talk about what occupational therapy is followed by theoretical background of the profession and the processes then i'll talk about specific assessment used in occupational therapy for stroke rehabilitation and intervention which encompasses prevention restoration compensation and adaptation Occupational therapy or OT in short is a client centered approach concerned with promoting health and well-being of people of all ages with various physical and or mental illness through meaningful occupations. Meaningful occupations are the activities a person perform 
from the time of waking up in the morning until they retire to bed at night. Very often people think that OT is concerned with the type of therapy given to prepare a person to go back to their previous job or occupation after an injury. But in reality, that is only one aspect of OT. In fact, OT is way broader than that and is a holistic approach to treatment because both physical and mental aspect of a person is addressed. Therefore, the primary goal of OT is to enable people to participate independently in the entire range of human occupations ranging from activities of daily living, work and leisure. Let me ask you to think why occupations are important to you. Think about 30 seconds. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Occupation is more than just a list of activities and also not just occupying you. Occupation has a deeper meaning than that. As we know, human being is an occupational being. Human cannot survive without engaging in activities. Occupation is a determinant of health. A Greek philosopher, Galen said, Occupation is the nature's best physician and it is essential for human happiness. Occupation gives you a personal identity and a place in the society. For example, people recognize you from your engagement for living, such as a doctor, teacher, singer, an occupational therapist, so on. Occupation or engagement in activities provide control over the person's life and self-satisfaction. Knowing the value of engaging in activities, occupational therapists believe that what people do affect their physical and mental well-being. Therefore, occupational therapists help people to carry out these meaningful activities which are restricted as a result of illness, disability, or social exclusion and helps to restore the health and well-being. When we look at the theoretical aspect, PEO model is the most popular model. This model is based on person, environment and occupation. According to the model, independent and best performance is depend on three factors. Factors related to the person, his or her living environment and occupation or engagement. So, the performance such as activities of daily living, education, work, play and leisure is depend on factors related to the person. This includes the ability such as motor skills, sensory skills, processing skills, etc. Best performance is also determined by the way that person perform occupation or engagement such as habits, roles, and routines which are unique to the person. Finally, the environment in which person engages in the activity. This includes physical environment such as home or workplace and social environment such as family members at home or fellow workers at work. Hence, stroke can cause imbalance of these three areas. In this case, Initially, the aim of OT is to restore the abilities of the person. If the disability is irreversible, occupational therapist will change the way of engaging in occupations and also change the environment to enhance performance. Expansion of occupation and environment may help to overcome the def deficiencies in person which will in turn enhance performance. To achieve those broad objectives, occupational therapists conduct assessment, plan and carry out intervention and review the progress at the end of the program. 
Due to the complexity of the clinical picture of the person with stroke, a wide variety of specific tests are conducted. A wide variety of assessments are available in relation to assess body functions and structure, activities and participation, which are the component of the international classification of functioning. However, in our context, all those assessments are not available. After the detailed initial assessment, OT intervention is planned. The major objective of the occupational therapy are to prevent further complications and restore functions. If the restoration is not possible due to permanent disability, coping skills and compensatory techniques are introduced to perform function and also modify the patient's living environment to overcome limitations of performance. Let me discuss about the interventions. Correct positioning is essential at the early hypotonic stages to prevent pain, edema, subluxation and dislocations of joints and at the latter hypertonic stage to prevent the development of typical hemiplegic posture. It is important to maintain correct posture initiated by physiotherapy colleagues throughout the day as much as possible. OT makes sure the adherence to correct body posture during the activities of daily living. As we know, it is important that all members of the multidisciplinary team to encourage correct positioning. In the absence of treatment for complete cure of people following stroke, rehabilitation is widely used to minimize impairment and maximize functions and thereby enhance quality of life. A wide range of therapy interventions are used to improve the upper extremity functions after stroke. However, the most effective rehabilitation technique is yet to be identified. The type of intervention used will be determined by the needs of the patient. Here are some techniques that are widely used in stroke rehabilitation. Based on the assumption that symmetrical bilateral movements activate similar neural networks in both hemispheres, promoting neural plasticity and cortical repair, activities are designed for repetitive practice or bilateral arm movements in symmetrical or alternative patterns. Activities designed based on proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques are practice in regaining and maintaining range of motion, muscle strength and power. PNF accelerates the response of neuromuscular activity through the stimulation of proprioception. Another method is repetitive task practice. This method is based on movement science and motor relay theory aim to identify performance of specific skills and teaching missing aspect of the skill using written, verbal or visual instructions. These three methods, that is bilateral arm training, PNF and repetitive task practice are conventional treatment techniques which are still widely in use. Constraint induced movement therapy or CIMT is a more recently developed treatment technique. Dr. Edward Taub identified that the persistent weakness of the affected site is not because of the cortical injury itself, but due to the phenomena called learn and use in which person does not use the affected site, which leads to muscle atrophy and corresponding weakness. And the good news is, that this phenomena is reversible. CIMT comprised of the forced use of paritic limb while restraining of the contralateral unaffected limb. The previous interventions, those are bilateral 
arm training, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, motor relearning, and uh, this constraint induced movement therapy are considered as bottom up techniques. The metaphor bottom up refers to the action path, according to which the movements of the effector located in the periphery stimulate the activities of the central nervous system. Among the approaches to the treatment of motor deficits after stroke, the bottom up techniques are most commonly used. Among them, CIMT and modified CIMT are strongly backed by research, therefore strongly recommended. In recent years, neurorehabilitation has moved from a bottom-up to top-down approach. During therapeutic activities, top-down approaches are being used to stimulate the brain more directly to elicit neuroplasticity and to enhance motor relearning. Mirror therapy is one such technique. Mirror therapy is a cognitive treatment method based on neurological characteristics of mirror neurons. In mirror therapy, the affected side is covered behind a mirror and the unaffected side is seen through the mirror which induces a visual illusion that activates the damaged brain areas and provides a sense of normal movement in the affected side. Let's watch a short video about another top-down approach. Have you ever thought you can activate your brain by just imagining doing a task? Neuroscientists using modern day scanning methods have revealed that when you imagine doing a task, it activates the similar brain areas that get activated when you are actually perform the task. This imagining, called motor imagery, is widely used by athletes and now is used for rehabilitating people affected due to conditions such as stroke. In motor imagery, the person mentally rehearses a specific task without actually attempting to do it. Adding together with the actual practice, this technique has been found to be a simple, cost-effective and viable method compared to complex methods currently used for stroke rehabilitation. There are two methods of motor imagery. Number one, first-person perspective, that is, imagining doing the task by self. And number two, third-person perspective, that is, imagining as if being an observer of the person doing the task. It is not known which imagery perspective is better than the other. So our study aimed to determine the best perspective, specifically for improving upper limb functions after stroke. This is a study that I did in my postgraduate studies. So as you saw in the video, what imagery can be used in acute, subacute and chronic strokes and also for people with severe paralysis who cannot perform movement actively and the good thing is motor imagery is a non-invasive, cost-effective and viable method which is easy to learn and can be practiced anywhere at any time without the supervision of a therapist. There is a recent evidence that both first person and third person motor imagery are equally effective in improving upper extremity function after stroke. In addition to the motor impairment, occupational therapist is involved in restoration and compensation of wide variety of visual processing skills. Perceptual impairments such as body neglect, topographical disorientation, constructional and dressing apraxias are also addressed by engaging in wide variety of activities. OT conducts sensory re-education using sensory training. If sensory loss is permanent, OT uses adaptive techniques to compensate the sensory impairment. When the restoration is not possible, OT focuses on compensatory techniques. Here the focus is to regain functions by compensating with the unaffected limb. This method is useful to perform activities of daily living independently. When disability is permanent, adaptation is necessary for carrying out ADL and ensuring independence. Different types of assistive devices are designed and trained to use them in enhancing self-care activities such as 
feeding, grooming, dressing, etc. Environmental modification is also conducted to remove barriers in the home and work environment. Some of the common areas of concern are the non-slippery floors, proper lighting of the house, installation of commode sheets and grab bars, and also major alterations of the house such as steps may need to be replaced with a ramp, widening the doorway, etc. When patient is independent in basic self-care activities and if the patient is in the stage of earning, OT pays attention to resettle in the employment. To prepare for the employment, similar activities are practiced at the OT unit. OT liaises with the social service officer to find vocational training or apply for funds to start self-employment. Prior to discharge, OT visit the patient's home to provide recommendations to modify the home environment to suit the person's disability. OT assess and train vehicle transferring skills and independent mobility at the home environment. Research shows that patient participation for decision making is more in the home environment than at the hospital setting and also patients adhere to recommendations of the therapist more in the home environment. So once the OT intervention is done, the final evaluation is conducted and that uh, complete the OT intervention. So in summary, Occupational therapists use activity-based therapy to prevent complications and restoration of functions. When the disability is permanent, compensatory methods and adaptations are introduced to maximize the independent in activities of daily living, work and leisure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Nandana Velaki. To conduct the live demonstration on occupational therapy for stroke patients, I would like to invite Mr. BGM Samarivira and Mr. DMIG Disanayaka, Occupational Therapist, Rehabilitation Hospital, Digana. Uh, I am Suru, Occupational Therapist uh, from Rehabilitation Hospital, Digana. Uh, now I would like to continue with the practical session regarding occupational therapy in stroke rehabilitation. Uh, after stroke patient refer to the occupational therapy, uh, we are doing several uh, standardized assessments, uh, screening and observation before our therapy intervention and uh, throughout our therapy intervention. Uh, the assessments and therapy intervention are, interventions are vary to patient to patient. Uh, it's depend on uh, factors uh, such as the age, gender, pre-morbid personality, uh, severity of the damage, uh, likewise, uh, many more things. Uh, and today uh, I will demonstrate uh, only few uh, therapy sessions we are usually uh, doing at the occupation therapy unit uh, in occupation therapy uh, rehabilitation process that related to the previous uh, presentation of my uh, senior occupation therapist. Uh, at the first, my point is uh, that earlier uh, physiotherapists and nurses uh, described uh, and demonstrated about the uh, positioning. Uh, the, my point also, uh, that is, that is the main area of our, our occupation therapy, uh, the positioning. Uh, in the point of view of occupation therapy, we are uh, mainly concerned about the functional position of the uh, patient. Uh, it means uh, we uh, more like to uh, engage uh, our patient uh, from the beginning of our therapy intervention. Uh, in some uh, activities, uh, we can engage. Uh, and I will demonstrate uh, within simple uh, activity how, how we can uh, benef uh, gain benefits uh, from correct positioning uh, when engaging a, a simple activity. I will uh, use activity uh, that uh, patient uh, uh, drinking water uh, and we'll assume uh, this is my uh, patient and he is a left side CVA patient and right hemiplegic patient. Uh, uh, in here, 
uh, we have to uh, concern about his sitting balance. He might have adequate sitting balance, uh, trunk balance for engage uh, this activity. Uh, and actually, uh, there might be enough conscious uh, level to engage uh, uh, even this activity uh, in uh, acute stage. Uh, and uh, I will ask this patient, uh, patient to keep his both hands, this is affected hand, and this is unaffected limb, uh, and keep both in top of the table, and I'll give the cup of uh, tea or water uh, in top of the table, and I ask to uh, drink water from his unaffected side, slowly. In here, you can see the affected limb I have kept on the to top of the table, and it, it has, uh, supported very well, uh, shoulder is supported very well, and rest of the hand have uh, supported very well on top of the table. Uh, from this, uh, even this small activity, we can give a, a visual uh, sense uh, for the affected side. Uh, from that, we can uh, prevent that neglecting affected side from early stage, and we can uh, uh, facilitate the uh, ADS in future uh, by uh, preventing contractures uh, and subluxation of shoulder and prevent uh, uh, many complications in uh, future presence. Uh, that's the point of uh, the positioning uh, we are concerned. At next, I uh, would like to uh, demonstrate this uh, another uh, therapy session we are implementing acute stage. Uh, it is mirror therapy. Uh, I will demonstrate how it's going on. Uh, now also we'll assume he's, uh, he's affected limb is right uh, upper limb uh, and he is on uh, acute stage. Uh, we are using a mirror. We are using a mirror box like this uh, for this uh, session. Uh, uh, here, also, here also we have to uh, provide the uh, suitable chair and suitable uh, table to patient. And after that, uh, we want to assess uh, his cognition level and his vision, uh, like many areas to before uh, engage this uh, therapeutic activity. In here, we are doing uh, that affected limb cover, cover from the mirror uh, and uh, keep sound limb in front of the mirror, like this. And uh, in the beginning, we can uh, ask patient to do uh, small movements in front of the mirror, like this. He's moving his upper limb in front of the mirror. Then we ask to uh, see the reflection of the mirror that his affected limb, uh, like uh, we can give illusion like uh, the affected limb is working. Mm. And also we can use small activities. Uh, I will give uh, another small activity, simple activity to do in front of the mirror. Hmm. Ask to move the pegs slowly. We want to ask a patient to see the reflection from the mirror. To engage uh, this uh, mirror therapy, there are, uh, there are many requirements like earlier I mentioned that uh, patient might have a good vision uh, if they are a, a condition like hemianopia or uh, somewhat like uh, we can't engage uh, this therapeutic activities, activities like this. Uh, and the uh, conservation and the attention span uh, also uh, might enough for this activity. And this is how the mirror therapy is going on in early stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, those two uh, therapy sessions are we are implement actually in the uh, most of the uh, early stage of our therapy intervention. Uh, next, I will uh, demonstrate our uh, main therapy uh, session uh, that we are implementing in our uh, therapy intervention now after uh, somewhat patient have improved in uh, rehabilitation process. Uh, it is CIMT. Uh, actually, the uh, theoretical background was uh, described by our uh, senior therapist uh, earlier, earlier in the presentation. Uh, 
uh, and I will demonstrate uh, how it's going on. Uh, in here, we are doing that we are blocking uh, affected limb. Uh, we are blocking the unaffected limb and uh, we motivate to uh, use the unaffected uh, affected limb to use uh, in uh, activities. In here, actually, uh, there are many requirements like uh, he has, uh, he want to be a, uh, enough, uh, have improve, improve enough to uh, engage in activities. Uh, the motor functions like uh, yeah, uh, actually uh, wrist improve wrist movements uh, want to be improved up to uh, extension up to 20 degrees and finger extension might have nearly uh, 10, de 10 degrees uh, like that uh, may need uh, more uh, requirements to engage this activity uh, and I will demonstrate how it's going on. Uh, we are blocking. Is uh, affected limb is uh, right limb, right upper limb. Uh, now we have, uh, we have uh, blocked his uh, sound side, uh, and uh, we we asked to do a activity from his affected hand. You can see uh, for engage these activities, he might have enough uh, range of motion and um, have want to be uh, enough improvement of the upper limb after a stroke. Uh, we can't implement this uh, like this treatment in the early stage of the uh, stroke rehabilitation. And through this uh, CIMT, we can improve the uh, further range of motion of the upper limb and uh, functional usage of the uh, affected limb. Uh, for the at the beginning we are uh, recommend to uh, to do a small time uh, little time uh, we can uh, block the uh, on the affected hand and we have to concern about the safety issues uh, and uh, patients uh, willingness to do these activities because he can be depressed if he uh, can't engage uh, these activities uh, because we have to uh, address those areas before engaging this uh, this therapy. After that, uh, I would like to uh, point out a uh, main area we concern is the ADLs uh, as occupation therapy. Uh, we are uh, mainly uh, our ultimate goal is the uh, to pay independent the patient and uh, now I will demonstrate the small part of the ADL uh, that is uh, dressing upper half of the uh, stroke patient uh, after uh, Uh, for this, uh, for this uh, activity, actually, uh, to engage uh, like this uh, ADL, uh, there can be uh, uh, enough uh, movements, improvements, or whether it's not improved, we can engage uh, and we can teach uh, this dressing practice to the uh, hemiplegic patient. Uh, we will concern. Uh, we will. Uh, concern his uh, willingness to do these activities and you know, we can modify these activities uh, according to his uh, improvements. Uh, from the early stage, we uh, try to engage uh, some ideas like uh, dressing, uh, feeding, uh, like earlier I mentioned. Uh, now I'll demonstrate uh, with my model uh, how it's going. On. And I will give the shirt, the short sleeve shirt. Uh, and. I'll keep it in pen. I will ask to put it on uh, affected limb at first. Now we can assume he has no improvement in that uh, right upper limb. We take it up to here. 
you can see he is not moving his uh, right upper limb. He is taking only his unaffected hand and he is doing at the same part. Actually, uh, there are some uh, praxia, uh, like he can't uh, follow these uh, activities. We can use uh, methods like backward chaining for train, uh, the, like those patients. Actually, now he's doing from uh, use only is uh, unaffected limb. If there is a uh, small movement on the affected side, we can use the that movement and we can improve the uh, further that affected hand through uh, engaging these activities. The benefits of this uh, independence in this area are uh, the patient gain more. Uh, self-esteem and self-satisfaction through independent these uh, ADS and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, keep make more independent in day-to-day -day life uh, in the uh, end of the rehabilitation process. That is the undressing part of chart. Okay, thank you. Uh, at the end of, uh, I would like to uh, do a talk about our, uh, uh, another area uh, that is the adaptations we are using. And uh, earlier, my senior therapist uh, mentioned about that. Uh, this is a, actually, I have brought only uh, one, two adaptations uh, here. Uh, now I will demonstrate uh, how we use uh, this adaptation. This is universal cuff. Uh, this is we are uh, usually using in the stroke rehabilitation or uh, uh, rehabilitation process. And I will show how it's using. Uh, for, this act, uh, for this therapy, uh, this activity, actually uh, there won't be enough uh, improvement of the upper limbs, uh, upper limb uh, like shoulder, elbow. Uh, and uh, somewhat of the uh, wrist, we uh, need improvements. Uh, I will show how it's going. We have to uh, put this universal cuff like this and Uh, and here we'll consider uh, he his uh, shoulder movements also have improved as much. He's using shoulder movements and elbow and he can independent in feeding in here. But if there is uh, no movements in shoulder, we can keep his uh, limb, upper limb in top of the table and we can ask to move only his elbow. And we can do this activity. Actually, not only the spoon, we can use a uh, brush or uh, some equipment and we can uh, make
So we can we can change the equipment and uh, we can make more independent in those ADAs. Uh, in the early earlier in the rehabilitation process, we can use this universal cuff to uh, improve our range of motion of the shoulder, elbow, and uh, the wrist movements. And uh, later stage, if uh, patient in the plateau stage, uh, he, if he has become the plateau uh, that uh, he have he needs some uh, adaptations further to independent in day to day life, we can design uh, those adaptations. Uh, actually, this also a, a tailor made uh, uh, adaptation for a uh, stroke patient. Uh, and another uh, vast area is the, uh, that we can uh, we have to assess the, the previous occupation and uh, when, when he resettled in previous job, we have to do uh, more uh, more modifications in his uh, life uh, before he re-enter his previous job. Uh, then we have to uh, make more adaptations and uh, we have to more do more modifications in his uh, participation of his previous job. Uh, and uh, this is the end of uh, the practical session of the uh, this uh, stroke rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, this, uh, these are the few sessions we are uh, usually doing the stroke rehabilitation uh, in uh, uh, the patient like uh, he has no uh, complaints in uh, cognition functions and vision uh, problems. Uh, if there are, there are problems in uh, vision or uh, cognition function, there are many more therapy we are uh, implementing in different stages of the rehabilitation process. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Samarvira and Mr. Bisanayaka. So we will move on to the next session. It's on speech therapy and swallowing assessment for stroke. To conduct this session, I would like to invite Dr. Shamani Hettiarachi, Senior Lecturer in Speech Therapy, Department of Disability Studies, Faculty of Medicine, Radhama. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. Um, might I be able to share the screen, please? Um, so my colleague just said my name. Is Shamini, and I'm a. Excuse me, madam, sorry to interrupt you. We cannot hear you. Your your sorry, Shamini, can you so you know, I wasn't lying when I said my connectivity is bad. Are you able to hear me now? Not very clearly, madam. Um, are you able to hear me now? Uh, yes, I think now it's okay. Can you please continue, Madam? Let's it's check. slightly better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So in the next 30 minutes, we're going to have a quick look at um, dysphagia management and communication skills management, um, really influenced by the ICF framework that I will talk uh, to you about. I, I know Nandana. Referencing it as well. Um, and just looking at um, an MDT approach to dysphagia management and communication. So, within the present backdrop of COVID 19, Speech and language therapists are really required to be extra cautious because. 
it's all about working assessment and management. Sorry, let's keep trying. So assuming you are able to hear me, um, I was saying that this is my mom who had a little stroke in 2019, um, right throughout after we came home, NG tube in place uh, rather than a therapist. And I really wanted my mom to be able to eat and drink orally. It is only when she wasn't able to manage it and she was coughing, she was her. She was, drowsy um, and when the really diffident he really didn't want it that's when I stepped back and thought like a therapist and thought my goodness yes of course my mom needs an injury she's not safe to have her food or medication orally so I'm thankful to all my MDT colleagues who helped my mom it, it was really through um, the support of my mom is, is uh, functioning now. So we use as a lot of functioning disability and health impairment and um, back into participation. And for dysphagia, that would mean maybe having meals together, being able to go to a restaurant for meals, so participating in everyday um, or family um, feeding, or also mean taking on as dad, as mom, or as coworker. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So in terms of dysphagia management, uh, borrowing really from um, the Bible, if that's okay. A man has no better thing. I mean, I think we've been really uh, restricted in doing this at the moment because of lockdown. Is able to achieve finance at the moment is not big, but it is, it is one of the joys of it. It's about reality of eating and drinking to life itself, right? And when we think about our culture. You know, a lot of it is to do with our hospitality and our interest. I apologize that my connectivity is really bad. Uh, I will try and record it though and, and send it along so you have a reference for my presentation. So in terms of stroke care, Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists recommend that um, a speech therapist see a client, um, you know, with uh, initial assessment, training of other healthcare professionals, long-term intervention, training of carers and other professionals, supporting the medical team in, in uh, determining the capacity, for instance, of being able to consent um, to particular uh, um, recommendations, as well as getting together and developing a discharge plan Seem 
seamlessly transition from the acute phase of the and hopefully continue to get care in the community. Seventy percent to seventy eight percent, right? Later, maybe seventeen percent. So it does go down. Six months later, it may be about eleven percent. However, I think the more in, the really important stat is that about twenty five percent may still die within the first year of a CVA because of aspiration pneumonia. And this is why it's really important for us to work together as physios, OTs, uh, physicians, and speech and language therapists, as well as with, with dietitians. So looking at the, the workload of a speech therapist, um, I wanna thank my colleagues at the national who uh, put this slide together. On a random day, the load would be uh, due to stroke. So in, in dysphagia management. So the care pathway is really that it should be an urgent referral to speech and language therapy within the first 24 hours following the stroke. And that a swallowing screening should be done in the first 24 hours. And al although the recommendation is speech therapy, um, in case the speech therapy is, uh, is unable to do this, if it's after work hours or the weekend or a poor day, for example, the medical practitioners as well as trained nursing staff would be able to do the swallow screening. And this must always be followed by a really comprehensive assessment within the first 24 to 48 hours. And this may entail a bedside assessment using cervical auscultation perhaps instrumentation like a fees or video fluoroscopy if it's available and necessary um, and with great considerations for the ICF framework. So we use our dysphagia protocols, get information from our side assessments, instrumental assessments if necessary, and we glean information from our OT colleagues, our physio colleagues, from the medical notes, from the neurologist, from the nursing staff, from the dietitian to inform our, our decision-making process and to fill in the ICF framework. So that might, that looks a little like this, right? Where we're really looking at what is the body uh, function and structure that is affected? How does it affect uh, participation and activities? And what are the environmental factors that may be affecting um, the person as well as their personal factors? So here's an example of a person with dysphagia. So the body structure uh, that is affected may be that the person has reduced range of motion in the tongue, lips and jaw, for instance. Um, and then the activity or the participation that's affected could be that they're coughing when they're drinking thin liquids. Maybe they're managing their rice or their yogurt, but they're coughing on thin liquids. And when you think about the environmental and personal factors, uh, Perhaps the person is about 70, is 72 years old, they might have other medical compl complications like diabetes from their family, which is if we are requiring the family to take on the food, to liquidize or puree all of the food, that may not be an option. So looking at all of these factors and the interconnectivity between them really supports us in our assessment as well as our intervention. So the normal swallow, um, you know, might look like this. I'm not sure if this video is going to work. Okay, so it looks something like that. And so in our screening that we do within the first 24, uh, 24 hours, uh, it's about figuring out whether the person passes or fails the screening. If they pass the uh, screening, and I believe my colleague Iroshika, the therapist from the Gina Hospital, will be demonstrating uh, a swallow screening. If the uh, stroke survivor passes it, they would go on to 
having that typical diet, but they will definitely need to be monitored and, and hopefully um, sent to speech therapy for a more comprehensive assessment. If, however, the uh, stroke survivor does not pass the swallow screening, uh, the recommendation may be that they are nil by mouth, that they are on the NG, and then that they are sent to speech therapy as a priority um, client for a comprehensive assessment, again, within the first 24 to 48 hours. Because as you can imagine, um, this video has implications for whether somebody can have their medication or it's not just about their eating and drinking. So if we, you, you were to think about two clients, uh, so client A is 78 years old, no past medical history, the client complains of food getting stuck in the throat, you might do a screening assessment, which is a 5 ml water test, but there was no coughing observed on this 5 ml water test. So usually you look out for whether the person has difficulties and whether they, they cough. However, there may have been a change in voice quality and throat clearing that was observed. And so the question is, should we be concerned or can we continue to feed? So um, since we're doing this online and I can't see you and ask these questions, um, I would say that because the voice quality changes, we are assuming that there may be some residue. So we are really concerned that the person may be at high risk of aspiration, although they are not coughing. In the case of this particular client, client B, 68 years old, post-stroke client, you do the 5 ml water test and there's no cough observed, right? And, they are, and the question is again, should we continue to feed without a, without a um, a fees, you might see that actually there's a lot of residue. Right? And there's a lot of pooling, a lot of residue at high risk of aspiration, who is silently aspirating. What the water test is it good enough? So in a, among about 25 to 28 stroke survivors, right? We know that a protective cough may not always be present because uh, the client may have vocal cord uh, palsy, there may be thick saliva getting in the way, there might be a loss of sensitivity. Uh, we know that a voluntary cough, so, some, so what we do is we get the uh, stroke survivor to swallow the water and then we get them to um, say ah, or we might uh, ask them to, um, we might assess their cough, right, sometimes. Um, in, in a Definitely in a comprehensive assessment, we would be doing all of these steps. But a voluntary cough may not be possible. We have some level of apraxia or maybe even a turn to follow up the screening assessment with a really comprehensive assessment of swallow skills. Um, oxygen desaturation, we use this information to inform our decision. Uh, so it's combined to the, but as you know, there's some interesting evidence coming out of, uh, of the UK on COVID and whether we can actually rely on uh, saturation levels. It's, it, there is some evidence to show during the readings, right? So it's an area of interest at the moment. Uh, so we try to follow the Royal College's recommendations when we do swallow screening. Um, and of course, the recommendation is in the, if there's no speech therapist and you have to wait for them to come because it's a weekend, for example, and if you're in doubt, to please continue using an alternative feeding method um, till an assessment is done. So here's my colleague Gauri um, in the north um, doing a, a swallow assessment. Think about management in terms of compensatory strategies, you know, here in the here and now, how can we keep our clients safe? 
And so we work very, very closely with our physiotherapy colleagues to look at posture modification. We, look, uh, we work with our dietitian colleagues and our OT colleagues looking at food modification as, as well as how to support alternative feeding methods and swallowing maneuvers. And then the, the therapeutic program will be about stimulating muscle function and stimulating, uh, stimulating swallowing function. So that is a lot more longer term um, therapeutic rehabilitation program. So in dysphagia management, we're looking at which stage of the swallow has been affected, oral, pharyngeal, esophageal, we are very concerned about safety as well as hydration and nutrition. And in compensatory strategies, we work very, very closely with physios to look at positioning um, while they're in the stroke unit, as well as food and diet modification. So as a team, as a MDT team, the general guidelines would be to ensure that all oral feeding is offered when the stroke survivor is awake and alert, right? So unlike what we were trying to do with my mom. The general postural recommendation is to keep the head and trunk upright. And this would then require us to work very closely with the nursing staff in consultation with the physiotherapy colleagues in adjusting the ICU bed to an appropriate angle. Um, it'll be really good for us to inform the stroke survivor that it, it is the meal time. And for this, it would be nice for us to try and use the communication system that has been set up for the individual client by the speech and language therapist. Right? So now it, it could be that we are recommending a gesture or a communication board or that you show the objects itself just uh, what is going on um, it is really important that all food drink including medical strokes can manage and which has been recommended by the speaker um, and for some, it may be to have small meals often, smaller meals, particularly if, if one has difficulties with alertness, concentration, or there is a lack of motivation, or if they keep getting tired during the meal. So small amounts per spoon at a time to make sure that each spoonful has been swallowed and cleared before offering the next spoon is good advice um, and, and useful for everybody. Um, if you could give little verbal reminders to take small bites, to swallow, to drink the sip of water, that could be helpful too. And again, one sip at a time to minimize the risk of aspiration. As a collective, uh, as uh, using an MDT approach, when we have a lot of stroke survivors at the unit, it may be really useful to have the meal. strategies and texture for that particular client displayed in a really safe place. We are all very sure that we are for very importantly, if you notice any signs of acne or respiration, etc., to please, please document it in the notes so that we can all benefit from that and, and, and uh, have a longer view and a deeper view of what's going on for the client rather than when we just come for a particular uh, assessment or intervention. And finally, I wanted to say that oral care is, is really important um, in the acute stage. So we rely on our nursing colleagues to help us with that. And so the recommendation is oral hygiene at the start of the day, as well as after each meal, so that uh, we're sure that the residue is, is not being aspirated. So in terms of uh, texture modification, there have been different um, um, systems that have been introduced from the UK and the US, et cetera, syrup thick, nectar thick, et cetera. So to avoid any confusion, 
there is the International Dysphagia Diet Sanitization Initiative that came about in 2019. And so in some hospitals overseas, they're actually beginning to label their food from, from the restaurant, from K. using these labels so that across um, professionals or across, so I think something for us to think about. Um, particularly given that we're in the midst of COVID-19, I think we have to begin to think about food security as a human rights issue and whether people have equal access to food and drink. And so when we talk about recommendations, whatever we recommend in terms of diet, um, has implications for, uh, for an individual, whether they can follow it or not, because there's so much intersectionality between poverty and access to food and healthcare. So I just wanted to flag that up as a point to think about. So I'm just going to rush into the communication management part. And Paolo Freire says that only through communication can human life hold meaning. And I'm reminded of when I was a student um, in the UK and, and I had a, my, one of my first uh, stroke clients was actually an Olympic medalist for archery, right? And yet he was sitting in front of me. I was 20 something. Um, he couldn't remember his partner's name. He couldn't ask for a cup of tea and yet only dream of. And so I think about him when I, when I work um, so that I remind myself that the person in front of me has had a life before and that our job is to try and look at how we can get them back as close as possible to those communication roles that they used to play. So again, a prompt referral where, um, Within the first few days, two speech therapy for stroke um, would be very useful so that we can determine the specific communication system that might be useful for a particular disabilities which our government has ratified very strongly talks about the right to communicate and the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists are available. And so we try to look at formulating a communication system that could be eye blinking, it could be a chart, a communication chart, it could be a communication app, it could be gesture. It isn't necessary that we it should be verbal communication. So in differential diagnosis, one of the key uh, diagnoses that we look at is the phasia. And phasia can affect as you know, understanding of receptive language as well as expressive language or the use of language. And it can affect both um, spoken language as well as reading and writing skills. We also look at dysarthria and dysarthria from Digana. The demonstration also talked about uh, body dyspraxia. We as speech therapists are in so a percentage of um, So just to start where um, where I stopped, um, there is a large percentage, about 82% of uh, stroke survivors who might have a speech disorder, and this includes dysarthria. The statistics shown here, about 57%, um, as, as well as aphasia in about 24-25%.
So again, we would do um, a screening protocols. We would get a really comprehensive case history. We would be undertaking comprehensive assessments using what we say is a hypothesis testing approach. So we have a hypothesis could be, and we are gathering information to look at which of our hunches is, is more accurate. And we are also gathering information on alternative communication uh, possibilities. And here we would rely on support from a physiotherapist and OT looking at hand function as, as well as sitting balance, et cetera. And all of this information we gather, uh, we use to um, inform the ICF. So here's my colleague from Jaffna again, doing a little language assessment. And so we're really interested in looking at how aphasia, for example, affects the person um, in, and the person's pa uh, participation in the different roles that they have played, that they used to play in, in their life before the stroke, and how personal um, factors as well as environmental factors influence that. As speech and language therapists, we try to determine the aphasia type, and we might use a classification like the Boston classification to support diagnosis. And here we are interested in looking at how is the activity or activities affected and what is the participation that's been affected? For it, so for instance, maybe somebody has difficulty understanding spoken language, maybe their um, use of it is, is relatively all right, but they are having difficulties understanding spoken language. That would have an impact on whether they can have a conversation. So that is the activity that's affected. And maybe before the stroke, they were the CEO of their company. And so participating and uh, participating in their work role would be what's been affected, right? Uh, but they may have um, a very supportive home environment or they might policies at work that offers reasonable accommodations and support for him to carry on that role, he, he or she to carry on that role as CEO. And perhaps the person themselves are, you know, are really driven and wanting to get back to work. Here's another example of that. So really in intervention, you're trying to look at what they do instead as compensatory and how can we use therapy and strategies to get to uh, therapy, to look at what the person needs to do um, and narrow that gap. And so language therapy includes restoring or stimulation, reorganizing what the person can do, as well as looking at substance Institutes like alternative communication systems. In terms of motor speech disorders, here's my colleague Gauri doing um, a motor speech assessment. Here we want to really differentially diagnose between dysarthria and dyspraxia. So dysarthria uh, is to do with abnormalities in strength, speed, range, steadiness, tone, or accuracy of movements that are required for the subsystems of breathing, phonation, uh, resonance, um, articulation, and prosody, and, and that would all affect speech production. So in our assessment, we would try to figure out which type of dysarthria it is. And when we are able to determine that through our assessment, we would then do intervention that is appropriate for that particular particular type of dysarthria. And that could include behavior modification. It could include medical approaches, including surgical options, as well as looking at the subsystem. So maybe the respiration is a, a respiratory system is affected or the 
uh, larynx is affected or phonation is affected. So depending on what, which subsystem is most affected, we might um, decide on prioritizing that system. In terms of dyspraxia, it really is a difficulty in planning and programming uh, motor sensory commands um, that are required for speech. So often you would see that uh, somebody has groping behavior. So they are wanting to start saying something, but they can't quite start the movement, right? So you see that when you tell them to do a movement, that's harder, or of a can do it, when you don't tell them to, um, it's not under command, but a significant difficulty when it is volitional movement. I wanted to just flag up uh, right hemisphere disorder or right cognitive communication disorder. And I just wanted to say that uh, because it's connected to Excuse poor me, processing. Madam. And yes. Sorry to disturb you, madam. Uh, since you're running short of time, uh, we're supposed to start our next session by 3.30. So can we please uh, go ahead with the live demonstration? Is it okay? Yes, let, let me just... Um, Sorry, um, it would have been useful to get a, a time um, evaluation, I think. Uh, let me just rush through the last couple of slides, then, if that's okay. Okay, Madam Shri. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm literally at the end. Um, so, this is just looking at facilitating communication at the stroke unit. And this could uh, just um, looking at keeping questions short and simple, modeling what you are, the object that you're talking about. So if you're talking about tablets, you might point to that eh, and give them more time to communicate and to allow for any mode of communication, whether it be gesture, facial communicating, right? And so you might also want to think about run tact. So my final thought is about making the stroke unit a place where all communication modes are encouraged, accepted, and valued with no judgment. But thank you so much. Sorry about the connectivity issues and um, the, the timing that then went wrong. Thank you, madam. To conduct the live demonstration on speech therapy and swallowing assessment for stroke, I invite Ms. Hiroshika Karunanayaka, Speech and Language Therapist, Rehabilitation Hospital, Ligana. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hiroshika Karunanayaka, and I'm a Speech and Language Therapist from Beginner Rehabilitation Hospital. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Shabini said, uh, Speech and Language Therapists are the professionals who are dealing with post-stroke speech, language, communication, and solving disorders. Uh, now I'm going to... Uh, demonstrate very briefly how to do a swallowing uh, screening uh, for stroke patient. Uh, before I start the swallowing assessment, I will check the patient's GCS level and it should be 12 or above. And also I will check the patient's sitting position and uh, the patient should be able to sit in at least uh, 90 degree or 120 degree sitting position. Uh, when I do the assessment, I will do a quick cognitive screen. I will check the patient's ability to following simple commands, and I will check the oral motor skills of the patients. Here, now I'm going to skip the oral motor uh, assessment as I'm not going to uh, remove, uh, my, uh, remove the mask of my colleague with this pandemic. Hope that will be okay. Uh, let's see how it goes. Hello, I'm a speech therapist, and I'm here to check your swallowing. Uh, how do you feeling today? Can you just tell me your full name and the birthday? I am Mahesh Samarira. My birthday uh, is 22nd June 1985. Good. Uh, do you remember the date today? Uh, 13th uh, September. 
Good. Uh, can you close your eyes? Now you can open your eyes. Can you raise your hand? Good. That's all looks fine to me. And then I will move on to the oral motor assessment uh, a screening. In the oral motor screening, I will check the patient's ability, uh, patient's lip movements, uh, jaw movements, and tongue movements in terms of strength, range, and rate. Uh, and also I will uh, observe the patient's facial symmetry, the symmetry of the pharyngeal arches, whether the patient have any mouth deviation or drooling. After uh, completing that, I will check his voice quality. Mahesh, can you say ah uh, for me? Uh, Good. Can you say e for me? E. Good. Uh, after checking his voice quality, I will check his uh, I will check whether he can cough, uh, give a strong cough, uh, which will indicate a good airway protection mechanism. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, after that, I will check the uh, solving auscultation. For that, I will use my three fingers. I'm not going to check that now. Uh, for the solving auscultation, we can use the stethoscope too, as it gives the patient's breathing pattern. Uh, a clear uh, sound about uh, the patient's breathing pattern as well as the swallowing trigger. Uh, after uh, taking the auscultation, I will start the 5 ml water test to assist the patient's swallowing. Uh, for that, I'm going to use a glass of water and a teaspoon. Uh, I will not going to do the uh, three finger test now uh, as I want, uh, I need two hands for that. So let's imagine we'll give the first five ml water for the patient and we'll ask him to swallow. Immediate after the uh, swallow, the intake, I will ask the patient to say ah to check his voice quality. Can you say ah? Ah. Uh. Good. Uh, for the second and also to the third five ml, uh, I will ask him to say, tell his name or count up to one to 10. By asking that, I will check the patient's voice quality, whether he has any gurgly or wet quality voice, which is indicating a silent aspiration or the uh, residuals remaining around the uh, vocal cords. Uh, after giving a three, five ml, I will check for next two to three minutes, whether he has any delayed cough or throat clearing, again, which will be indicate silent aspiration and lead to the uh, aspiration pneumonia. Uh, we always need to keep in mind that uh, aspiration pneumonia can cause for mortality as well. Uh, let's, uh, okay, what will happen if the patient passes the 5 ml water test? After the 5 ml water test, if the patient is cap uh, able to take uh, uh, 15 ml without any throat clearing or cough, we need to assess the cup feeding and giving at least 25 ml water. Uh, if the patient is finding it difficult to have the cup feeding, then we move on to the detailed assessment with uh, trying the semi-solid or the other food consistency. What will happen if the patient fail the 5 ml water test? Definitely the patient should have an alternative feeding method and also patient should have a referral to speech therapy uh, to get it done a detailed assessment. Because uh, speech, uh, speech and language therapists are assessing solving in detail using different, uh, uh, using modified food textures, uh, food types, and the amount. Uh, let's think if we have a patient who cannot take liquids orally, but still can take thick liquids and semi-solids. So for this type of patient, we need to keep the NG to take liquids uh, with the alternative feeding, and we can start oral feeds with thick liquids and semi-solid. Uh, let's think if we have a patient who is uh, who, uh, who can take uh, liquids orally without any throat clearing or cough, but again, the patient need to have a referral for speech therapist uh, because they may have uh, uh, complaints on food choking, 
or throat clearing or pain when they are swallowing or food pocketing. Uh, they may find it difficult to have uh, solid food and also the mixed consistencies. In order to do the detailed swallowing assessment, definitely whether the patient pass or fail the 5 ml water test, they should have, they should get a speech therapy referral to get it done, a detailed solving assessment. Um, I'm going to uh, end this now. Uh, as a MDT uh, member in within the stroke rehabilitation uh, team, uh, our ultimate goal is to uh, maximize the patient capacities. Uh, and make them independent within the society with their maximum capacities. Uh, therefore, as healthcare professionals, we all would be able to identify the patient's disabilities, including their subtle features, and we need to immediately refer the patient to the relevant professional to uh, get better outcome. Uh, that's all. Uh, I would like to take a moment to say thank you on behalf of Digna Rehabilitation Hospital for inviting us to participate with this workshop to share our clinical knowledge and skills. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hiroshika. The next session on nutrition for stroke, let me invite Dr. Vasana Marasingha, acting consultant, Nutrition Physician, Department of Nutrition, Medical Research Institute, Sri Lanka. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Vasana Marasingha, uh, Acting Consultant Nutrition Physician attached to uh, Medical Research Institute, Colombo. Uh, actually, today I'm doing this presentation on behalf of uh, Dr. Renuka Jayadisa. She's the head of the nutrition department at MRI. Uh, actually, uh, that uh, let me uh, tell a little bit uh, more about her. She's a, a pioneer of our medical uh, nutrition field. Uh, and uh, that actually that I think everybody knows that medical nutrition field is a novel field in our clinical setup. And uh, today my topic is the nutrition for stroke. And before initiation of my presentation, I would like to convey my gratitude uh, for the whole SLMA organizing team for giving us this opportunity to share our knowledge and experience uh, related to the nutritional management in stroke. So we know that it actually that uh, talking about the nutrition in stroke, it, which is actually not an interesting topic, uh, especially during midst of this pandemic. And actually that we have a very stringent period of time for our presentation. So. Within this limited time, I would like to give some overview regarding nutritional management in stroke. This is the brief rundown of my presentation. With my initial slides, I would like to introduce several available, globally available uh, screening and assessment tools, especially for the malnutrition detection. And also I will be a little bit uh, discuss about dysphagia screening tools. And uh, with the middle part of my presentation, I will introduce several available nutritional strategies we can use, especially for the acute stroke patients and the chronic stroke patients. And uh, before ending of my presentation, I will be discuss uh, some nutritional strategies that we can use in uh, prevention of, of stroke, especially uh, primary prevention as well as secondary prevention. So uh, I think uh, before, when we talk into the nutrition and stroke, I think it's very important to have some idea, just the idea about what is the place of stroke in world and what is the communication between stroke and malnutrition. So this, uh, this slide, it's uh, according to the WHO global estimates, and uh, we can see the comparison that year 2000 and year 2019, uh, we can see that actually stroke is a kind of a leading cause. It's the second most leading cause of global uh, deaths in the world. Furthermore, uh, that uh, stroke is the uh, third leading cause of disability in adults. And when we talk into the malnutrition, actually that weight loss, uh, more than 50% of stroke patients can end up with the weight loss, especially uh, one week after the stroke and which can be extended up to six months. 
when we turn into the Sri Lankan data, unfortunately, we do not have much uh, organized studies or any uh, that promising uh, prevalence studies into this aspect. Even though, according to the Indo Morbidity and Mortality Reports, uh, even in Sri Lanka, which is the leading cause of hospital deaths, according to the year 2010, and estimated community prevalence, which is around 1.6 per 100 population in year 2012. And uh, there was a one study which was conducted at neurology clinics in National Hospital in year 2011. According to that, actually they have uh, analyzed about the unmet needs of care in four stroke survivors. And according to that, around 76% uh, of patients have inadequate low calorie diet. So according to these uh, global and Sri Lankan data, we can see that stroke is a kind of an important uh, illness uh, in our clinical setup. And meantime, that malnutrition has a very important uh, role of uh, in these patients. So uh, that that actually that we are from the medical nutrition team, and this is a novel field. But even before that, our clinicians, especially our neurology team, they manage their patients uh, in not only the, uh, the disease aspect as well as the nutritional status as well. Uh, but after entering of medical nutrition team that their main uh, requirement is they, they actually expect to uh, do some furthermore that, that means uh, disease specific nutritional strategies they need to uh, incorporate for their patients. Anyway that uh, especially uh, in admitting uh, a team of these uh, stroke patients and the especially neurology team uh, they should know which patients uh, they need further assessment. Uh, they, uh, which kind of patients need further nutritional optimization. So therefore we have to introduce them uh, several user-friendly nutritional screening uh, methods. So when we talk into the nutritional screening methods, uh, these things to be user-friendly, uh, they uh, in globally they, are, they introduce as a tools. Uh, unfortunately, so far we do not have uh, special validated tools for our patients. Uh, these are the globally available tools, NRS 2002, MUST, two, MUST tool, and mini nutritional assessment tool. Uh, with this uh, limited time, I'm not going to uh, talk in detail into each and every uh, nutritional assess uh, screening tools, but uh, with web, you can have a very comprehensive uh, notes and uh, information related to these tools. After uh, doing the nutritional screening, uh, then we can detect uh, those which patients are the at risk of malnutrition, uh, which patients need further assessment. So these patients, we can refer to the specially medical nutrition team. And after the uh, referral, these patients, uh, the, that, that specialized team, they can go for a detailed assessment. Uh, for this detailed assessment also, there's a several tools, especially subjective global assessment and the GLIM criteria that uh, usually GLIM, GLIM criteria, which help us to uh, detect the what is the stage of malnutrition, whether it's the severe malnutrition, moderate or not. So anyway, that so far to date, a detailed clinical assessment is the uh, gold standard method for the nutritional assessment. Anyway, that uh, doing a nutritional screening and assessment is not a, just a point uh, thing. That means it's a uh, that uh, dynamic, process because we know that stroke is a chronic disease. So uh, that it's having a long sequel of this disease. And during this illness, we have to do uh, re-screening and reassessment. Why I talk uh, into that, it has a dynamic process because that according to avail available studies, which has shown usually initial period, that uh, initial couple of days after stroke, uh, usually malnutrition prevalence is around 10%. But uh, when, when patients take around one week, and within one week, the patient's malnutrition can be increased up to 25%. So thereafter, during rehabilitation phase, actually patients can be uh, malnourished, that their prevalence is really high, it can be more than 45%. So this uh, malnutrition can be undetected if we can't uh, make it as a dynamic process. So far now we discussed how we uh, detect as a clinicians, how we detect uh, further needed patients for malnutrition optimization. And uh, 
that, that uh, we introduce several screening and assessment methods. And anyway, that we know any illness, uh, there's a uh, contribution for, uh, with, there's a, with co uh, that's a, with the malnutrition. So uh, when we talk into the stroke, there should be some uh, several uh, that disease specific risk factors as well. So if we talk into the stroke and there are specific risk factors, I think this slide will help you to have an overall idea what are the, those uh, risk factors. Uh, usually stroke, uh, that uh, motor impairment, sensory impairment and psychosocial impairment is always caused with the stroke. So with this impairment, you can see how it affects patients' food intake. Ultimately, patients uh, uh, can end up with the malnutrition. Uh, motor impairment with the dysphagia is uh, usually highlighted, and but the other aspect also very important. Mm, so with uh, uh, this uh, reduced food intake and can end up with the malnutrition. But uh, what is the, what we talk about? Wh what is the reason of talking about malnutrition in these patients? The reason is uh, so far in the world there are more than enough promising evidences that has shown malnutrition is directly affect patients' mortality and patients' uh, complications, especially hospital uh, infections, other pressure ulcers, uh, that kind of uh, complications. And their hospital stay, not only uh, ICU stay, that uh, in ward stay, everything can be uh, increased. And also, even though we, we that if, even though neurology team discharge their patients, their readmission rate is really high. So uh, anyway, as a clinicians, our overall goal of our patient is to improve their quality of life. That uh, usually neurology team, they look after patients, disease aspect, but when we take these patients as a whole, we have to improve their quality of life. But if the patient's uh, complications is getting high, that uh, hospital stays high, if there is a, uh, recurrent uh, readmissions, what happen? Ultimately, patients' quality of life, not only patients, whole family quality of life, life is uh, it's, it's in a problem. Uh, therefore, furthermore, that, uh, that after the quality of life, what happened? Patients' health care cost, uh, which can be increased. So actually, it's a problem. That's why we are talking about malnutrition uh, prevention in these patients. Uh, so the, that initially I talk about the, what are the available risk factors, especially in the stroke patients. Uh, and I would like to little bit elaborate on dysphagia as a risk factor because which has shown around uh, two to five uh, two to five fold risk of malnutrition in the weeks after the stroke. So when we little bit elaborate on dysphagia, uh, usually we know stroke patients, which is much prevalent in age, elderly age groups. So uh, with the elderly age group, uh, not only the stroke, that other uh, comorbid illnesses are uh, coincide and the other problems like anorexia, chewing problems, frailty, depression, psychosocial issues, uh, and in their gut, their malabsorption issues, those, all the problems can be, end up with the uh, reduced food intake, reduced uh, fluid intake, and the malnutrition. And the uh, their comorbid illnesses can be increased patients' energy demand, which also uh, can be another cause for the malnutrition. So uh, when we talk into the uh, dysphagia, furthermore, actually, I, I'm lucky that uh, previously we had a very comprehensive presentation, and uh, that presenter has uh, nicely explained about dysphagia screening and assessment methods. So I don't need uh, much time to uh, spend with these slides. Anyway, to completion of my presentation, I thought just uh, uh, go through these slides. And usually dysphagia screening, we can do it as a bedside assessment. And in detail, we can go for instrumental assessment. When we talk into the bedside assessment, it is water swallow test and no multi-consistent uh, uh, test. Usually uh, in our setup, we take our uh, speech therapist support for to assess uh, this aspect. When we talk into the instrumental assessment, one thing is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Unfortunately, in our uh, adult hospitals, uh, so far, these kind of assessment is not much familiar, but uh, that I have seen in Lady Ridgeway Hospital and sometimes in uh, Raghava Rehabilitation Unit. And the video, if I talk into the video fluoroscopy, it's kind of a flexible nasolaryngoscope. We can uh, uh, check the anatomy and the physiology of swallowing. And uh, the most important thing is that this can be a, 
uh, conduct as, as a bedside test. And, uh, and we can perform even with the severely handicapped and uncooperative patients as well. This is a kind of advantages. Uh, several drawbacks are the, uh, that uh, we cannot assess all swallowing phases. And sometimes patients can be dis uh, complained of discomfort and some gagging, vomiting feeling during the assessment. The another instrumental assessment method is the video fluoroscopy. Uh, actually, video fluoroscopy, this is the gold standard uh, method of this dysphagia uh, assessment. And uh, we can assess all three phases of swallowing. And in the meantime, uh, which is actually, which help us to detect micro aspiration of patients, especially in uh, lady that in pediatric age groups, this is really important. Now, so far we uh, discussed what is the, the, how we detect malnutrition, how we screen, and what are the available, the, what are the risk factors of uh, uh, stroke, that, that risk factors for malnutrition in stroke patients, and then uh, that uh, dysphagia screening and assessment methods. And when we talk into the stroke and malnutrition, we cannot forget about the sarcopenia because usually we know stroke patients, their hallmark is their uh, that immobility. Uh, usually with the immobility and the poor nutritional intake, especially high uh, reduction of high quality protein intake, they can be end up with the sarcopenia. That means they are, even though their weight can be normal, uh, but their muscle mass is relatively less. Usually their muscle mass can be invaded with the fat mass. Uh, this uh, process is uh, more marked in the immobilization. So when we manage in stroke patients, uh, as a nutrition team, we have to give adequate high quality proteins and meantime we have to incorporate uh, uh, the that, uh, physical activities and we have to uh, liaise with the physical rehabilitation programs. So the another important uh, problem in this uh, stroke patients, especially uh, chronic stroke patients, the pressure injuries, that pressure ulcers. Uh, actually, this uh, that uh, nutrition is not the only cause of the pressure injuries uh, of these patients, but there is a significant uh, that uh, role. Especially micronutrient inadequacy can be end up with the uh, pressure ulcers of these patients. So, as a nutrition team, we have to do the uh, on that in time on time uh, detail micronutrient assessment in these patients, and if we detected they are inadequate intake, we have to correct it then and there. Uh, anyway, that way we, when we manage the stroke patients, it's not kind of a uh, dynamic process because we have that uh, nutritional implementation strategies can be different from uh, the, according to the stage of stroke, that acute phase, in chronic phase, and also there's a role in uh, that uh, stroke prevention. So when we deliver our nutrition plan, especially that I'm talking about the oral intake, uh, that usually in stroke patients, that kind of a hallmark is they can can't take food as as it is. We have to uh, implement several uh, the consistency assessment uh, that texture modified feeds that we have to deliver. So when we talk into the texture modified uh, feeds, uh, problem is in world usually so far we do not have adequate uh, uh, studies and. Uh, that uh, surveys or any uh, researchers related to this aspect. Usually we uh, cater international guidelines uh, for when we manage our patients because that we are practicing Western medicine, it's very important. Uh, but the issue is when we talk into the texture modified diet in different countries, they are having different nomenclatures. Uh, for example, that you can see there's a comparison when we take into the uh, texture modified feeds uh, or uh, fluids in USA, sometimes they explain it as a thin uh, fluid, thin feeds and nectar-like uh, composition, honey-like, spoon-thick, but in other country, it can be different. For example, uh, in uh, UK, they mention it as a mildly thick, moderately thick, and extremely thick. So when we cater these uh, international guidelines, it can be a kind of a confusion. So to, to avoid this confusion, uh, with uh, which created by these variable terminologies in uh, different countries. In the year 2016, International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, they have, which is introduced. So actually, in each, with that previous presentation, my presenter has 
uh, explained very nicely regarding this aspect. So I'm not uh, taking too much time. But anyway, even with the web, you can have a nice account according to the, this IDD SI, uh, this initiative. When we talk into the our setup in our hospitals, uh, we also using several local feeding strategies in our patients. Uh, tube feeding, pre thickened oral nutrition supplements and manual thickening powders we are using. And sometimes, especially in national hospital in neurology ICUs, uh, in medical nutrition team, they implement their uh, tailored, uh, standard, uh, blenderized uh, feeding plans. So I think this uh, slide will help you to have an idea about nutritional alg algorithm in stroke. For example, as a clinician, as a nutrition person, if I get a referral from a neurology team, uh, first of all, we, that when I see my patient, I have to see whether the patient is stable or not, whether the patient is under, if patient can be in, still in the ICU or under mechanical ventilation or impaired consciousness. If, if such a patient, uh, straightforward, we cannot go for oral feeds because patient is not suitable candidate for that. So uh, most of the time we have to go with the uh, tube feeding. Uh, but even before going for the tube feeding, we have to see that whether there is any contraindication for tube feeding. For that, we have to liaise with uh, critical e, that ICU team, critical ill uh, team, uh, or the neurology team. According to that, if it seems patient is hemodynamically unstable, that means patient is on, on several uh, inotropes and with the escalating doses, and the team is uh, and patient is having heart failure with poor ejection fraction, so that the team is uh, struggle to maintain patient's uh, circulation for the major uh, uh, organs. So in that case, if we go for a, a high feeds, high energy feeds uh, with uh, with the tubes, actually we know that with high feeds, um, usually more than ten percent of blood uh, goes to the digestion. So actually, which will be a negative. Uh, impact for the our team and so as a nutrition people we have to take a step back and we have to uh, wait and see whether the patient uh, become hemodynamically stable or not uh, but anyway if the patient is uh, suitable for a tube feeding if he's stable then we have to see whether the patient is okay for the oral feeds uh, sometimes if patient is not suitable for the oral feeding then we have to go for a tube feeding ESPEN recommendation is to initiate at least within 72 hours uh, so when we uh, decide on the tube feeding, then we have to discuss regarding the time period of expectation for the tube feeding, especially neurology team. If they expect to continue with tube feeding more than 28 days, in that case, we have to think about the uh, long-term feeding methods, the kind of a peg feeding. Uh, so if the patient is not need the long-term tube feeding method, but patient need more than one week, like so, then we have to think about it because we know that NG tubes is not uh, easy to keep in situ, um, especially for the stroke patients. Uh, they can be inadvertent removal. So to prevent this aspect, we can use some uh, strategies like uh, nasal breeders. Uh, so anyway, that uh, this is that I talk about the uh, that the mechanically ventilated when an are impaired conscious patients. But anyway, if we get a patient with uh, uh, adequate uh, uh, GCS and not under mechanical ventilation, so then we have to think about the uh, oral feeding or enteral feeding. Uh, so with that, even though still we have to exclude the patient's stage of dysphagia, whether it is there or not. So in that uh, place, we have to uh, take the support of the speech therapist and with all assessments. So I, I don't think I have to uh, talk into detail about this aspect already uh, that our with previous presentation, this aspect was covered. But anyway, just I will, as a nutrition person, I want to uh, highlight here for especially malnourished patients, even though we go with the oral feed, texture modified feeds, uh, if the patient is severely malnourished, we have, sometimes we have to use some disease specific or uh, kind of a polymeric formulas in these patients. But the uh, problem is these uh, formulas are very expensive. The another thing is, uh, especially chronic patients, uh, home stay patients, we can we cannot uh, continually uh, go with the polymeric formulas. In that case, we have to go with some. We have to give some uh, uh, tailored and blenderized recipes. This is my last slide. Actually, uh, before ending, uh, there are some role. Uh, 
uh, with the primary and secondary prevention of stroke. The time telling primary and secondary prevention because we know that after getting stroke, these patients can be having repeated strokes so that their prevalence is really high. So what is the role of the nutrition in pre uh, prevention? We know that food is actually, it's a culture like that. It's a long-term thing uh, because these uh, long-term habits can be end up with the illness. So uh, when we talk into the primary and secondary prevention uh, that I just mentioned it as a point for these strategies, even though that because with this limited time, I cannot go with the available evidences, but for each and every statement, there's a, more than enough evidences in birth. So uh, maintain of the healthy weight, that means uh, healthy, uh, that superficially as a BMI. And also uh, we advise people to be physically active at least 150 minutes per week. And also we encourage people to uh, continue with healthy balanced diet. That means uh, actually uh, people's uh, diet in, should be very uh, rich in phytochemicals. That means antioxidants. Uh, antioxidants rich means usually colorful fruits vegetables that means that simple way of uh, delivering this uh, message to our patient is encouraged to rainbow concept uh, that means colorful fruits and vegetables with their meals and the another important aspect is reduce uh, sodium intake in our diet uh, the another name is the dash diet especially for the if the stroke is coincide with the hypertension it is very really important but even uh, without hypertension for a normal people, usually we are not recommending to take more than five grams of sodium with their means. But unfortunately to date uh, available studies in our country, our people usual sodium salt intake per day is around 13.5 gram uh, is the intake. It is actually more than the double uh, required amount. And also we always advise people to quit smoking and the limit alcohol. Limit alcohol means that the not to exceed the safe limit. Uh, that means that I need to just mention that if, if someone is already on alcohol, then we encourage, they, we, we have to give information regarding the safe limit. Uh, but if someone is not on alcohol, then it's, we do not need, we actually, we do not encourage them to go for a safe limit. That means if patient person is not on alcohol, no need to advise for a safe level. Uh, these are the uh, that uh, that that basic overview of my presentation. And as a take-home message, we know that uh, stroke it's a burden of stroke in Sri Lanka is now alarming, and the nutrition care is an integral component of post-stroke management. Uh, but the issue is which is an overlooked risk factor in our country. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, madam. So now we move on to the final session of the program, which is on social services for stroke. To conduct this session, I would like to invite Mr. Chandana Ranavira Arachi, Director, Department of Social Services. Good afternoon, everybody. So I am uh, Chandana Ranavira Arachi, Director to the Department of Social Services, Sri Lanka. So uh, I'm going to uh, present about the uh, role of the social services for stroke patients. Uh, actually, the, uh, during the uh, recent past, there has been a, a gradual opinion of to carry out social intervention in the health sector, leading a new way in uh, perfect medical intervention made for patients in the health sector. Uh, the following diagram will help to get an idea uh, in this uh, connection. Uh, it is clear from this diagram that uh, with medical intervention in the event of an accident or illness uh, to a person, the social intervention begins and when medical interventions gradually decrease according to the prevalent uh, conditions over time. Uh, the social intervention gradually uh, reached to the, the maximum level and uh, the medical in intervention uh, decrease accordingly. Uh, so when we think about the why the social intervention is important, the opinion of various uh, professionals in the field of health uh, was that the social intervention is very important in achieving uh, patients' well-being. 
as a result of this, uh, the necessity of scientific intervention of a, a certain uh, part of uh, explore the uh, matters uh, such as uh, the patient uh, mental balance uh, and medications that is very important and uh, therapeutic methods the family's economic balance so we have to think of the the economic status of the family and basic problems of the family uh, basic problems that need to be solved at home level uh, and equipment which are required uh, for to live in their and do their day-to-day -day activities and also uh, access facilities. Uh, as a result, according to the uh, request made by Dr. Narendra Pinto, uh, orthopedic surgeon, Sri Lanka spinal cord network in the year of 2014, uh, the Department of Social Services to provide uh, the services of social services officers to the spinal cord. Uh, Accident Special Unit uh, at Colombo National Hospital. The request has uh, been fulfilled by the Department of Social Services. Uh, at present, most of the major hospitals in the country uh, have appointed uh, officers on full-time basis, and uh, there are some officers attached to the uh, part-time basis. The performance of uh, welfare services within the hospital for patients who are being treated in hospitals. Uh, the services uh, to be carried out by the social services divisions for the problems and means of the patients that uh, arise during the uh, case conference or daily ward rounds conducted by the rehabilitation team for an uh, inpatient are delivered to the patient and the relevant rehabilitation team. Uh, if it was decided to send the patient to home from the hospital at any time, the social services officers coordinate the provisions of uh, common toilet facilities if he needs, uh, wheelchairs on requirements, uh, access facilities, as well as the uh, economic development of uh, his family members, uh, and also help to the education uh, requirement of the children as well as uh, external facilities and knowledge required for the patients to be uh, socialized. Uh, and also the officer the carried out further explaining on medical advice to the patients and his family members about his illness or disability in the event, uh, in the event of accident or hospitalization of a person and the uh, coordination of other the related services at the special occasions also. Uh, in uh, such cases, an information report is prepared for the patient for the uh, use of future rehabilitation plan. And uh, other one is in coordination of welfare services with the social services officers of the relevant divisional secretariats for the patients who are discharged from the hospital. Uh, in relation to the above matter, doctors and therapists uh, advise the patient to use the uh, prosthetic foot, uh, clutches, wheelchairs, uh, and other assistive de devices if you need uh, when a patient uh, leave the hospital, uh, especially uh, an orthopedic ward. Uh, in, in such cases, the arrangements are being made by the social services officers of the, the relevant hospital to meet uh, the needs as much as possible by the uh, connecting the relevant persons, institutions, organizations. Especially, we have a limited allocation uh, in the Department of Social Services, so our officers uh, uh, has the proper link with the, uh, the provincial social services department uh, and uh, any other government and non-governmental institutions and the private donors. And those, the most uh, important thing that happens here is the great effort to social services officer to deliver these equipments or services to the patient's home on or before leaving the hospital. Uh, when we read about the engaging of the social services officers with the following matters are also very effective. Uh, they provide in vocational uh, training facilities for the target groups. Especially we have eight uh, vocational training centers throughout the country and 
we established one center in the rehabilitation hospital in Ragama, and uh, there are 26 uh, uh, courses uh, that they that they can follow those courses, and we uh, we provide that facilities for the the patients with disabilities, and uh, reaching uh, carry opportunities and counseling. Uh, and intervene in issues occurred with employers and making uh, contacts with the Department of Labor if necessary and coordinating on providing uh, compensation and also making aware of family members and the community about disabilities because uh, so the, the family, uh, the mental and the, the, the economic uh, background of the family uh, is very poor, so it uh, affect highly for this family. So the awareness is very important uh, for the family members and the community also. Uh, and referring for legal aid services uh, and maintain and extend the organization for the persons with disabilities uh, and providing housing and other facilities for the, uh, the relevant persons uh, accordingly. And also bringing the problems of the person with disabilities to the national level. So we, we have a self-help group. Uh, we have that kind of groups in the village level or sometimes uh, the three, four village gets clustered and uh, form one group. And uh, we have one uh, the divisional level self-help group and the district level self-help group. So using uh, the self-help group, they can provide uh, many kind of facilities and uh, uh, the job, uh, the career, they can develop their career opportunities uh, and uh, many cultural and sports activities. And uh, bringing the sport capabilities of the persons with disabilities to the national level. So uh, annually we conduct the uh, sports, uh, sports meets uh, for the disabled per persons uh, and bring the uh, artistic and cultural abilities to the person with disabilities to the national level. And also we conduct the annual sit through uh, uh, art exhibition, uh, artistic exhibition and making aware of the health staff on social services activities uh, and supporting for the establishment of organization of patients. Uh, introduce introducing a music therapy program, making aware of public officers on social service activities, uh, participating in, in national and international conferences, interagency coordination, and provide knowledge on disability uh, prevention program and first aid to the target groups. And this is the welfare cycle of social services. According to the welfare cycle, the welfare activities common from the uh, instant of persons become ill or disabled. And at the end, uh, it will be able to get a, a rough idea on how it is done by the social service divisions of the hospital and the social service division of the divisional secretariats on various uh, interventions after the treatment, rehabilitation, um, uh, and the person's back to home and is uh, rehabilitated with his family and the surrounding community also. Uh, until he recovers from illness uh, or disability and adapts to the normal lifestyle. Uh, and also working as a team of medical staff, nursing staff, therapists, social workers, attendants, as well as patients. Uh, and even their uh, caregivers for all these purposes uh, will be very helpful for success of patients welfare service, especially such a scientific and complex process cannot be performed by the single officer and it should be a dynamic of a uh, and well organized team. Uh, direct relationships are so are being uh, main, maintained at the hospital level as well as the rural and the regional level. Among the following patients, uh, so following parties providing patients welfare services by social service officers, uh, especially sick persons, uh, and persons with disabilities, the hospital staff, uh, clients, family members, caregivers, friends and rural community groups and organization. Other field officers and other officers, including the social services officers of the divisional secretariats, so especially when, uh, we, provide, when we, need, uh, we provide the, uh, the, to the common toilet facilities or the uh, access facilities, we have to 
get the assistance of uh, technical officer and other officers of the uh, division secretariats uh, level and grama nirdari of the area the donors the funeral society rural development society uh, the health self help group that means swasakti group uh, senior citizens organizations and other other leading government agencies and as i mentioned earlier so no more mostly we can uh, we we can uh, make best the uh, some uh, donation from the uh, private sector especially the non governmental organizations and uh, the donors of the area uh, because of the uh, the lack of uh, uh, fund available in the uh, the department other leading uh, and the department of social services uh, national secretariat for persons with disabilities uh, relevant pradeshya sabha provincial council ministries department and uh, especially the relevant provincial councils so we have some challenges the officers have some challenges when we uh, fulfill their welfare roles the one is uh, the, i describe it as uh, the lack of financial or other resources required they uh, carry out emergency patient need sometime uh, if, if it is necessary to provide the uh, the equipments while he discharge to hospital sometime we are unable to follow the uh, we have to follow the, uh, the government guidelines procurement guidelines uh, and uh, we are unable to provide that uh, the items or the goods uh, on time uh, and also weaknesses occur in inter agency interpersonal relationship at certain instances and failure to establish a appropriate uh, centralized system to provide proper service um, and also problems remaining with uh, updating of knowledge uh, and also lack of proper awareness of some hospital authorities on patient welfare services provided by the social service officer uh, that is the uh, the, the sometimes the, the our officer uh, some officers have uh, the, the good uh, the and the high capabilities uh, to coordinate with others uh, especially the hospital staff and the uh, donors and uh, he plays the good good and the, the good role in the hospital and there are there are some hospitals so we 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 have experienced that there are not uh, no good uh, relationship with the hospital staff and the officers the social service officers and lack of basic facilities at least for the social services officer in the certain hospitals uh, and also the methodological development uh, issues are there and uh, we have the good strength that uh, we have uh, Roughly 450 social services officers attached to the divisional secretariats throughout the country, and the, we have one officers in the district secretariat also, and also we attach roughly uh, 37 officers to the hospital full time and part time. So that is the uh, the good strength that we have, and uh, we can use and we can utilize that uh, the human resource. The uh, the 100 percent of the officers are graduates. and they have enough experience and the uh, good knowledge and sound knowledge about the social welfare and other things actually uh, hospital authorities and the department should get together and we can uh, uh, we can obtain their maximum uh, utilization and maximum maximum level uh, to, uh, to help the uh, uh, the marginalized people uh and it does uh, a great service to the uh, many communities with disabilities in the country to the community based rehabilitation national program we call that the cbr uh, established in the department of social services for the persons with disabilities so we we carried out the many services and annually normal annually we uh, the the government allocated 10 million uh and uh, financial support so we conducted the many programs uh, with the uh, within the uh, divisional secretariat area uh and uh, under this program we conducted uh, the several activities especially we provide some the service we provide to uplift the uh, the lifestyle of the people uh, we provide some uh, facilities to and the, we provide some uh, goods and services as well as uh, Uh, knowledge uh, to enhance their the career opportunities 
uh, and sometimes we provide the financial support to uh, start the uh, vocation, start the uh, self-employed, uh, and sometimes we, the mostly we provide uh, the the common toilets and uh, access facilities, wheelchairs, uh, and also we strengthen the uh, the uh, society organizations uh, using this uh, CBR program. Uh, and also be aware of the, uh, the the close relation of, of the patients to uh, how to take care of the uh, these patients and uh, so on. Uh, this is the the pictures that we uh, they provide some the provide the access facilities and uh, uh, self employment facilities. Uh, and the Department of Social Services perform a national mission to raise the living standard of the uh, disadvantaged and uh, marginalized communities uh, in the society. Uh, and uh, don't don't enough the great opportunity to make the welfare services uh, more effective by adapting modern uh, methodologies to further formalize uh, this duty by the Department of Social Services. Social Services. Uh, as an uh, institution under the Minister of Health uh, uh, will be a matter of the keep good hopes uh, for the uh, dis disadvantaged and marginalized uh, community. And uh, before I conclude my presentation, I would like to thanks. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Padma Gunaratna to uh, make this opportunity to the Department of uh, Social Services. And uh, thank you very much for all participants. Thank you, Mr. Chandana. So that brings us to the end of today's program. We hope you had a fruitful workshop. Thank you all so much for joining and have a nice day.